We believe in dreaming big, working hard, and digging deep. The more we believe, the farther we can go. But none of us gets there alone. We believe in Toronto, and we believe the 2022 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon will be the most extraordinary one yet. And the winner in it all is the human spirit. Together, there's nothing we can't do when we're building on belief. TCS. Good morning and welcome from Toronto. It is 8 a.m. and we are 45 minutes away from the start of the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon of 2022. We have 25,000 runners from 70 countries around the world contesting a five kilometers, a half marathon and a full marathon. My name is Jeff Whiteman. I'm part of your hosting team to my left. Uh, Canadian marathon legend Krista Duchesne is joining me and on my right, uh, multimedia marathon man, fresh from a Chicago sub three hours last weekend. It's welcome to Krista Koenig. And guys, I guess the most important thing is we're back in person in big numbers and it feels great, doesn't it? Certainly does. I think everyone's been waiting for this day. It's been a long three years. Other marathons have uh, been able to resume and we're certainly glad to be back on the streets in Toronto again. And you may have noticed that uh, the race still has elite label status as part of the World Athletics series of road races. But it's also a first for the uh, link with TCS. TCS uh, have their headquarters in Canada right adjacent to the start line. But this event uh, positions Toronto, the waterfront marathon, alongside New York, Amsterdam that took place earlier today, and London Marathon as part of the TCS marathon family. And that's good news for the event. Absolutely. Uh, this city is just absolutely crazy right now. It's been a long time coming, and uh, it's quite the race we're actually getting for this and um, we've been waiting a while. Well, we're gonna be uh, concentrating on the elite races, but within that there are the Canadian National Championships for the full marathon distance. And they gave us uh, great excitement in the countdown to Tokyo, uh, where we had two qualifiers, one each in the men's and women's race, the last time we were in person in 2019. And we have athletes from around the world, but particularly East Africa, where we have a contingent of Kenyan and Ethiopian men and women who could well challenge the existing Canadian all-comers records and the course records and some of the fastest times in the world this year. So that's to look forward to. But let's just uh, go back to that new link with TCS uh, as title sponsor of the Toronto Waterfront Marathon and hear a little bit about what that new partnership means. Hello, I'm Shoman Rai, Executive Director and Country Head for TCS Canada. TCS is a global IT services and consulting leader with over 600,000 people working for it and present in 46 countries. So we are delighted to be the title sponsor for the first time of Toronto Waterfront Marathon. TCS has running in its DNA. We believe this is a great way to engage our employees, our customers, and also to improve community inclusiveness to an innovative and sustainable future. It is just not the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. TCS has been the official title sponsor for TCS New York City Marathon, TCS London Marathon, TCS Amsterdam Marathon, and Tata Mumbai Marathon. We are here today at the Expo. The energy here is fantastic. The runners are coming to pick up their babes, the retailers are here, the sports vendors are here. It's just happening. The TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon app is one of the coolest in its nature. The coolest thing about the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon app is its sustainability scorecard, in which the spectators and the runners can actually learn about the impact on the environment. It is such a wonderful feeling when I learned that there'll be in excess of 22,000 runners 
but actually we'll be able to see probably more than 35 to 40,000 people dropping in, in the expo and enjoying the Toronto Marathon on Sunday. Schumann Roy is the national lead for Canada for TCS and that cool app that he was mentioning is something that all three of us have downloaded. The serving suggestion to you is that if you download it for free, you can track any elite individual, anybody from your country, your neighborhood, or that you want to see on the way round and know where they are on the course in real time. And we should, uh, even post-broadcast, have pictures coming live from the finish line so you may have a chance to see them cross the line. But it is a very cool app. Yeah, it's great. You know, family members from home, if they're busy doing something, they can check in to see how one's doing in the race. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to get so much information read on your phone and easy to access. So we're going to be using it. We hope you use it for free. We'll have a quick look at it on video as to how it works. And then at the end, if you have your phone camera ready, you can take a picture of the QR code and that will link you directly to the download of the TCS app. A marathon isn't just a test of stamina a test of strength, or a test of spirit. It's a test of belief, and those who believe succeed. But without their cheerleaders, how could they ever believe? Support the believers in this year's TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Track your runner, find them on the course, and view race information with the official Marathon app. Powered by TCS. And there in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen is the QR code. If you take a picture of that now, it will link you direct to that free download of the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon app. And as we've mentioned, there's a lot on there, not just the tracking of individual runners, but you can... Uh, work out who's who based on the database that's been uploaded to that and also that sustainability score because that's a big feature of this return of mass participation running that it's as environmentally friendly as possible. So that's looking ahead to what's coming up over the next five hours of our transmission. Uh, but we also should look back a little bit because the last time we were here in person in 2019, we had some sensational racing. Uh, and let's start by looking at the women's course record that was set by Mags Masai of Kenya. And Krista, this really was sensational running from somebody that's a real friend of this event. Yeah, it was a pretty special day for her, and I'm, I'm, she's really glad and, and happy to be back after the pandemic. She um, traveled to New Zealand and stayed there to kind of wait it out and just found it difficult to have um, race goals, not knowing what was coming up, and she's just thrilled to be back at this race after what a, a great opportunity for her the last time she came to, to set that record. Well, I don't know how productive you were in uh, lockdown, but she had a baby, son Jake Jr., uh, was born, I think, in 2021. This is her first race of any kind since the pictures that we're seeing now, but that remains the course record and the uh, Canadian all-comers record. And she's back and in good form and uh, ready to roll, already down there on the start line warming up. So that was uh, our elite women's defending champion. It seems funny to talk about a defending champion from an event in 2019, but it was. And we're going to have a look uh, next at the uh, Canadian races. This, this event has been awarded the Canadian National Championships uh, for a number of years over the full marathon distance, and it's provided some amazing stories, Chris. Yes, it has. Um, they all punched their ticket to Tokyo. They threw it all down right at that course. Um, and, yeah, a lot of them just weren't expected to do it. They did it, went after it, no looking back. Well, with that in mind, let's go back to 2019 and have a look at the Canadian national champion, the defending national champion in the marathons. This is Dana Pidoreski with her finish. That was a really special moment. You know, Dana sometimes goes out hard ahead of the group. And I remember when we did the broadcast, we didn't even know that she was ahead no. of, of the group of Canadians. And so we got the motorcycle to find her in the course. There she was out there doing her thing, taking that chance. And we see the emotion of the day when she crossed that line. She's she's had her fair share of, of injuries and setbacks. And her husband is also her coach, Josh. And um, for them to embrace each other after with that hug, it was a real emotional moment for for them as well as those of us that were watching. Well, we should just project it forward a little bit because like life, it's full of ups and downs. She was selected for Tokyo. Tokyo then got postponed. She got herself in good shape for the Olympic Games and then was pinged for quarantine because 
on her flight, somebody tested positive for COVID. So she wasn't even able to train in the final countdown to Tokyo and had a disappointing marathon experience. So back for redemption here today. That's the first part of the Canadian story. But we also think back. And when I asked him about it on, uh, at the press conference on Friday, he was, yeah, it wasn't a big celebration. Well, let's just watch and see, because I remember it as a big celebration for Trevor Hofbauer qualifying for the Olympics, winning in Toronto, one of the big days of his life. Let's have a look. This was just all gas, no brakes. This was him seeing his ticket to Tokyo and going, leaving everyone behind him not looking at his speed, just going, looking back, Alan holding him down, um, just knowing he finally made it and he worked so hard. He just fully deserved it. Um, and, and you know, what, what a journey. He wears his heart on his sleeve a bit, Trevor Hofbauer, a uh, very emotional character, as you can see. He had a great run in the Boston Marathon earlier this year. That battle for Canadian national honors is gonna be quite something, both men and women. Yes, I really think we're going to see Rory and Trevor uh, battle out today. And, you know, Trevor's going to want to defend his title and uh, Rory's going to want to get it. You can see he doesn't even wear a watch that day. He no. just went by feel and that's difficult for a lot of people to do, but he's, he's uh, mastered that. We'll see if he's wearing a watch today. Well, all three of those athletes that we've just seen winning in 2019 are back in 2022 to uh, see if they can hit the top of the podium again. There's one piece missing in the jigsaw, and it is Baby Police. Philemon Rono, uh, a star of these streets, he says he shouldn't be called Baby Police, acknowledging his role in the Kenyan police force and his lack of height. He should be the mayor of Toronto because he's won here so often. Let's just go back and have a look at it, but note the heartbreak of him having to withdraw in the final couple of weeks countdown with an injury. But this was... Philemon Rono's finest moment, 2.05 exactly. There were four men behind him in the next 15 seconds, but that is the Canadian all-comers record on how much he would have liked to have been here and sadly, an absent friend here today. Oh, that's too bad he's not here. This was the third time he's won. He was going for four. He loves the city so much. The city gives him so much support. Um, and just like me, he's a little guy, he goes <laughs> out there. We were actually supposed to trade shoes had he won again, maybe even he just showed up. Um, but yeah, he's dearly missed. Great runner, great person. Wish you were here. And I remember when we did the broadcast last time, we mentioned the story where the one time we came to Toronto to race, he, he fell and hit his head on the barrier and actually had to call someone back at home to see if he should run or not. Yeah. Uh, because he had passed out for a little bit, but he got up, he, they said, run by feel, and he <laughs> won the race. Well, he's a very lively character, and hopefully we will see him again in 2023. But he's the only one of the four gold medalists from 2019 who aren't here. So that's a quick reprise of what uh, excitement we had three years ago, the last time we were uh, live in person with big numbers. Uh, but let's have a look now at some of the athletes that are going to be making the headlines here uh, over the next couple of hours, starting with the elite women's start list. And, and it's a really loaded field, Krista. It is. Uh, we've got, you know, a good mix of Kenyans and Ethiopians that we know often have that rival when it comes to big marathons. And they'll certainly be looking for, you know, personal best times and, and getting that um, championship um, for their name. And then, you know, we also have the Canadian championship with Dana Pitoreski and Melinda Almore, Sasha Golish, uh, Victoria Coates is making her debut. She was supposed to do it a couple of years ago, but was injured. And Sasha Golish, uh, she's doing all eight national championships this year. So this is number seven. The, the last will be the cross country championships. So she has a, an interesting take for the race today. Well, a couple of things to point out. First of all, at the top of the uh, leaderboard there or the, the seeding order, uh, numbers one and two have traded the Canadian all comers record. It is currently Maasai by one second ahead of uh, Berker. Berker, of course, had this huge disappointment of being ready to race in Canada in the spring. Her visa was issued, but her passport didn't arrive in time. That's really frustrating. Right. That was really disappointing um, that, that that happened, both with uh, men and women coming from from Africa. And uh, it was it was really frustrating for Dylan Wikes, who was um, doing the, the job of, of elite coordinator for that race. And, you know, to be training for so long and to put everything into that and to have it taken away without 
you know, totally beyond your control was a huge setback, but she was able to kind of grieve that loss and, and refocus again. And I think she'll be coming back here to, to prove that, you know, she's ready to run the race that she missed. She's on a mission. And just a quick word, as we look at the age brackets there, um, a number of competitors in 35, 39, and even 40, 45, your age group. And that is a feature increasingly of of elite marathon running that there are prolonged careers right i think that it used to be you know you go to the track and then you move up to the marathon but we've seen that that trend is certainly not the most common anymore where some people are just going straight to the marathon in the early 20s and just excelling in that and so it's nice to see people coming from different backgrounds and, and kind of making it unique to what their own um, talents are well, that's the men's, uh, the elite women's field, uh, and that's going to carry the name of the Toronto Waterfront Marathon around the world. Let's have a look now at the men's. Uh, once again, a, a strong East African contingent. No clear favourite, I would say, Chris, in that. No, not at all. Um, I think with the field being open with Rono missing, um, I think, like, I mean, all of them have been here, or sorry, none of them have been here except for Candy, 2018, uh, placing third. Uh, I've spoke to most of them yesterday, and they're all gunning for it. They're all going for the record, going for everything, uh, nothing behind them. Well, you can be sure that the pace will be set up for sub 205 because uh, it really was a step forward for the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon in 2019 when we had five men under 213. But just looking at that uh, Canadian battle, the numbers 8 to 13, we see it as a head-to-head -head between Hofbauer and Linkletter. A word for Lee Veselius, because he is a, a full-time working veterinary surgeon with large animals, carving and uh, big, big beefy animals. And that, that doesn't often go with 150 miles a week, does it? No, not at all. Uh, I imagine he's going more than full-time hours and especially a stressful job doing the 100-mile weeks. Um, that that's just that's puts you on a different mental level as opposed to anything. So... Well, there are three medals available, and, and we will have uh, presentation ceremonies for all of the categories at the end there. And you would say that potentially um, that men's race, the, the bronze medal, if everything goes to form, is, is open. Yeah, I think probably it's safe to say it would be going to Lee Wasselius. Of course, we have to see how the, how the day unfolds. And another thing about Lee is that he has been a pacer. For, yes. for some of the Canadian women at, at the different championship races. So it's always interesting to see, okay, that race, he was a pacer, but this is the race that he raced. And so clearly he's, he's racing on his own today. So I think we'll, we'll see a good one from him. And I think he's, he's wanting to go under about 214. So hopefully he'll have that good day. There's no published um, Canadian athletic selection policy for the world championships in Budapest next August, but you'd have to assume that the first Canadian here, as long as they run somewhere in the realms of maybe 208 for men and maybe um, 227 maybe for women, would have a good chance of selection for the Worlds. Yes, I think so. And I think that's something that I know Melindy Elmore would like to do is, is be on that team. And, um, you know, she's hoping to also be on the team for Paris at the, the next Olympics. And Trevor Hofbauer and, and, and Rory as well. I know Rory had that kind of last minute opportunity to run this past summer at the World Championships. So given the opportunity, I think that they would both be happy to wear, you know, the Canadian maple leaf on their chest. We're only uh, about 20 months away from the Olympic Games in Paris. We're not yet inside the qualification window for, for that. That will probably open uh, from the 1st of January next year, and they have 18 months in which to secure Olympic selection. But the trend for championship marathons is for smaller and smaller fields. So the time was when we would see an Olympic men's field maybe in Rio of 120 runners. And I think because of the size and scale of major championships now, we're looking at fields of more like 30 to 40 runners. So it's getting harder and harder to qualify. Right. And, and, you know, I guess I've got mixed feelings about that. I know at the 2016 Olympics, it was a big field and just that feel of everyone on the line and so many people there. But, um, you know, times are changing and um, that'll be the new way that we do it. Well, it's been great over recent years to see uh, Canadian athletes in particular able to qualify on home soil, earn some money, raise their profile and qualify for, for major championships. Uh, when we look back to 2019, we knew the Trevor Hofbauer story as it unfolded. But for Pitoreski, she admitted it all came together very, very late for her, that whole Olympic experience. And the, the sheer joy of that will be something that we're hoping to to capture again. The time now is 8.19. That means that we're just over 25 minutes away 
uh, from our first start of the day. And, and on that front, a historic day, because as part of its uh, move to inclusivity and, and uh, diversity, we will have an elite wheelchair racer. And it is Josh Cassidy, who's one of, well, he's probably the greatest uh, Canadian wheelchair racer of all time. Is that fair? Right, Josh. I mean, he's got so many accolades to list that it would it would take quite a bit of time. But I mean, three time Paralympian. He just ran the Chicago Marathon last weekend. He's a dad. He um, is a public speaker, an artist. I mean, it, it doesn't end what he's able to do. He's got some very impressive Canadian records. And he had um, he was he was a world record holder at one point. He does various distances from, you know, the shorter events on the track up to the marathon and is just a wonderful person. So so it's not going to be a, a wheelchair race uh, for him specifically. He's going to be um, kind of testing the course out so yeah. that down the road that they will be able to have it have it more open um, for wheelchair participants. So he's helping to provide feedback for the future of that. And he's a super fast uh, racer. He has a uh, clock close to 80 minutes. We pr probably expect on a day like this when he's solo and testing, as you say, something maybe around 90 minutes. So still way, way quicker than any of the runners. Certainly. Well, it is. Uh, we're at different times today. We've got uh, roving reporters around the course. We're going to try and capture the atmosphere, the uh, not the stories within the stories, because we've got some Guinness World Record attempts. We've got uh, millions of dollars being raised for charity during the course of the day. It will go right the way on to uh, seven, eight-hour finishes. So a properly inclusive marathon, albeit that the slant of our coverage will be with those elites. But there are the live pictures down at the start assembly area. And this, guys, is really where the nerves start to jangle a bit, isn't it? With 20, 20 minutes to go. Let's just see. We can see what it looks like. Uh, let's have a look at the local weather forecast to get a sense of what it feels like down there, Chris. Uh, looks to be 9 degrees, uh, feeling 6. I think it's going to um, warm up just by 2 degrees by the finish for the elites. and. Um, Wind is uh, was expected to be a little faster this morning, but um, looks to be really light, eight kilometers. Uh, I think we kind of have a really good day today ahead of us. Um, other than the first half of the race might be a little windy, second half, I think we should be good. So uh, good day for everybody, I believe. Well, you were saying that the, the built up nature of the Toronto uh, city center means that the wind is pretty much neutralized with the high-rise buildings either side it's when they get onto the waterfront that it could become a factor we've almost uh, obsessed about it this week everybody checks the weather forecast because when you're on the exposed waterfront there can be that um uh, gusting nature and at the moment it's it's out of the southwest yeah uh we're getting westward winds and um yeah, I, I don't think it's going to affect us very much. So let's say it is perfect racing conditions. And let's go down to two of the key personnel there with Laura De Silva, our interviewer down on the course. It is the race uh, founder, Alan Brooks, and the mayor of Toronto, John Torrey. Good morning, everyone. It's such a beautiful day, and it feels so great to be here back in person. The energy here at the start line is starting to build up. I'm here with Mayor John Tory. Uh, everyone keeps saying you're running this year. Does that mean the race? No, I'm running uh, in an election, but I wish that I was able to run in the uh, marathon, but I've never trained to do that. But, you know, I'm just great it's happening again this year. Uh, after the pandemic, which people around the world have experienced in different ways, you know, we were separated from each other, couldn't get together and do things like this. And this is such a great event on our calendar. We have a film festival that's known around the world. We have many other events, but this is right at the top. And I think what people forget is, aside from bringing people from around the world to run, aside from the thousands of people who run here, it does wonders for charity. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. So it's good for the city in every single respect. Uh, and uh, it's just one of those events that's right at the top of the list. Awesome. I think it's going to be a great day. Alan Brooks, welcome back. He's the race director. Tell us about this year's race. Well, I think, the mayor, as the mayor said, we're just so excited, and it's a very emotional time this weekend that we're seeing friends from around the world that we haven't seen for three years. And, you know, Toronto really is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and today these runners are making it more beautiful. It's a, a city that moves, and a city that cares with all this money, almost $3 million raised for charity. So... We just want everyone to have a wonderful Toronto experience. 
uh, and enjoy the whole city, uh, uh, spend their uh, 25 or 30 million dollars here. Uh, it is about recovery and restart of racing, but so much more. TCS has this wonderful uh, slogan that technology transforms businesses, but marathons change lives. And that's what we're doing today. We're changing lives, changing our city. All right. The countdown to change some lives is on. It's going to be a great day. Back to you guys. Thank you very much, Laura, down at the start line there. So the atmosphere is building. We're less than 20 minutes away from the start of the race. If only we had an expert that knew, knew every inch of the course, Christy Ong. Let's have a quick look at the uh, marathon route that is going to be covered over the next few hours. Okay, here we go. This is one of my favorite courses in the world because it's my backyard. So we are going to be starting on University. Uh, heading up through Queen's Park, this little loop here on the way to the ROM. And then we're going to take a left on to Bloor, past the Varsity Stadium and the Runner Shop. Um, still heading across Bloor. It's a little rocky up there. Uh, left on Bathurst, passing our favorite track, Central Tech. Uh, on the way to Black Toe, heading through Fort York, uh, going downhill onto the lake shore. And from here, we'll probably take some headwind going out to Lakeshore to Ellis and back. Um, and we're here right in front of Hyde Park. There should be a ton of cheer groups that they've passed before and after and on the way. Um, you're about to see bands and uh, all, all the other runners coming through, um, giving them some high fives. And then we're going to go back through Lakeshore, uh, under the Gardener, past the Parkdale group. Um, and then we're going into the uh, Corktown Commons, which is a relatively new area. So there's a bit of a loop. Um, and then uh, this actually circles around Corktown, goes up to Bayview. Um, I think from here, we're going up Bayview, coming back down, loop around Corktown Commons again. There should be a few more cheer groups. Uh, this is still, again, a relatively new area. So there will be two cheer groups over there. Um, it's going to loop around. We're going across Eastern, uh, down to Lakeshore, a uh, little bit of a stretch, and then up Woodbine. Uh, here we're on the, uh, on the east end, uh, where we have culture, athletics, and a number of other cheer groups on the east end. This area used to be a lot quieter before. This year we have it pretty active. There's cheer groups on every single side coming right back down. Uh, we're going to, about here, you could probably see the CN Tower and you know you've got that last little stretch from 35 on. We're heading right back into the city, and as you can see, the buildings are approaching. This is the tough mark, 39. You see the CN Tower, you know where the finish line is. Uh, we see the buildings, you can anticipate it. Going right back down front, and then this is the right turn up bay. See the finish line, you see the metal, and that is the entire marathon. So, yeah, have a great race, everybody. And, and is it just me, or would you give me that one as being shaped like a sombrero hat? <laughs> Do you like that one? Shaped like a Mexican hat. And we've got wheelchair racers out there, or a wheelchair racers, people uh, running, jogging, and walking. But our own uh, little Marty McFly, Krista Koenig, is going out on a skateboard later on to get round for some Vox Pops. I will be on my board. Uh, as soon as I'm done the broadcast, I'm going to be... On my skateboard, I'm going to zip down Young Street, find the Parkdale Roadrunners around 19 kilometers. We're going to do a little uh, little hit, see how see what they're up to. They're going to be the loudest ones um, under the Gardener. Well, yeah, actually, they're going to be under the Gardener, and there's I've, I went there yesterday. There are a lot of them. And uh, I think near the end, and there's Sasha Gaulish. Uh, near the end, I will go to the 41... 42 or 41 kilometer mark and then kind of catch a lot of you people finishing um, and if maybe you are okay you can let me interview you and talk to you and maybe help you maybe I can help you get through to the end we're looking at the elites prowling in their little corral ahead of the start line they've still got uh, just over uh, 17 minutes, 17 minutes to race start. And people go into very different zones here, don't they? There are those that like to chat and like to uh, think of anything but the race. And there are those that look absolutely petrified. <laughs> what, yeah. what are you, Chris? Are you Certainly. A um, I think 
I'm pretty calm, you, you want to enjoy it. And you know, they always say you have to have fun. So I think if you're a bit too tense at the start, that's not the way you want to be. We've talked about the, the weather, the temperature, it seems great. You know, when spectators are a little bit chilly, that's exactly what you want for the yeah. marathon. So some people will start with arm warmers and gloves and, and hats or toques. We might see them come off. But I'm kind of surprised that most people um, in the elite field already are down to their shorts. So yeah. um, I guess they've probably been given that instruction. But they will be collecting those um, items of clothing that they'll they'll toss away before the, the start. And, and the thing, if you're relatively new to marathon running, to be aware for these elites is that this is how they make their living. Uh, there is significant prize money available, uh, not only to the international field, but also to the leading Canadians. There are time bonuses available, and they will have prepared for anything up to six months for this, uh, anything up to uh, 200 kilometers a week for some of the Kenyan men. So it's a serious, serious commitment that they're about to unload on the streets of Toronto, and that's why it's all a bit business-like down there. Yeah, it certainly is. And, you know, some people, when they travel, they just go by themselves for the weekend, just like it's a business trip. Other people, they make it a, an event with their family or they have friends meet them to, to watch the race. And, um, yeah, it's exciting. There's 70 different countries represented down there. Uh, we've got uh, a few dozen Guinness World Record attempts. As we look back at the masses there, you can see Corral behind this elite front pen. And... Uh, three million dollars being raised annually for good causes locally nationally and internationally so as the mayor john torrey said there's all sorts of reasons why it's welcome back the final travel restrictions uh, for visitors were only fully lifted on the first of october so the uh, this is the land acknowledgement and it's now home to numerous nations so i'd like to encourage you after this to take some time and to um, look at the, the histories of this region. We go and have a good run. Thank you so much, Prozance. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce a gentleman who uh, has always been so welcoming to us at the Canada Running Series. And uh, I always joke, I wish I, I need to move to Toronto because he's such a great mayor here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mayor John Tory, to welcome you now. Well, good morning, and you should move to Toronto so you can get on with that. And I will say welcome in particular, of course, to all of the people uh, from around the world who come to the Toronto Marathon. One of the reasons it's so important among many is because it brings people from all over the world as well as thousands of people from Toronto uh, to take part uh, in this. And I want to uh, just say thank you to the Toronto Marathon team, to Alan Brooks and everybody for bringing this event back. Uh, because isn't it great for all of us to be able to be at the marathon again, to be together. And I want to thank the people taking part, among many others, uh, for the cooperation they showed in getting us to this stage of dealing with the pandemic so that we can be back together again doing something that is so important and provides so many benefits for people here and puts Toronto on the map around the world. I want to just acknowledge how special it is for us to have uh, the Hong family here today um, after the, the terrible loss that, that they experienced to have Jenny and Mia and Alex here today so that we could pay tribute to them and so that they could be part of this great event is something very special I hope for them and for the policing family but also for all of us to be able to uh, pay tribute uh, to them. And I want to acknowledge as well the Tata group and the fact they've stepped up to be the major sponsors, the title sponsors of the marathon. Uh, they are a great company that has originally come to Canada as many other countries from India and they have created thousands of jobs here, but they've also got themselves right into the community. And finally, I just want to say a thank you for the fact that this event today will make a massive contribution to charity, to the well-being of people in Toronto and elsewhere. And that's another important thing that people don't know as much about when it comes to the marathon, millions of dollars that are raised for charity. So I wish you all luck. I thank you very much for participating. I encourage all the people here from other countries to move here. Uh, we uh, would love to have you live here in Toronto or bring your friends to visit, but have a great run, a safe run, and thank you very much again to all the team that put this on and made this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mayor John Tory, without whom well, the, he, he and all of the support from the City of Toronto, we would not be able to put on this event. Thank you so much, Mayor Tory. It now gives me great pleasure to bring up a gentleman we are so thrilled to have the crew from TCS 
involved in our race this year as our title sponsor. And uh, to say a few words to welcome all of our participants today, Mr. Schumann Roy. Good morning, Toronto. It is so good to be back running on the streets again after two years. We are so proud as TCS to become the new title sponsor for Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Running is in our DNA, and we believe anything is possible if you build on belief. Once again, good morning, Toronto, and don't forget to download the unique TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon app on your phones. It's cool. It also has a sustainability calculator for all of you. Thank you so much, and wish you all the best to the runners and the spectators. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherman Roy, and thank you to all of the crew from TCS. And you can just tell the enthusiasm that this entire group has for this event. We are so thrilled. It now gives me great pleasure to bring up a lady who's going to sing our national anthem. Please welcome Lisa Michelle Cornelius. Lisa Michelle Cornelius, that was absolutely beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, we had a, a very tragic loss um, a short time ago, and we would now like to just take a moment of silence to honor Officer Andrew Hong, his wife Jenny, and his kids Mia and Alex are here today. So please, if you could, if we could just have a moment of silence to remember and honor Officer Andrew Hahn. to Jenny and Mia and Alex for being with us here today. And we are so sorry for your loss. Well, that uh, moment of silence was followed by the sirens because uh, the late officer Hong was uh, a police mounted motorcycle officer very sad the family there it only happened last month so uh, a moment of silence and reflection as we come to five minutes to go to our first start which will be josh cassidy i can see uh, two wheelchairs down on the start there so it's josh plus one they'll be given a two minute head start they're likely to go round in around about 90 minutes 
We expect our first male international runner to be hopefully around about two hours and five minutes, but let's see. This is where the nerves are really jangling. Yeah. You just want to get it on. Don't you? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so many months in preparation for this race. And then, you know, you want to stay focused, but you you want to give it your all. And, yeah, it's important to just kind of stay loose and relax the shoulders, take it in, look around. You know, they say that half the battle is just getting to the start line. So hopefully everyone's uh, healthy and there's no lingering issues with, with most people. Of course, there's going to be some, but... This is a very intense moment that you just want to stay focused and, and calm and take a few deep breaths. Well, it's part of a, a wider festival of running. The, the start that we're looking at uh, has the half marathon and the full marathon runners getting underway in a few minutes' time. But, uh, Chris, we've already had a, a 5K run that started at 8 o'clock. Yeah, uh, that, that started earlier on the waterfront, um, complete, like very separate from here. Uh, b back to this, I, I have run this before, and I know that if you're running the full do you have to check the bibs and make sure you're not running with someone who's running the half because they're going to leave you at halfway. Um, and also everyone goes out so fast. Yeah. So you got to be careful who you're running with. And there's so much excitement. I can't imagine how fast this is going to be after three years. The advice that first timers and uh, more experienced marathon runners are always given is don't go off too fast. Everybody does it. And one of the reasons is because of the pent up nervous energy while you've been waiting and waiting and prowling on the start line. For sure, and, and it takes a lot of emotional control. And if you're feeling good at 20, 25K, that, that's fine. You should be feeling good, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you're starting to, to push it already because no one wants to be, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes slower in the, in the second half if they didn't have that emotional control in the first half. So there will be uh, pacemakers that will especially accompany the leading women because there are a number of men that can go that fast. For a 205 full marathon, uh, there may be a little bit of help to halfway and then they'll be on their own. You know, the thing that uh, occurs to me looking at this is what a big unit Trevor Hofbauer is, isn't he? He's built on a completely different scale. Look at him in the, the center there in the yellow, uh, in, the, in the white singlet and the blue T-shirt. He's a big man, isn't he? Right. He comes from a basketball background. And in fact, he didn't really like running uh, initially. I think he just did it to kind of stay fit for basketball. But, you know, clearly he's uh, made a career and progressed in that. So, you know, with the pacing, it's definitely beneficial if you can just kind of tuck in behind someone. Um, with Trevor, he wouldn't get much benefit from tucking in behind if he wanted to be protected from the wind but um, you know it just goes to show that any body type can be be running it and, um, and and excelling with with what you're doing yep and we've seen it in in all endurance disciplines that uh, it accommodates a variety of shapes and sizes but these are a really powerful looking runner you can see the elite women clustered there on the right hand side as we look at it beneath the TCS arch and there are two wheelchair runners. We'll try and pick up on who the other one is, apart from Josh Casty. They're due to get underway in uh, just under a minute from now at 8.43. Uh, they'll have a two-minute head start. And now the uh, uh, masses are gathered. You can see so th those little placards that are being held up further back. They are the pacing teams that will guide people to the target times that are written on those boards. So this is going to be a big emotional moment. I know that uh, Alan Brooks has been looking forward to it for so long. We had a, uh, a cutback 10 kilometer race. We've had in-person uh, virtual races over the last year or two. But this is the sort of jewel in the crown of Canadian mass racing and uh, a very special moment coming up as we get underway for the 2022 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Welcome, if you're just tuning in, it's Jeff Whiteman with uh, Krista Duchesne and Krista Koning bringing you the live stream coverage. And I know that there will be people around the world watching this because some of the Kenyans that are lined up here today uh, did so as a result of watching the 2019 live stream. So if you're thinking about it as a bucket list uh, destination marathon for whatever level of standard you run at, then enjoy the next few hours because it is one of the mo most beautiful cities in the world. And this is a great, great way to see it and get a personal best at the same time. So stand by for our elite wheelchairs on the start line. Josh Cassidy plus one companion. I think that's Josh on the left as we look at it. Josh is on the right. Uh, on the right yeah. in the all black. Okay. That's right. And the other participant may be doing the half marathon okay. as well. I'm not sure. So the chances are that Josh may well go clear here. 
at a relatively early stage. Here we go, final countdown for our elite wheelchair starters. They're making sure the runners don't respond to the sound of the gun. Here we go, so that klaxon is just for our elite wheelchair racers, the first ever on this course. So in years to come, we'll look back at this moment and say these were the two pioneers. And I think, Christy, you're probably right. Half marathon competitor on the left and Josh Casty going the full distance on the right-hand side. Now we're into a final countdown for the rest of the mass field. Those are the chip timing mats on the ground that will activate when they cross them. So that is how, if you have downloaded the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon app, you will know where everybody is on the course by virtue of the chip timing and the sensor mats all the way around the course. Are you feeling nervous watching this? <laughs> yes, I mean, with Chris and I just doing Chicago last weekend, this fam familiar feeling uh, is right there in our minds. And um, But, you know, as soon as you get going, you get that first 5K mark, I think it's getting into the rhythm and, and the nerves definitely settle down. This is actually a little surreal to see because, I mean, three years ago, nobody knew what was going to happen. No. We were wondering, that could that have been our last? And to just see this is beautiful. And, and the best is that er, all, the, all the Canadians, uh, pretty much everyone up there, they're all friends. Yeah. But they're in a competition. I'm back up. What a great sign. So there won't be a countdown because people jump the gun when we have a countdown. It, the next thing you hear will be the gun and we'll be underway with the mass field. 25,000 runners doing the half marathon and the full marathon. It's a two minute lead that the wheelchair racers will have to ensure that they stay clear of the field. Hofbauer boogie in in the middle there. Right beside uh, Rory Linkletter in the yellow, bright yellow. Yeah, Melendi's dancing to it. It's a big moment in person, in Toronto, in your face, coronavirus. Mass racing is back, and look at that site. The TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon of 2022 is underway, and it's a big moment for the sport, a big moment for running in Canada as well, and the drone shot will show you just how many thousands of people are about to start their adventure on the roads of Toronto. The opening section, should be slightly with a tailwind, Chris. Uh, yeah, there should be a little bit. There's actually a little bit of a, an incline going up uh, as they reach Queen's Park. And then the, there's a bit of a tight turn as well. So uh, I think that'll probably force people to hold themselves back. Um, but I, after seeing how excited and how fast everyone took off, they could be just, who cares, throwing caution to the wind. Well, it looks like a uh, few people have gone ripping out there early on. I think there's one or two people who may not be going the full distance, just trying to get on camera. But slowly but surely, that elite men's pack is coming together. We're going to be bringing you four camera options uh, as the race unfolds. There will be a camera on the elite men. There will be a camera on the Canadian men. There will be a camera on the elite women and a camera on the Canadian women. So depending on uh, what's happening in each of those groups or with each of those individual leaders, uh, we'll switch and swap our coverage to try and bring you all the crucial developments in the race. But right now, we're just savoring the moment as uh, runners who are perhaps making their debuts, uh, running for charity, running in memory of people that have been close to them, or perhaps in the case of one man and one woman coming back for the 33rd consecutive time uh, to run the race. There is one man who's done the whole lot, and he looks, he looks very well on it because he must be pushing 70. doesn't look it. That is an incredible accomplishment. So we're switching straight away to the elite men where the uh, task will be to take them inside 205 pace. And it looks like there's two paces. And already there's a little bit of daylight over some of the uh, competitors we would expect to see covering those moves early. So I wonder if they've just shot off a little bit too quickly. Enoch Onchari is the athlete in uh, 
third behind the two pacemakers. And you can see they're starting to take closer order. So that was, was perhaps a little bit of a spurt off the start, start line, and it will now group up nicely. Yeah, I believe so. I think uh, heading up to Bloor, we'll see what happens. Um, everyone will start to relax and feel the, the nature of the course. Um, there are a number of twists and turns. This is Hospital Row on University, uh, and they've just passed college, so this is where it gets a little, a little tactical. You gotta cut your corners, make sure you're not going too wide. Um, we don't have the blue line that you get in the world majors. Definitely, there's no blue line on this. Well, that only st that's a famous blue line. I could speak for the one that exists at London Marathon. It gets put down in the small hours of Saturday night going into Sunday morning, usually around midnight. Most runners, of course, can't see it because they're shoulder to shoulder and, and their eye line is above it. And then it's removed midnight on the Sunday night. So it's in environmentally friendly paint. It's a nice feature. They've almost got to do it because they've done it all 42 years or whatever it is. But it's, um, it, it's a, a labor of love for somebody. So that's a big group now starting to form up. I'm just looking back to see where Hofbauer and Linkletter are. There's um, all of the usual suspects that we would expect. The seeded bib numbers, although these days everybody runs with their name on their bib, are one through seven. Those are the invited overseas East African runners from Kenya and Ethiopia. So chugging along, we would expect the first mile to come up in uh, around about the next 40 seconds or so. For those of you watching in... Uh, metric distances, the, the first key split will be at five kilometers. That's when we'll know whether they're on schedule. And I think in this picture, we've got the those doing the marathon are wearing the all black bib and the half marathon, it looks like it's a white bib. I think that's Tristan Woodfine in there, um, probably about at, at the at the end of this lead pack. Who the would blonde be doing? Guy. No, beside him, okay. it's doing that the half marathon. That's I think you're right, yeah. yeah. It almost looks like Matt Hughes, but I don't think that's not him. I don't think on the left beside Tristan. Matt Hughes was injured last time I checked, but mm. it, it'd be the sort of thing he would do, isn't it, Tristan? <laughs> he would just jump in. Jump in. I mean, he did just get married, so I think he's still <laughs> relaxing and enjoying this retirement. Maybe he's pacing Tristan. Okay, let's check in with the Canadian men while the uh, international men settle down a little bit further back down the road. This is the... Well, it's a mixture, as you've observed. The white back numbers are going the half marathon distance, including the leader on the right-hand side of the shot. And looking back with the black back numbers, nope, nope, there is a pacemaker there for Linkletter and uh, Trevor Hofbauer's... Uh, oh, what has he got on his headband as well? Does that say spell out something as well? But they will be, I guess, looking for something around about 2.8 or, or thereabouts, maybe? I, I think around 2.09 is what we would expect to see from Trevor and Rory today. Um, you know, given the conditions, I think that they would be confident that that would definitely be a possibility for them. So Rory Linkletter in the yellow singlet and the dark glasses towards the back there. The story of his year is an unusual one. He was uh, fully preparing for track championships and then got a late call up on the qualification criteria to run for Canada at the World Championships in Oregon in the second week of July. Ran extremely well there off a limited six week build up finished 20th in the world and has uh, therefore had the luxury of a more full build up for this one. Yeah, you can actually see the two of them since they're both working together. Trevor, I feel like he's just taking the lead since he knows the course. He's just looking down. He already knows how to feel at this mark. And Rory's been strategic about this, as you mentioned to me before, uh, that he actually knows where everything is going to be and how he's going to feel at every, every kilometer marker. Well, they were shoulder to shoulder on the start line. I think Hofbauer is looking across to say, where are you, Linkletter? And the answer is he's just about two strides behind now. But that's quite a big group they're having to contend with there. Dylan Wikes is in the back there with his mile to marathon shirt. Um, he's the leader of that group coaching business. And he, of course, ran at the 2012 Olympics. So you can see him tall, blue on the left with the sky, black shorts. In the sky blue, yeah, yes. with the gloves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So already, I mean, if you look in the top right-hand corner of the screen, we're not quite seven minutes into the race, but you can see these distinct duels and uh, contests within contests are taking their own place in the race. That's a, a big gap up ahead of them to the leading elite men, and it's a big gap behind them for the battle for Canadian honours. We were talking about Vesalius potentially being uh, top three, but I don't see him in that shot. We're just approaching the three-kilometre mark. 
I think we're gonna pass by uh, the U there. Were, there it is, the U of T track. So the shout is for water. Of course, it's a cool day, um, and and it's a relatively early stage in the race, but. Taking on board fluids is part of the energy release process. So if you've taken on all those carbohydrates in the last uh, 72 hours or so, uh, taking on board water, CH2O is the ingredient for, car uh, for glycogen. And those are the stores that will get you through the uh, last part of the race, but quite early to be taken on water. Right, I know that um, you can take less fluid in when it's cooler weather. Of course, when it's warmer, you would want to take more in. So the elites will have their bottles that they've already given to the race uh, volunteers that would be at the table. So the 3K mark that we saw was just water for anyone to take, but up around the 5K, we're gonna see them start to move over to the left, get their eye on their bottle and grab it, hopefully without any contact and then they can consume their fluid. They might have a gel tape to it that they would consume in a little bit, but that's uh, definitely something that they would have trained ahead of time to do before the race so that their gut is prepared um, for, the, for the racing and ingesting those. And there are plenty of uh, drink stationed options. It, it always uh, intrigues me in a marathon where athletes don't have a lot to do the day before a race. So they, they lavish a lot of care and attention on preparing those elite drinks bottles, putting flowers and flags and tape and distinctive markings on them and then almost obsessing about them. Right, and then it got to the point that I think that if you went back to just a plain bottle, that was the easier one to see because it was the only one that didn't have the, yeah. the colors and, and the bright ribbons and whatnot. But, you know, I, I know I visualize what my bottle is gonna look like and they should be placed on the same spot at every table. So you should know um, your table two in the third position, maybe the second row. And, th and that's very helpful to know um, where your bottle should be because you don't want to miss it. But the, mo the most common uh, break point in a marathon for elites is often the drink station because people cut across, they dive. Sometimes I've seen elite marathon runners go back uh, and grab that bottle and you think, great, well done. You got your bottle, but you've just lost the race and you've lost $30,000. <laughs> you know, it's, it becomes almost like a superstition, doesn't it? To, to well, and I it. guess it depends on how you're feeling. If you really need that last bit of fuel for the last station at, at 40K, then, it, yeah. you know, it's worth going back or if it's warm. And it's definitely a good idea to kind of signal your turn or, or point that you're going to be wanting to go over to the left. So we're going to see Trevor do that and Rory as their bottles will be on that table. And you definitely don't want to be making any, any contact because that has certainly happened before in race races where um, there have, have been injuries and, and you know setbacks because yeah. of that. Well, we'll look out for that uh, a little bit later on in the race. This is, uh, this is quite tricky for this pacemaker because he's there for Hofbauer and Linkletter, and you can see them almost like in a diagonal line behind him, but there's so many other runners there uh, as well that it, it's a tricky one for him, Chris. Yeah, uh, actually back, back to the water bit in 2019, Trevor lost his bottle and went back to go get it and then he grabbed another water bottle for his pacer. Right. So he watered and helped the pacer. Um, but yeah, here we're taking a left on Bathurst and it's about to go on a decline. This is probably gonna be fast. I imagine the half marathoners are gonna split off from here. Ooh. Trevor's put his foot in the tram line there, didn't yeah, he? And, and be careful. With that's the to your point, Jeff, that w when it's crowded with the half marathon and the marathon, I <laughs> I kind of think that the half marathon people should kind of find their way away. So here's Trevor kind yeah. of dodging yeah. back and, and forth. Um, I think he's he's had enough probably, of the half marathon. Well, he's probably <laughs> going for his bottles because the tables will be on the right. Okay. Well, let's just see him grab this bottle if there is one. And then uh, we've checked in with the international. And there's Linkletter following. Well, I think he just wants out of the crowd yeah, there. That, that, that was could just be true. Yeah, I think he just wanted a clear line to see where he was putting his feet. So we've checked in with the international men. We've checked in with the Canadian men. Uh, let's go across and see how the international women's race is unfolding at uh, the head of the field. And it looks like it is, uh, let's count them. There's about eight, and it is all of the leading suspects in the elite women's race. We're 11 and a half minutes in. It looks as though they've got their one uh, lone male pacemaker at the head of the group, but much more tightly packed far less half marathon runners getting in the way at this point and the notional leader in the red there is the defending champion magdalena mags masai oh i don't think she likes how close they are to her heels that's her teammate chebitok who just clipped her she does have quite a high back lift doesn't she masai Yes, you know, you want to be close and, and get that feel of, of those around you where you're working together as a group. But yeah, you do have to be careful that you're not too close because that's 
you know, you could trip up, especially with the streetcar lines there. That's happened before, so you definitely have to take caution. Um, so there's, uh, there's Dana Pitoreski there with the yellow top and the gray shorts and the orange shoes. And it looks like her pacer is going to be the, the man with uh, the white vest and the, and the white hat beside her. So that uh, answers the question about where are the leading Canadian women. They're right there in with the elite women. But where is Melinda Elmore? Have you seen her? I don't. I have not seen her yet. But I think she's going to be paced by Kevin Coffey. They were uh, standing beside each other on the start line. So probably that's the case with her. And I would imagine she would be in, in the group behind this group. Is um, Dana Piotrowski trying to win this? Because she's gone off very, I, very quickly well, here, hasn't I she? I doubt she's trying to win, but, you know, Dana does go out hard, and that has paid off for her. I mean, sure, there's been times where it, maybe it hasn't, and it's been more difficult in the second half, but this is the race last year where, like I said, she was she was ahead of the Canadian group. We didn't know, and sure enough, she, she took that lead from the beginning, and she secured her spot for the Olympic team and ran a personal best um, to get the time to, to compete for the Olympics as well with her time of 2.29. So on the gun time, uh, which is in the top right hand corner of the screen, we're coming up to 14 minutes. That means that the elite men will be going through five kilometers very shortly. That will be the first split we'll be able to give you. Uh, we hope that's going to project to something around 2.05. So it should be uh, ideally around about 14.50. So just under a minute from now for the elite uh, men. The elite women very much uh, in tight formation there, you can see. There's the languages that are spoken are Swahili for the Kenyans and uh, Amharic for the Ethiopians. They've all got some English, but there's not a lot of chat going on, as you can see. It's all pretty serious. And they all look to be about five foot two and size two, six feet, don't they? So those men, those in the white back bibs are going the half marathon distance. They look to be hitching a bit of a ride there. And the two pacemakers in the... Uh, black bibs. Well, let's go back to the uh, elite men's field. The very first runners out on the course behind Josh Cassidy and the uh, wheelchair race. This is them. And we think we're at around about the 5K. They're sprinting and surging. This That's is a really big downhill. Uh, literally just in front of our, uh, our track and skate park. So you can see they're grabbing their individual bottles and they've got little handles that they might grab or um, sometimes you use two hands to do it. But it looks like uh, at least the three of them have got it and they can give it to their pacer. As, as far as I understand, um, you cannot receive your bottle from someone else. So I think it's okay to give it to your pacer, but I don't think the pacer can give it to you. Is that right? I, I don't know about that. I, I'm trying to think what Elliot Kipchoge was doing in, in Berlin and whether that was... Um, well, that was the race itself, not yeah. participants okay. in the race. Okay. I've seen shared bottles before, but I, I'm not sure exactly what the ruling is on that in terms of assistance. You may be right. So that did disrupt things a little bit, but they're now getting back into formation. Uh, that looks to be the leader in the half marathon uh, yeah. in the white singlet at the back there. And he, we can say is going at uh, around about 62 and a half minute uh, full, ma full half marathon pace. Okay, let's have a look at the split at 5K. Top right hand corner of the screen, 1440. So it is super fast. That is uh, somewhere around 204 pace. So we're very much on schedule for the fastest time ever seen in Canada, but it is early days yet. The pacemakers have a job to do and some of those directly behind have just got to control things a little bit. Is this still slightly downhill, Chris? This is Chris? all still downhill right until the water, so they've really got to just take advantage of this. But you can literally just ride this all the way down to the water. I think one or two of those are working a little bit too hard, but we'll see. Okay, let's go to the Canadian men and see what their splits are. And 15.22 was the split there. So that's at around about 2.07.20 pace. So they've gone out quick, although Hofbauer at the back of that group, Linkletter right at the back of that group. So the, the pacemakers just need to be careful and figure out who they're pacing for here because there's lots of runners ar around them, but uh, many of them are doing the half marathon distance. The pacers need to get with those with the black back numbers. Yeah, and I think Hofbauer and Linkletter are just backing off this a little bit. The pacer needs to be aware of what's going on here. Those guys behind him aren't going the full marathon. They have white back numbers. And I think I think um, 
Trevor Hofbauer is getting impatient about getting a decent sort of sight line here. We've still got tram lines to watch out for. And once again, he moves across to one side just so he can see where he's going. He's got a touch of impetuosity about him, hasn't he? Yeah, maybe he's just not wanting to be with the crowd. You know, he's a, he's a tall guy. If he gets tripped up, that's going to be a hard fall. So maybe he just wants to kind of get over and, and find his rhythm and not be distracted by the half marathoners that are around him. Well, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's the uh, fastest Canadian ever. Well, no, he's not, because Cam Levins broke the national record. He's the second fastest Canadian ever on this course. And that's one of the cheer zones that's uh, giving them a bit of a lift. That's the Black Toe Run Store Run Group. They have a big run team. They'll be all over the course today. I'm trying to see if Trevor's wearing a watch because uh, the last time he there, did this race, he there's wasn't. a watch. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. Little, little white one. Now you can have the watch and maybe not look at it. So we'll see if that's a strategy that he's using today. Like okay, we're going to move across to the elite women because have we spotted Melinda Elmore right in the middle there? there? Yeah, yeah, in the she's yellow in the, singlet. Taking a drink. Yeah. No, so she's she in the white singlet with um, the pink and the navy blue. Yes. Right beside Kevin Coffey, who's wearing the orange singlet, who's her, his, the pacer for her. So she's actually in about sixth or seventh place in the race. But I'm looking for Pitoreski and her pacer. So the Canadian elite women and the international elite women are all part of the same group. We've, we've identified Melindy Elmore there, as Krista said, in the white singlet with her pacemaker in the orange, but where is Pitoreski? Well, we have a separate camera following Canadian women, but um, Melindy Elmore, of course, is in that leading group. Let's see what the other picture option is then for Canadian women. There it is. That's Sasha Golish there. She's in the pink top, and she's being paced by Reed Coolsat, who is wearing the, the red singlet at the front and the red shoes. And I think that's um, Canadian group three for women. So um, Reed, I think he's going at about 2.32 pace for that group. Um, Victoria Coates, who's also running today, she might be in that group or just behind. And um, Sasha Golish has a personal best of, I believe, 232. There's Victoria right there. She just popped out. She's got the all black. So she's to the left of Sasha, Sasha Golish. Is that is that Reed in the red shoes? There? Yes. Yeah. Like, you've been watching too much Wizard of Oz, hasn't he? There. Looking, <laughs> today's color is New red. His sponsor. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, what we're looking at is third place at the moment in the Canadian Women's Championship. That's We've right. got two in the leading group. So this is actually third in this chasing group. Uh, with Golish. Right. We've got Melindy and Dana in the first group, and then we've got Sasha and Victoria in the second group. How long do you think those two elite Canadian women can hang with the leading international women? Beyond halfway? I'm not sure. It looks like, um, according to our splits here, the women's group went out just under 70 minutes for the first 5K, which is a, an estimated finish of 2.23. So that is, uh, that's quick. That's a 3.24 per kilometre pace. Let's go back to the elite men's race and just see how things are shaping up at the head of the field. It's rather more strung out than you might expect as they uh, turn onto this long straight section. Yeah, here, here we go down uh, Fort York, um, and it's again a little downhill. This leads into the Coronation Park, but then that extends into the water. Uh, it's a bit of a ride. Um, it's about to get busy. Actually, just on this turn, there should be another group that's fairly loud. I, I think it's the me, yeah, the me versus me group actually has a DJ. So my I think you can hear that. It's going to be exciting. I mean, ideally, what a pacemaking group looks like is like an arrowhead. You have the two pacemakers at the center of a triangle and the other runners tightly packed within about a second or two of them. And this is very strung out, really. And it suggests that either it's gone out too quick or there are people really, really struggling. And their decision is if they hang on, they're in company. If they drop off the back, there's nothing. It's a big 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 gap back to the next group yeah it's it's tough when you're you know you're going to do well if you can run with the group but if that group is just a little bit too fast for what your fitness is you can really regret that decision later so um, that's a decision some athletes have to make definitely it's easier um, in the second half of the race but if, if you go out too hard too soon you're you know not going to be having an, an even split so all of the main suspects are still in that group, but it is strung out. Let's go back and check in with the Canadian men, just a little bit further back down the road, still running well. It's 
still have Dylan Wikes running the half. And Trevor's pretty relaxed. Rory is out there cheering the, the crowd. <laughs> okay, here, and Trevor. <laughs> that's my group. That's my team right there, Pace okay. in mind. And my coach, Rajon. They're obviously feeling very relaxed at this stage that they can orchestrate the cheering. It must be my team. So they're just under 210 pace right now. And Linkletter, that's the furthest up this group that we've seen him. Uh, it's previously been Hofbauer ahead of Linkletter. They certainly haven't run stride for stride at any point yet, have they? they they're doing their own thing. Right, for sure. And, you know, this is a, an exciting race for Rory. He he switched um, coaches, went to Ryan Hall. He was with the Hoka group um, from about 2019 to 2021. Started with Ryan in December 21, had no sponsors, um, signed with Puma in um, May of 2022. Um, he and his wife have, have a baby, Jason. I think that they're both here watching today. And this is his first marathon build with Ryan. So even though he did run in the World Championships this past summer, um, it was a short build because he was uh, notified late that he was selected for the team. So he's really excited. I think he felt he needed more kind of individual coaching as opposed to the group um, aspect. So he's he's really um, excited to see what he can do here today with the changes that he's made in the last couple of years. Well, Ryan Hall is, I think, still the American record holder at uh, half and full. I can't remember. I think the half. Half marathon. Mm -hmm. But he, he's turned to bodybuilding. Um, so he's very, very big guy now. He, it, it's an unusual switch to have been an endurance athlete and all the uh, lean body mass that that tends to entail to somebody now who could crush you if you took him on at an arm wrestle. Nice and man. I, I think we saw earlier today that it's his 40th birthday, if, if that's correct. I right, saw some right pictures that, that was posted. So, yeah, one of the things that Rory said was different with, with um, his training now is that he does like a six-day instead of a seven-day training um, week. And um, he, he thinks he's really going to have the strength to grit this one out. Um, you know, just like Trevor, he wants that Canadian title. And um, he's, he's happy to be here in, in Toronto. He did debut here um, w with his marathon previously. Well, they were lovely shots we had there of the CN Tower, which is one of the landmarks on the Toronto skyline. If you're watching this and thinking about coming next year, don't forget also that Niagara Falls are only a few, uh, a few miles away, about a half hour bus ride. And we're going to check in with the Canadian women's situation. And unusually, when we get the picture, this is Pitoreski alone. Now, I'm just trying to figure out whether that's her ahead of the chasing pack or whether she's just slotted in slightly behind. She's on her own with her own pacemaker. We've seen this before now as we pan back. So she must be running slightly behind that uh, leading elite women's group, I think. Or she's gone completely mad and uh, had a rush of blood and is more than 200 meters clear. But I suspect she's just... I think, I think that she's, she's just, just right behind. behind. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're just passing, uh, or actually approaching Ontario Place. So it looks like the lead, <coughs> the lead woman passed there, and then Dana fell back a little behind. She's not that far behind, though. Right, I think it's only about five seconds from the 5K split that we got. So they are just to the left of our camera shot, the, uh, the medal contenders in the international race and the Canadian Championship. Pitoreski, of course, qualified for the Tokyo Olympics here last time out and won the Canadian title. She spoke to us a little bit earlier in the week. Let's hear what she had to say. Hi, I'm Dana Pitoreski and I'm running the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. It's been a long time off of racing. For me, I'm really used to racing like 10, 12 times a year. And this season I've, this will be my third race. Yeah, I don't know if I do anything that I always do. Like I remember before Toronto in 2019, I watched like the Breaking Two documentary. Like Kipchoge just looks like it's a walk in the park. So maybe I'll try to find that this time around. <laughs> I have great memories coming back to Toronto. So that's important. Uh, the first time I raced or finished a marathon was here and I didn't have great memories from that. That was in, I think 20, and so it was nice to like create some fresh memories in 2019 by PBing and breaking the tape and securing my Olympic spot, which was a dream come true. I love this course. I have good memories from it, and I just you know hope to run it a bit faster this year. I think Toronto is actually the fastest 
forest that I've grown. Here I just really feel the love and right now like from my experience and like how I felt on the day, Toronto has been where I felt the best. So we're back live on the roads, 27 and a half minutes in. This is Dana Pidoreski with her own personal pacemaker. She's operating at the moment about five or 10 seconds uh, behind the elite women's group that also includes uh, two of the, her Canadian rivals. So she knows what she's doing, but she's just sitting off it a little bit, Krista. Right, you know, Dana's an experienced runner and um, she's she's well known for her many victories at the Around the Bay 30K race in Hamilton, Ontario. I think she's won it about four times and her per personal best in that distance is 149. Uh, earlier this year in May, she ran the BMO Vancouver Marathon and then she followed it up at the end of the month by doing the Ottawa Marathon. So she was the, the winner of the BMO and then she was sixth in Ottawa. And it was, it was kind of this bit of a challenge, I think, to herself to be doing two marathons in one month. Certainly, um, definitely a lot of an intensity there. And then she would have taken a, a, a break in her training before um, resuming to come to here today to race this race. Well, it's going to be fascinating because she's uh, backing her pacemaker, backing her own judgment but currently sitting just a little bit back of quite a uh, tightly packed elite women's group. Often people like to run in company. She's quite happy just to run with that uh, male marathon runner and her own personal pacemaker. The next checkpoint that's coming up will be 10 kilometers. The first athletes to hit it will be the elite men, where we still have two pacemakers operating. They'll be hoping to go for another 30 minutes or so to the halfway point. Pitoreski, We'll be hoping to uh, pick off a few people that have gone off too quick in that elite women's group. So here are the elite men coming up to the 10K point. Uh, tell us where we are on the course here, Chris. We are just by what we call the Legion Hill. So they are going on Lakeshore. This is a little decline, but uh, for most of us runners out here, we're scared to go back up and it's the smallest hill. But for them, they're gonna be hitting this little bit of a decline there's a little bit of headwind but not that much um, but this takes us like all the way out to the west towards high park there should be a number of cheer groups right in the middle too um, but as you see the officer driving up the hill this is our our, our biggest one that's the re that's the return run that's yeah. the contra flow where they'll hit it next time so the two pacemakers doing a great job still strung out a little bit felix candy on the right hand side of the shot a 206 man with the uh, hat on carrying the drinks bottle, which he discards there. But all of the leading, leading contenders still in there. Kip Yego, Adani, Wami, Candy, Kibitok, Kip Kamoy, and the early flourish from Onchari. Just looking to see if he's in there. And I'm also looking at one half marathon runner with a white back bib. Did somebody say Mo Ahmed was in there? That's so that's Tristan Woodfine. Okay, so Woodfine is undoubtedly leading in the overall half marathon, the only man hanging with this men's group. Let's see what we had at the 10 kilometer point. 29.35, so they're operating very close to 2.05 pace, but it's drifted just a little bit, perhaps reflecting the slight headwind that they may be running into and the uh, slight uphill that we've had. Yeah, we're gonna have, uh, they're, they're going into the wind right now. It's gonna probably speed up a little bit on the other on the other end, going into the half. Um, but I need must say, this is probably one of our most beautiful spots in the city to be running across. It's called the Martin Goodman Trail or yeah. called the MGT. Uh, so they get to experience what we do every day, which is one of our favorites. Well, the good news is, whenever you see a flag on a flagpole, it's not even flattering. There was a maple leaf flag just back there outside that sports center, and it was completely hanging limply. So hopefully the wind won't be a factor because we're away from the buildings and the built-up area. If they were going to be exposed to the wind, this is where it would start to bite, and it's not looking like it's a factor. So Tristan Woodfine, um, although he's running the half today, he is going to be likely attempting to make the, the next Olympic team. He had the standard, uh, but was um, number four. So only sending three, he wasn't able to compete for Canada. Uh, Cameron Levins actually you know, bumped him to that fourth position. So he's definitely gonna be looking to be a top three. A little bit further back down the road are the elite Canadian men and their 10 kilometer split was 30-51. I'm just looking at that in terms of 208, maybe 20, 208 and a half. 
So that's Hofbauer in the center there, the defending champion in the blue and the white with the T-shirt and the headband, and in the shades in the center with the fluorescent singlet, Rory Linkletter. And I don't think there's a third Canadian man going the full marathon distance. That's in the black packed bib numbers in that group. I think it's just those those two clear. Do you spot anybody else there, Chris? I can't quite see. No, I think Lee Wasellius, we're gonna see him um, behind this group. I think we're just looking at those the two, uh, Rory and um, Trevor. Yeah, and plenty of company. The point where the half marathon diverges from the full marathon is... At about 20K. Yeah, well, yeah. well the, the closing stages of the half marathon. So it's a little bit disconcerting, I guess, for a marathon runner. I've done a couple of races where I've been with half marathon runners and it, it puts you off, doesn't it? Especially the one I did. I did a lap of a half marathon and then the half marathon has joined in. That's brutal, mm -hmm. where, where they've gone half the distance and are twice as fresh. I think it might benefit someone like Trevor though, because he seems to really want to stay away from everybody. Yeah. And just uh, and stick to Rory. You could even see Rory and, and Trevor earlier were, were throwing jokes back at each other and laughing. Yeah. So they both know what they're doing. They just don't want to be in the middle of these guys. They've both had a taste of global championship um, representation for Canada. Hofbauer at the Olympics, which disappointed him. Linkletter at the World Championships this year, which absolutely delighted him. And you've got to assume that the first man home here is in the driving seat, subject to the time qualification when Athletics Canada reviews this. Definitely a, a situation you want to be in where you've got someone who's who's competing for that title with you that has similar fitness, right? Um, it's ideal to be out there with the pacers, but also to have that motivation of, you know, someone to run with that you want to beat in the end for that title. So that's our second check-in around the 10-kilometer point. When last we uh, looked, the leading Canadian women we're in with the elite women. They'll be coming up shortly in a minute or two to their 10 kilometer point. So let's go across to the elite women's camera bike and see how that's looking uh, a little bit further back down the road. And we're coming up to the splits for the uh, elite women. There they are. And their split is 33.36 at 10K. So that is around about 2.21, 2.21.20 pace. But the two Canadians look like they've drifted off the back of that. I'm just looking for Elmore and Pitoreski. Right, I think that the lead women here are running what we probably thought that they would run today, around 2.21. So they've settled into that, and it looks like um, Melindy and Dana um, have dropped back. So then we'll, we'll see the them with their pacers behind in what we call the chase groups. Well, Mekkanen, the leader there, let's go back to the Canadian women's uh, camera bike. And this is Pitoreski, just around about, uh, what do we think, about 20 seconds behind, 33.59 is her checkpoint. So she's operating just inside 224 pace at the moment. That's uh, extravagant, isn't it? That's, that's a pretty fast pace. Um, yeah, still, not sure yet where um, she is in relation to Melindy Elmore, if she's just ahead or behind. So that's us checked in at 10 kilometers for all four of the medal championship categories. Let's go down to roadside and our reporter, Laura De Silva is with some of the competitors a bit further back down the course. shop on Bloor. Lynn, you are literally getting everyone here to dance in the streets. I love it. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on here? Absolutely. Uh, Toronto Marathon, uh, Waterfront Marathon. We haven't had one in three years. People are super excited. There's a cheer competition going on in the city today. 22 cheer seats around the city. Everyone has an opportunity to win up to $3,000 that they can put towards a charity of their choice. So, yeah, it's all about giving back. So tell us about how the runner shop is giving back. Well, the runner's shop, I mean, we welcome so many people into our store every day. We're all about running. We're excited about running. We just want to really uh, make people uh, believe that they can do it. It's a great thing running a marathon, a half marathon, a huge uh, accomplishment. And we just want to make sure that we're out here today supporting them and doing that. Okay, I think we should get back to the important stuff. The dancing. Yes, all right. Okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's get back there. <laughs> well, it's 
a nice party down there on the streets. We're just checking back in with the elite women because we think that somewhere between this group and Dana Pidoretsky, who's got her own camera, is Melindy Elmore. She may be in no woman's land. She went through in 33.59 at 10K, so she wasn't on the back of this group. But let's see, as we pan round on that turn, if we can spot Melindy Elmore in that chase group. I see, yeah. It's Kevin Coffey that you can see because he's got the orange, orange singlet. yes. So they're just around that curve. So still running very, very well and not isolated. So we've essentially got, uh, uh, well, three duels going on in the women's race. There's this battle for the elites, which Mekinen of Ethiopia is leading at the moment. Now, that camera bike there is just going to slow down and pick up on Melindy Elmore a little bit further back down the road. So we've got six, is it six or seven elite women in there contesting for the overall title? And the Canadian battle is an interesting one because they've both gone out really quickly. But I think Pedereski can probably see Elmore, can't she? Right, I think they went out a little bit fast on that first 5K and they've settled back into, into a different pace. Galetta Berka there in the middle in the blue arm warmers and the blue singlet. She was the athlete we mentioned earlier that was due to run in the Montreal Marathon back in May and unfortunately got her visa but didn't get her passport back. This is her first race since and she's got a, a real point to prove. Something of the Grace Jones about her, isn't there, with those reflector shades and that uh, fixed gaze, absolutely emotionless in the middle of that group. Herper with the white uh, hat on for Ethiopia. So at the moment it is Ethiopia one, two and three and Kenya uh, four, five, and six in that leading group. But a lot of action still to take place. 40 minutes into a race, which we hope will be somewhere around 221. And Mekinen lunges for the plain water, doesn't like it, drops the cup. <laughs> well, sometimes there might be um, a, a sport drink or water available. Okay, so see, that would be the... the so the, the volunteers will be saying if they have a sport drink or water, so maybe she grabbed the one that she didn't want. It's very difficult to drink out of a cup as well. It goes up your nose, <laughs> in your ears, everywhere but your For mouth, sure. doesn't it? Right, we have caught up with the Melindy Elmore story. Let's cut across to that. Uh, our camera bike, there she is. Lots and lots of company. It's like Madonna, uh -huh. isn't it, with a, with a security <laughs> detail around her. But running well at that's, the moment. That's Paddy Birch that's on the right. He's, um, he's a runner from Toronto. That's my other coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, bar buddy. Now, this lady here, uh, Branna, is running the half marathon with the bike back number. So Elmore takes her drink on board. If she looks up ahead, I think, what is it, about 12 seconds up the road is Pitoreski. Well, no, sorry, 12 seconds back down right. the road is Pitoreski that can see her up ahead. Right, it's about maybe 23 seconds that okay. Melindy has on her. But they're both in company, and that will continue for a while. The black back numbers are those running the full marathon distance. The half marathon runners will peel off in around about 25 minutes or so from now. The back road's yellow shirt. That's a group from London, I believe, doing the half marathon. Beside Melindy is a uh, local Marco Lee, training partner with, uh, with a number of the elite women, uh, especially with Lindsay Tessier. Good friend of mine, too. It's, isn't it strange how they cluster around the leading uh, leading contenders? So uh, we're going to go back to just uh, check in with the two Canadian men. There's Hofbauer at the front in the red, white, and blue. And we heard from the defending champion earlier in the week. Let's see what he had to say. I'm Trevor Hofbauer. I'm running the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to Sunday. Uh, it's been electric this last year with the introduction of events again. Uh, just having raced all spring and even a little bit this summer, just seems like a lot of pent up energy at the start line and even crowd support. It's very energetic out there. Quite a bit has changed over the last few years. I went to the Olympics, which was great. And I also moved my home from Calgary to Kelowna and now go to school. I'm studying psychology and I'll transition into education at some point. Um, I've changed my coach, I've tra changed my training club, so I've kind of restructured my whole life. I really enjoy the atmosphere in Toronto out here. I enjoy being close to home. I have family in Michigan as well that I have an opportunity to see when I'm out here too. So the organization of this race is world class. I'm hoping to work as much as I can with Rory. Uh, he's made a lot of progress over the last few years and especially for him coming off of Worlds, I know that he's in a good 
place with his training and I feel like I'm in a very similar spot. So I hope to work with him as much as possible and just keep each other engaged throughout the race. And then uh, once it gets towards the end, see if we can make some moves and go from there. But I think if we can both uplift each other, that's best case scenario. And we're live with Hofbauer at the head of the Canadian elite field. It's really just him and Linkletter in that group. They're the black back numbers going the full marathon distance. There's his credentials. I think he, I, I know this is a historic reference. He looks a little bit like Craig Mottram of Australia, who was always a big, powerful 1500 meter runner, got a similar raking stride there. But having said that he was gonna work together with Linkletter and we saw them shoulder to shoulder on the start line, they've not even been within talking distance of each other for the whole race, have they? No. I all of Rory's just taking it back. Maybe maybe they might be alternating. One person uses the front, one person <laughs> uses the back. I'm not sure. Uh, but they did make an agreement that they're going to make it to 30, 32. Somebody's broken it. Somebody has broken the pact. <laughs> this friendship is over. Trevor had a really good race earlier this year when he did the Boston Marathon. Um, he was 15th overall and ran 210.52. And I believe that's the fastest a Canadian has run in Boston. Uh, he had a, a not a not a great experience at the Olympics. It was a, it was difficult for him, and he's certainly hoping to make it back on that team for Paris in, in 24. He's gone back to school um, for psychology, like he said in the yeah. little video, and he wants to be a teacher. And he, after this, he's going to compete in the Can West and U Sports Championships. So he's actually coached by Melinda Elmore, who coaches with um, the cross country team, the Okanagan um, UBC. So uh, that's that's really interesting. Uh, that you know they're they're teammates in that sense and and also um he's being coached by her as a team member and he's also doing some coaching i think himself with the mile to marathon group that is uh, dylan wakes well every time we've checked in with them uh, barring once it has been hofbauer in front and link letter just keeping his bdi in those uh, <laughs> welding goggle shades on him from uh, four or five strides back it's a big big drop back to the next chasing group so you'd have to say we're not even at the halfway point, but the battle for Canadian honours is as anticipated. The duel between Trevor Hofbauer in the red, white and blue and Rory Linkletter just uh, drifting back a little bit in that group. I wonder if he's going through a bad patch. He's this is our heartbreak hill. Yeah. So it looks like the Canadian men um, are on 2.10.10 pace. And this is a nice beauty shot. That's Lake Ontario. Even we learned that in uh, high school geography. Some men have every opportunity. SMHEO, Superior Michigan, Hi Huron, Erie, Ontario. And that's it there. <laughs> Beautiful skyline. They're running right alongside the water's edge. It, it's developing uh, very quickly, I noticed, that waterfront area. Yeah, uh, our Ontario place has been um, kind of our staple for our, our downtown Lakeshore area. So that's the live split, or that's the live picture of the elite men. They went through in 44.29 at 15K, and my goodness, they're back on 2.04 schedule. That's why they're strung out. It's been a little bit um, variable, the pace, but it's brought them now, at this point on the course, Chris, inside the all-comers Canadian record. We, yeah, we are approaching the Maryland Bell Park. Um, it, this is fast. This is really, really fast, um, but it, good for the area that they are in. This should be a tough area for them to work through, but it doesn't seem to be affecting them. Well, hopefully the pacemakers will be there to at least the halfway point, which is still around about 15, 16 minutes away. You can see that one or two of the coaches and the managers have managed to get, I think that's an e-bike, isn't it there? So that's cheating slightly. Just to give advice and guidance at the back of the group, it's one of the Ethiopians who's in a bit of bother. The, the pacers actually seem to be working harder than the, than the leads. Well, their job may almost be done. You can see the contraflow there with the, uh, how far into it are they on the other side of the carriageway there? It, it, it's a relatively early stage of the marathon, but lots of applause filming them from the other side of the road as well. That's a nice lift for the runners on this downhill sweep. It's a really fun part of the course because this is where everyone comes together, right? How many professional sports do you know where yeah. you've got um, recreational runners just kind of checking a box and running a marathon for fun, and then you've got the, you know, the world's best that do it professionally as an income. 
Well, everybody's still in there that we expected to challenge, notwithstanding that we have no defending champion. Uh, today's color is white and black. <laughs> Everybody got the memo on the uniform. Uh, we go back to our drone shot overhead, looking at the runners in both sides of the carriageway, the elites with the police outriders flashing on the left-hand side of the carriageway and the mid-packers, including the half-marathon runners, on their outward journey towards the uh, furthest point of the course. It's a beautiful city. It's a very fast-growing city. I've noticed that in the time I've been coming here. Yeah, this area, especially the waterfront, um, was supposed to sort of be demolished or left as is, and the city kind of let this, the people take it over. Yeah. So if you go through Ontario Place, what used to be a theme park is now a running path, a band shell. They'll have music festivals, uh, rap concerts. I just went to a rap concert there. Um, it's it's actually really really nice in the city just kind of worked around what the people were doing yes so uh kudos to to the city for letting us do that yes it's beautiful it's a, the furthest range of any of my runs from downtown has been to ontario place and it is a nice part of town that's a completely separate city in the background there isn't it is it mississauga that, that's what, what's the name that goes as far as mississauga um and actually if you look to the left you could see as far as hamilton on good days right um yeah if it's a, it's a different area code we kind of allow them into our city. <laughs> <laughs> so picture in picture, there are the men in white and black predominantly. The pacemaker's still doing a great job. Um, we're coming up to 49 minutes into this elite men's uh, countdown. We're hoping for the fastest time ever seen in Canada. They would have to have something with 2.04 at least to break the currently round course record and all comers record of 2.05 for Philemon Kogo. This must be a great feeling for Tristan Woodfine to just chase this. Yeah. And then knowing he's going to be cutting off. Yes, if you're just joining us, welcome along. This is uh, the live coverage of the 2022 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. But it does include a half marathon. And the half marathon runner, runner with the white back number is on the uh, back of that group, Tristan Woodfine. Just getting a tow by some of the, from some of the world's best. And back with the elite women a little bit further back down the course. Still Mekkanen leading. Now I'm just checking the defending champion, Mags Masai. Yeah, she's at the back there in the red with the arm warmers. Now a mother of one since she won here and set the uh, Canadian all-comers record. You can see with the pink arm warmers. Is she going to lunge for her drink? They need to try and stay in formation, but also grab the right bottle. Once again, it has disrupted. Masai, though, in defense of her title, still there in fourth place. And this is what she had to say earlier in the week about defending her Toronto Waterfront Marathon title. My name is Magdalene Masai, and I'm doing Toronto Waterfront Marathon. I'm, like, too excited to be racing again. It's been a long time since 2019 I haven't done any race. So I was, I'm looking forward to doing this race again. I've just been... Uh, I've been being a mom for some time and then I restarted training at the end of this January again and then I've been doing all that just training and then now I'm ready to race. So I have to balance between being a good mom and being an athlete. It's been tough but I'm going through it but I'm handling it well. It really makes you patient because you have to be very patient with what they do and then if you put that into running, running also requires patience. Because if you make a move earlier, if you're not patient, then you can pay it later. It's just the whole, like, the, the whole city mood during the race. Like, you can just hear people from all over the place just cheering you. Like, you can just go even when you're starting to feel tired. Just the energy. There's so much positive around, energy around the whole course. And the organization too, it is like, it's perfect. I couldn't ask for a better marathon than this. Well, she's very welcome back in the city that made her reputation. There we are live with Magdalene Mags Masai. Uh, but if we draw back, we'll see that she's a little bit uncomfortable at the back of that group of, was it four or five 
leading women and the gaps just starting to open up a little bit. We should talk a little bit about uh, Masai's family story. She's married to Jake Robertson, one of the famous uh, New Zealand twins who settled in Kenya. And they have a son, Jake Jr., born uh, just a year ago. And her sister is Lynette Masai, who's one of the greats of Kenyan women's distance running. And her husband, Jake, ran in the TCS Amsterdam Marathon earlier today. There's the women's split on the top right-hand corner of the screen, 50.07 at uh, 15K. So they're operating just on 2.21 pace. So once again, inside Canadian all-comers record schedule. At the moment, she looks all right, Krista, but she's just sitting back a little bit in that single file. Well, I think it's interesting how she talked about having patience and, and maybe she knows exactly what she's doing because she said if you go too early, you might regret it later. Um, like you said, she's got um, some family members who are quite speedy when in the 10,000, her, her sister as well as a brother Moses who was fourth at the Beijing Olympics and uh, her brother Dennis who won the 2010 World Junior in Moncton, New Brunswick actually. Uh, she was to do Boston in 2020, but we know that that didn't happen. And I, I think she's probably really ready to have a good race today, kind of holding her breath and not having raced for, for so long. Our final 15K split is coming up, and it's with the Kenyan Elite Women's, 51.03. That's just under 2.24 pace, and that's Melindy Elmore in the center there in the red, white, and blue. Just checking, there's one other elite Kenyan woman I can see over on the right-hand side there. Otherwise, she's just a little bit ahead of Pitoreski, but I'm just looking to see what that gap is. Right, that is quite the large group that's with Melindy, and if a lot of them are wearing the, the marathon bibs, so that would be a huge advantage to her if she had that group of people around her just sheltering her from the, the little bit of wind that might be out there today and get into a, a, a rhythm, just maybe not even looking at her watch, just trusting what her pacers are doing ahead of her. You must have had this happen where just purely by coincidence, all these men cluster around you, they've seen the camera bike, and they just happen to be running around you for the whole race. Does it get on your nerves? Do you want to whack them? <laughs> well, I think it kind of depends. If they give you room and you're able to go over and get your bottle, I think it's okay. Um, but if they're a little bit, you know, ignorant and not really knowing what's going on around them, certainly it could be a, a huge nuisance. But that's something that the Pacers can do as well, just kind of, kind of wave them away to just kind of not cause any collision between them. So going well at the moment, Melindy Elmore, she was probably the favorite for the Canadian title and she's living up to that billing on 55 minutes. But let's go across and hear from one of the most famous brand names in uh, road running from Garmin. Why do we run? Do our bodies just feel better in motion? Do we run to compete against ourselves? or to be part of a community of lunatics? Why do we lace up our shoes and find a road, a track, a trail? Whatever the reason, forerunner for runners. This is the front of the field. This is the elite men's field at the head of the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon coming up to the one hour point. That will be the minimum requirement for these two pacemakers. They're not looking back that much. They're just doing their own thing. But if they did look back, they would see that it's uh, in an alarmingly single file format, which means that uh, one or two people are feeling this a little bit. Uh, what happens is they don't break away, but uh, the odd athlete will start to drift off the back. And you can see that Ethiopian uh, competitor in the colors of NN running at the back of the group. He's been toiling there for a little while now. Yeah, here we are. We're actually heading down the Gardner uh, into Lakeshore again. Um, it's about to get really loud. Uh, there are a lot of cheer groups under here, but it echoes. We, we are never allowed to run on this, so this is kind of a rare thing and a beautiful thing to see. And the course has to accommodate changes most years because of the developments that are going on. Um, that overhead is it, is it that overhead carriageway that's being removed completely at some point? In Toronto, we have uh, three seasons, fall, uh, summer, winter, and construction. <laughs> so, yeah, the gardener will always fall apart and always be repaired. So we always divert. And, you know, everyone chooses to drive, but we have public transit, public, public transit, bikes, everything. So we're always congested with 
people driving, bumping into each other. So yeah. this is a rare thing to see, and this is why the city comes together when we have open streets like yeah, this. Yeah, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. It's uh, uh, people power and running power. So if we name check uh, who's in that leading group, the uh, honor of bib number one, he's right in the center of that group, is Barcelius Kipiego. He's the man that's run faster than the course record. They're all running faster than the course record, but he's actually done it previously. He's got a lifetime best of 204.48, and he's in town. We caught up with him earlier to talk about his prospects. My name is Barcelius Kipiego. I'm running Waterprone Toronto Marathon. I thank uh, the sponsors for Toronto Marathon first, and I am coming for Toronto to to improve my personal best. Me, to me, I like uh, listening to music and some food, <laughs> which I like in Toronto. There is good food which we used to like. Now I was coming from lunch, so it is delicious food. It's very nice food. Everything is very good here. When pandemic COVID-19 started, I started to train at home and looking after my children and cows, my farm. When I started, you know, last year, I, in last season I started, I went to Ambak Marathon. I did not finish because of uh, I fall down on the road. But today, I'm trying to improve today because I have to I have run 204.48. So now on Sunday, we might have a new BB. So I'm happy because uh, Toronto is a good marathon. I hope if I do good in, on Sunday, I might be chosen to go to major areas like Boston. And there he is in the center of the shot there. Keep Diego on his vest with the uh Hat on still, great cheering. That's his biography on the left-hand side of the show. I think he was giving props there to Canadian food, wasn't he, at an early stage of that uh, interview? He did, He's, he really enjoys the food over here. And he uh, runs the Hamburg Marathon, so big up for Hamburgers and Hamburg. And Kip Yeago directly behind the pacemakers. You'd ideally want to be tucked in a little bit closer to them to get the full benefit of the draft there. Yeah, and there's a slight incline. They're going up Bay Street to turn on the front. Uh, it's a little bit of a tricky street because, again, like I said, the city's full of construction. <laughs> Be aware of where you're stepping. So hopefully, hopefully it's smooth for them. Nice and echoey down there. Is that near? Um, is that near the railway station in the background? Is that the where I went to see the um, uh, Leafs play on Friday night? That is definitely where you saw it at the Rogers Center, yeah. where you probably saw the Wu Tang Clan and Kendrick Lamar <laughs> and Post Malone. And, and there was an appearance from, um, who's that uh, big, bold, uh, meathead action man that's got a new film out that's from Toronto? Uh, Very famous. The most famous Dolph Lundgren character of them all. I shouldn't have introduced it without having his name to hand. We'll get back to you on that one. But he was, he was at the Leafs game giving out free tickets. The Rock. Oh, The Rock. Oh, he's, Dwayne, not, he's not ours, but we'll claim it. Right. Well, he started doing a chant for the Leafs, and it was wrong. Oh, he was here, actually. Sorry, take that back. He's, he's ours. From, from Toronto, yeah. He's ours now. Dw Dwayne The Rock Johnson was in, t in that building we've just gone under. That's the uh, main railway station on the left-hand side. Magnificent structure. This is as far as you can have a main road. This is one of the main cross streets, isn't it, in the center of Toronto? Yeah, we're passing the Sony Center here, and then the Hockey Hall of Fame. Hockey's our, our, our big sport. Um, yeah, and then we're about to approach the St. Lawrence Market. This is a little good stretch of Front Street. Uh, the gloves are off, literally, being careful where you throw them, mate. Gloves can be a trip hazard, but uh, they're off physically. Are they off metaphorically? Yeah, look at him surge for his drinks bottle. The pacemakers may only have a minute or two to go in this race if they're going to halfway. It's the center of town, so they're only about, uh, as the crow flies, what, a mile from the start-finish line here? Not far for the pacemakers to go back if they do drop out at this point yeah that's just about a mile uh, they're they're about to reach st. Lawrence Market which is actually another beautiful place we had that's uh, being renovated if you're still in town check that one out well once again that uh, refreshment station as it often does has really split the group up a little bit they were more tightly clustered than this and suddenly there's uh, two or three strides between them 
running two abreast down the road here. The time we're looking for at halfway to be on schedule for the course record would be 62 and a half. It's a 205 course record. Candy is the one that's gone closest to the pacemakers, but at some point they're going to step off and he'll be on his own. And this will be Candy's second uh, drawn waterfront marathon. So he should know the course. He, he was aware that we were turning off up Bay Street and then avoiding a little bit of the waterfront on the way back. So I think he's able to avoid the wind a little better too. Well, Candy was the man that was watching in Kenya for our uh, live stream to, uh, in 2019 and saw how quick it was and decided there and then that he wanted to run Toronto again, having finished third previously. And he's back at the first available opportunity and he's leading and suddenly it's gone single file. This is a key point in the race. And they have gone by the halfway point, 21.1 kilometers, and they were on pace for a 204.53. Okay, there it is, confirmed. The record split and the 21.1 kilometer split. The difference, of course, in the second half will be they won't have the advantage of those pacemakers guiding them around. Let's go back to the Canadian men because there's things happening there. Suddenly that big group is down to the two main contenders. They're still not running shoulder to shoulder. Hofbauer giving himself a good side of his drink if he wants to take it. Linkletter grabs his or grabs at something, takes it. Hofbauer gets his. That was a group of, what, 10 or 12 men last time we checked in, and suddenly we're down to these two. Is that because the half marathons have diverted? Yeah, the half has, uh, has dropped off the about two mile or one mile back, uh, and this is probably very good for Trevor. I'm not sure about Rory, but they are a pack still. Well, for, t for two men that said they were going to work together, <laughs> they haven't even been able to <laughs> call out to each other. But it's, it's always been in this order, hasn't it? Hofbauer just leading the issue. Linkletter, who seems distracted by something going on over on the sidewalk there. Was it somebody he knew? <laughs> it just could be the crowd. The crowd is really crazy this time. I, I honestly haven't seen, seen the city this nuts. Well, we're looking for a halfway split for this uh, battle for the Canadian honours. That's the biggest gap we've seen for a, a while. It's a couple of seconds now between Hofbauer and Linkletter. And is Linkletter struggling? There's the chip timing, Matt. So we'll bring you that split. Unofficially, it looked like it was about 64-54 for halfway, in which case they're going pretty well, Krista. Right, for sure. And I think, Chris, you may know this, that the, the man between them, is that Sergio... Um, Valenuva. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Is he a known a known local runner? I I can't tell. I I haven't seen him before, but so that may have been the 20 kilometer split. Either way, it was a timing mat that they went over, and. It, Okay, here comes the official split. Uh, oh. And Trevor's <laughs> high-fiving everyone. This is his <laughs> course. This is how he loves it. But he's running a few yards extra just to go and give a kid a hand rattle. He might have more energy doing that. So Rory and Trevor went through in 104.54, which gets them a 209.47. So they're consistent, I think, with what they were hoping to do today, be under the 210 mark. Trevor Hofbauer, uh, in a previous edition of this race, I think in 2018 or earlier, did uh, a hand rattle in the closing stages and it cost him a time bonus and he has no regrets at all no regrets that is true and i did ask him about that yeah about that yesterday and he still doesn't regret it no and actually what a bunch of his friends did was they started a gofundme <laughs> to to have people donate money kind of saying good for you and i believe he ended up making um the same amount as the prize money if not more well, Doug Ford is the premier of this part of the world, and he has some words of welcome for the guest runners who've assembled here in Toronto. Friends, it's my pleasure to welcome you all back to the annual Toronto Waterfront Marathon. The last few years have been challenging, and sacrifices had to be made in so many areas of our lives, including participating in events like this. That's why I'm so excited for all the runners 
who are ready to bring back the enthusiasm we all love to see at these races. The funds raised here will be life-changing to so many, and I want to thank the organizers and the sponsors for putting together this incredible event for Toronto. I wish everyone participating the best of luck and hope this is the greatest marathon yet. We're live on the streets of Toronto with the 2022 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon and live in vision now is the leading Canadian, Melindy Elmore, but she's not uh, a clear leader in this event. The challenge is from Dana Piderewski, the uh, Olympian. They were both in the Tokyo Olympic Games. It was a rather more pleasant experience for Melindy Elmore. Right, Melindy Elmore had an amazing race uh, in Sapporo when they participated in the Olympics that was postponed by a year. She was ninth overall, which is just phenomenal. And her personal best is a 224.50 from the Houston Marathon in uh, 2020. She was supposed to do this race in 2019, but had a little injury that she recovered from and refocused and did that. So she is uh, a two-time Olympian now. She's just got an incredible story. She ran in 2004 in the 1500 meter on the track. So much shorter than what she's doing today. Um, she didn't make uh, the, the following two Olympics after that, which was a heartbreaker, just missing it by a second, I believe, each time. So she retired from the track not knowing that um, what the future would hold. She got into doing Ironman events, yeah. had two kids, and then decided to step down to the marathon. So I knew that she would be, uh, you know, an incredible runner um, with the speed that she has from the track and then having that long Ironman event that she trained for. So here she is today. Her record was beat by Natasha Wodak just a few weeks ago in Berlin when she ran 2.23.12. And Melindy says she's not one to chase time. She's not necessarily going for that. Uh, she just wants to have a good race and, and a solid performance that will hopefully take her back to a third Olympics uh, in Paris in 24. Coached by her husband, Graham Hood, who was one of the uh, leading uh, Canadian middle distance uh, runners for, for many years. Right, and I think a joke in the family is that he placed ninth as well, so uh, <laughs> they're kind of tied. Uh, and, and her son is here today, just one of her two sons, I believe, so that was kind of special for her um, to, to bring him along. I don't think he's traveled to a race with her before, obviously. With, with the pandemic, no one was able to, to travel to Tokyo, but he is with her today, and that's a special thing. Let's just see if we can cut back to the elite women's uh, camera. Uh, now, that group has whittled down because of a drink station. You can see the bottle is being uh, handed around there, but suddenly we're down to four, and it was the drink station that did it where there were some late lunges from the opposite side of the carriageway to go and get drinks bottles. And you can see, it, as part of all that, Mags Masai, the defending champion, is almost out of shot there in the uh, red with the pink sleeves. So the defense of her title is in real difficulty, but we've got Herpa, Chepitok, Mekanin, and Burka. So three for Ethiopia and one for Kenya in that leading group, but it looks as though Mags Masai's defense, her first race since becoming a mother, her first race since winning here in 2019, is going through a really difficult spell. And we should be on a halfway split coming up for these elite women in the next couple of minutes. Chebitok looking very comfortable. I will share the story where I was priming her for the press conference. She was. Um, making out like her English wasn't very good and I had to write down some questions and we practiced the answers and it was a struggle and then after it was all over um, she came over to me and in very good English pointed out that I was factually incorrect in one of the questions that I'd written down <laughs> so I think she's she's all there you know she's all there she just uh so this group of women in the front have gone through the halfway in 110.01 so that puts them at about 2.20 wow. to wow. be finishing uh, wow. this race today so that's definitely um, well within the, the record and um, the four of them are still running quite, quite strong together and, and the two others that were with that group have um, fallen behind a bit I think we can say that one of the stories of this race is going to be the depth and certainly the speed of the women's winning time because those men are likely going to stay there for almost the whole of the race. So we're not going to um, have too, too much uh, drop off in the pacemaking effort. Herpa's there in second place, just taking on an energy gel. Let's have a look at her stats on the left hand side. She's got some longevity, former world youth champion, which would be in her teens, but she's turned to the marathon early and with great effect. 
2.21.32, but she's got a real race on her hands because there's four of them still in contention and we're running at 2.20 pace, super quick. That is uh, fast, but you know, these are ideal conditions today and a lot of the African runners go by feel. I know Ma Megs was saying in an interview that um, she doesn't set out with a certain goal mileage that she's gonna do, but at the end of the week, she kind of calculates what she does. And um, you know, a lot of them will, will, you know, not just be looking at their watches, but going by how their body feels. And it certainly helps when you've got others around you um, at this point in the late, in the, in the race, you know, you want them as long as you can, and then it's it's um, for any person at the end to battle it out. And we go back to the Canadian women's battle. And it's Melindy Elmore leading, and it's 71.39 at halfway. So once again, inside, inside Canadian record schedule, but only just, Krista. Well, it looks like 2.23.17, so I guess it's about five seconds off of, of Natasha's record um, that she got. And Natasha and Melindy have been running, um, you know, together for years. Uh, they're about the same age, both from BC. They trained together for the Olympics in Tokyo. They would kind of take turns in terms of where they were meeting to do their workouts. Um, Melindy coached by her husband Graham and um, Natasha coached by Trent Stellenworth. So the, the, the whole crew would go out together and they were really diligent to work on their fueling and hydrating, knowing that it would be um, really hot in, in Sapporo. So, um, you know, it, Natasha said in her interviews that that's exactly what you want. You want them to be, you know, working together and also battling for these records against each other because that's what, what keeps you striving with, with the bar being set higher and higher, knowing that, um, you know, that her record could go down today and, you know, Natasha would fight back for it again. Still a fair way to go, but just beyond the halfway point, look at that. What a beautiful shot. People power, pedestrian power. There are runners covering most of the kilometers from uh, beyond halfway, almost all the way back to the start, Chris. I think what's great about this course is uh, in, in, in the waterfront, um, as we were, we were seeing earlier, the elites, when they were running by the general public, uh, I remember my first marathon, which was this race, uh, and seeing the elites come by, it was the first time in real life I'd actually seen fast runners and fast athletes. And it, it's such a beautiful course for this. And you're just, and then you look at the time later and you realize, okay, they finished in half the time I've been out here for. So yeah, this is just such a great race for people to connect with the professional sport. Well, some of those runners will be out there for many more hours, but we're going back down to the uh, incredibly named Black Toe Running Store, and we will join our roving reporter, Laura De Silva, who's down at the roadside. All right, we're here outside Black Toe Running. I'm here with Mike, he's one of the co-owners. Mike, why did you want to get involved with the marathon this year? Uh, we get involved every year. This year was particularly important because it's been a couple of years since we've had a big one in Toronto. Just wanted to show as much support for everybody out there as we possibly could and have some fun. Awesome. And who's making up this fun squad today? That's our thing. Fun squad has been around for a long time, but we decided to come out in force and really do something at the race here. Just have some fun with everybody and, you know, running is not supposed to be fun, so why not? All right, I'm going to become an honorary member. Is that okay? Absolutely. We have extra t-shirts. All right. So. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Well, the lead men at the front of the field have gone through 25 kilometers. That latest split time, 60, 74, 28. So still on inside course record schedule. The key to this, well, I'm looking at it and I think the pacemakers have gone. So now the racing is on in earnest. Felix Candy closest to us. Possibly the favorite, but look at that. That is a big field still in contention. Kibitok at the back there, who we heard from a little bit earlier on. It's good news for a quick time that there are so many still in contention. We've got less than 50 minutes to run now for the elite men. See Kip Kenboy there with a bit of spittle around his chin, working very, very hard. Kibitok keeping that uh, those long Audrey Hepburn gloves on and his uh, beanie hat as well. Do we call him a beanie? We've had this before, haven't we? we? I think we go with toque. Toque. It's a beanie. It's more Canadian. <laughs> oh, look at this. Is Trevor Hoffbauer going away here. 
that's now that two second gap is suddenly up to four or five seconds and you can see link letter's shoulders are rolling a little bit as he tries to uh, close the gap trevor i mean right here i think he you can tell he he's run this before and this is the bayview extension so it's a little off it kind of throws you off because of the twists and turns and it's kind of it's a little dead out there and this might have affected rory because he did not see this coming and trevor did and the person that was between them, who's who's now back in the black, yeah, yeah. that's Mohamed Agab, and he's from uh, New Brunswick. He's coached by John LaFranco. So uh, w I was wrong about who that was before, but it's good to see um, him, you know, behind there, who would be contending for the bronze medal for this Canadian championship. Well, that at the moment, there's a fair way to go, but that is the Canadian podium we're looking at at the moment. Hofbauer is not looking back, is he? There's no. Um there's no check over his shoulder. He's just uh, pressing on behind the pacemaker and letting Linkletter do the worrying now. And it will be a slight worry for Linkletter because this is not a comfortable position to be in, two or three seconds behind, is it? Well, and it's always interesting when we're looking at the screen here because we don't really know how close he is. Um, but, you know, he's definitely within within reach, right? Um, I think that he, he won't let Trevor get too far, but there does come that point where you, they, they do feel a bit out of reach, and that's where mentally you can start to struggle a bit. Grabs for his drink bottle. They're all taking uh, fluid on board at every station. The split for this is around about, would it be a high 208, low 209, I think, projecting forward from that, so. It's showing to be about 210.15, so it looks like they went through 25K in 117.10. Hofbauer still riffing with the crowd a little bit, waggling his drink spot, let them there. At least he's grabbing his drinks. Last year he missed it. Yeah. But we are still in the 20s, and the agreed plan between the two of the of these guys was to to stick to about 30k, and then a supposed dogfight, <laughs> which well, Trevor didn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> it, as a plan, it's one of the worst plans I've ever seen because they haven't run together for any step of the race once the gun went, have they? And it, and it looks as though this could be a long run for home for Trevor Hofbauer and he's done it before so he knows where he's at and he knows he can do it and Trevor says um, I'm looking at my words here because it's interesting he said that he can visualize the entire course here yeah. in Toronto that's uh, that's really something but Rory you know he's gonna want to go under 210 Trevor has gone under 210 before Rory just had his personal best time at the World Championships earlier this year of 210 24 so um, even if he can just get under that I'm sure he would be you know thrilled with that performance today well so he ran a bit of a tangent there Laurie Linkletter to take a, a second or so off it let's check in just at the head of the elite men's field back with them because the pacemakers have or have they gone maybe they were just out of shot last time we looked let's see what those what's on the bibs of those two leaders I think they may have stayed in so they're doing a good work if that is still the two pacemakers in front way beyond the call of duty yes it is right so and last time we saw them they were just left of the shot you know there's been a, a lot of different discussions about the pacemakers and what their duty is and disagreement about whether a pacemaker should be able to finish the race so um you know in the past it has been allowed that they can finish the race if they're feeling good um maybe in other um, situations they they aren't allowed to but it's interesting to see interesting to see that person on the bike over there on the on the far side an e-bike as we've noted yeah because that is not allowed as far as i understand to have someone along there i'm not sure which group he's with he's with the last place runner there in the in the orange shorts yeah okay yeah i don't know we see a lot of it i mean if you if you watch the berlin marathon there was uh, it's a feature of that that there are uh, supporters and outriders so right and oh, the sound of disco chris will know <laughs> what this is the, uh. and the, pa the pacemakers are also you know up and coming runners themselves so this is a good opportunity yeah. for them to make um an, uh, some money as they are hoping to be the ones that are getting paced down the road yes just looking at um, the half marathon results have come in and Tristan Woodfine was the first man with a time of 102.43 and Brianna McDougall, there was one clip that we saw of her there. Um, she ran uh, a time of 113.35 for our first female in the half marathon race. Wow. 
I always think that bodes well, that if the earliest times that are clocked are quick, that will tend to percolate right the way down through the field in both events. So if it's a good day for our elite half marathon runners, it'll be a good day for everybody out on the uh, full course. OK, let's cut away from these uh, elite men and we'll go back to Melindy Elmore. You can see on the Contraflow, the uh, elite women just on the return run ahead of her, but she's having a good day at the moment, Krista. Yes, I mean, Melindy is is a, a wise person, right? She's she's 42 years old, she's not young and new at it. Now let's go back, um, just to, for our director, let's go back to Canadian men. Canadian men, because there's been a turnaround here, and it is Linkletter okay. who's gone in front, has uh, Trevor Hoffbauer, hit a bit of a bad patch. He was goofing with the crowd. He's holding his chest. A bit of stitch maybe, but certainly that, which looked like a long run for home, is suddenly looking like a bit of a tense period now for Trevor Hoffbauer, the defending champion. And Linkletter is revived. This could be the supposed dog fight. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I guess I still look at this and say, we're still early in the race. I mean, certainly it could have a, a, a mental benefit for Rory to pull ahead and Trevor might be thinking, oh, I'm not quite feeling it, but I, I still think it's pretty early to be making any, making any predictions. Well, there's the city center in the background dominated by the CN Tower. Those of you watching that are thinking about coming here next year, do it, put Toronto on your bucket list, put the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon on your bucket list and experience this fair city the way these two guys are. But it has been transformed in the last kilometer because Linkletter looked like he was going out the back door. He was a bit ragged. His uh, shoulders were rocking. And suddenly the head is up. He's using the pacemaker. And Hofbauer's really got to hang on here. Yes, this is where you definitely want not want to be losing contact with um, <laughs> the person that you're competing against for the national title. But. Um, yeah, like I said, I still think it's a bit early. They're still supposed to be working together. I, <laughs> they kind of remind me of a buddy cop movie where Rory's the cop and Trevor's the buddy. <laughs> okay, Trevor's catching up. I, th I think they're, they're still working together. He's <laughs> still working they're together. They're still friends. But not. It's, it's still <laughs> friends. They didn't unfollow each other on <laughs> social media. <laughs> They're still good. It's not a dogfight. It's a working together situation. I'm Hofbauer hoping. has revived. It's a good recovery. The best since Lazarus for Hofbauer there. <laughs> As he draws alongside, just to let Link let her know. I'm no. not to be forgotten. There yeah. he is. Shoulder Remember to me? shoulder. That's perfect. And, you know, so yeah, Rory's looked <laughs> over like, oh, you're back. But, yeah. you know, if they both want to go under 210, this is still what you want at this point in the race. It's it's still too early um, to be on your own if, if you've got those specific goals with time because yeah. we're not we're not sure how long the the pacemaker will will stick with this group hashtag working together hashtag dogfight <laughs> you gonna happen there's the elite women and we're still down to three and it looks as though it's the three ethiopians that have now uh, burst away at 25 kilometers it is 83 23 and that is projecting to inside 221 pace so still quick but just drifting a little bit still with the one pacemaker there checking on them to make sure they're still in contention so it looks as though we will have an ethiopian champion but who's your money on oh well i'm going with my it's too early to tell but yeah they're just uh 220 44 um pace at um at the 25k mark i think it is safe to say though that perhaps the mag's record will go down it looks as though Mekinen was taking a good slug of drink there, but in doing so, she's just dropped a second, and now she has to surge, and the marathon is about economy of effort. Those surges will uh, uh, take a toll. Let's go back to Melindy Elmore in the women's e event, if we can. I think that may be, she may be on a more restricted part of the course. Yes, we can see her in vision there. As, as we mentioned earlier, she had a really good experience at the Tokyo Olympic Games, and she's... Uh, an interesting character who's had one of the longest careers you could imagine going back to the Athens Olympics. And we caught up with her earlier in the week. Well, it looks like the pack is, has been working together. And because I, I saw them earlier kind of waving and, and pointing to Melindy um, to kind of step and cut the tangents. I saw Patty yeah, do it yeah. before earlier. I, I just wanted to mention um, Patty Birch in the back. Um, he did his first marathon a few years ago uh, at about over five hours. 
and he is here today like this well she's uh, operating at the moment in on a low uh, 224 pace so 224.05 or something of that kind for Elmore and we go back to the Canadian men and Hofbauer has now stolen a couple of seconds what a weird race it's a bit of a cat and mouse race. Um, I remember once having this with Lanny Marchant at the 10K Championships in Ottawa. So it had definitely a bit of a, a battle in their minds right now between the two of them. But, you know, they're still definitely in this together. Do you think uh, he, he put his hand to his chest, didn't he? Uh, about a kilometre back, Trevor Hofbauer. And it seemed like he was in a lot of discomfort and, and it was going away from him. And suddenly, look at it again just runs as he feels in any given kilometer doesn't he that's all feeling rory was very calculated when he, he told me about his, his strategy he knows where everything is he knows how how the distance is but trevor just goes by feel yeah he's done it before he's doing it again well the, the bad news for link letter is that the next competitor behind and, and if you look back you can see it's way way back so he has to hang on it's his turn to glare at the back of Hofbauer's vest, but that gap now is suddenly back up to three seconds. Pacemaker doing a good job, but they're sitting off him a little bit. We're back on uh, Lakeshore, and, I, I, and when you're coming back the other way, the big thing to see in this race is the CN Tower, because yeah. you always know that's where I have to go. And sometimes <laughs> it feels so far, sometimes it feels close. Yeah. But having lived here, I always know, you know, it's going to be a while before I can eat. <laughs> it, is this the end for Linkletter? Look at that gap. It was three seconds. Now it's up to five. And it, psychologically, and uh, that's what Hofbauer is studying, psychology, that must be a very hard thing to do. Linkletter was getting all the cheers. He could sense that he was getting away. And suddenly the big man's back. And not only that, but he's surging away. Yeah, you know, I'm just uh, with the mindset that anything can happen, right? In those last 7K of the marathon, we know that those are the most difficult. And one could start to just slow down and the other one could catch. And, um, you know, I think we're going to see a great race between them. So it, this makes it exciting to see that this kind of cat and mouse thing going on. Well, speaking of great races, let's go back to the lead women on our third camera because that is suddenly a little bit of daylight that's being opened by Herper, helped by the pacemaker, Mekinen holding on. And Worku, well, she looks impassive, as she has for most of the race in those uh, blue arm warmers and the long socks. But that's a, a big gap. But Herper, actually, facially, looks like she's um, in a bit of discomfort. So she's got a gap, but it's not one that she appears to be able to work on at the moment. Right. There's no significant lead in, in her, her race right now. Um, she's got a personal best of uh, 221 32 from the frankfurt marathon in 2018 and a handful of, of marathons around the 221 223 mark she was a 1500 meter runner and uh, it was actually her her coach who encouraged her to to move to the marathon and it and she was a bit reluctant she didn't really um have that desire to do that but i think that she's glad that she made that decision. She definitely wants a, a personal best here today. And uh, she looks up to Tulu and Debaba um, as, as icons, and she's wanting an Olympic medal someday. Let's go back to Hofbauer, because it, there's developments there in that Canadian men's race. Look at it. The gap, which we were tracking at two or three seconds, uh, is now suddenly up to 10 seconds. And Linkletter has just got a find something here hasn't he to, to draw him back into contention trevor looks really really smooth he he's not even breathing hard he, he's just very relaxed very comfortable he knows what he's doing he's done this before he has it's almost a blueprint of the way that he ran in uh, 2019 let's go back to the elite men where we're due our next intermediate split at 35 kilometers is it just one of the pacemakers left i'm just checking or are they both yeah, one pacemaker, but he's done a superb job. 30 kilometer split, 129.40. And so that's at around about, well, I'm looking at it. They've drifted well outside of 2.05 pace in this last uh, 20 minutes or so. So that's right. where we're at. They're on 2.06.07 pace right yeah. now after that 30k split, which was 129.40.
So it looked certain that the men's uh, all-comers record and the course record was going to be under threat. It could still be because there's uh, enough men there into contention to make it a real strong close out in the race but they've drifted away a little bit between 25k and here are they are they into the wind or uphill slightly chris in this section of it uh i think it's relatively flat but i think they might have if anything maybe some tailwind because they're going out they're going out east well we haven't seen anybody put in a significant surge what we have seen is the uh, final one of the Ethiopians, the one in the NN running uh, singlet, who's just drifted out the back of that group. So our new champion is going to come from these five. And the thing that I've seen before is a pacemaker that does this work, goes beyond uh, where he was due to, sometimes decides he's feeling good enough to carry on, but not this one. He waves them by, oh, his is. job oh, is done. done. He did look in good, good form, but that was obviously his final word on the matter. He stopped his watch. <laughs> <laughs> if it didn't happen on Strava, it doesn't count. Well, and if anybody's challenging that he didn't do it at the right pace, there it is. Check the watch, check Strava, check Garmin. So let's go back with Hofbauer, just see how that gap is, whether Linkletter is managing to hang on. I'm not sure he is. Hofbauer is a strong looking runner. He, is his pacemaker still there? Or is he in isolation now? I think. I he's bet he's on his own, I would think, now, because yeah. we just got a time of 132.30 at the 30K mark, and that puts him at finishing about 210.06. So it's down to him right now with yeah. Rory, Rory chasing behind. But this is a lonely run, but we've seen him do it before. He, if, if anybody's yep, capable of sure. uh, knocking it down like this, he, he can. He could just be, be extending that lead as far as possible, keeping Rory away and mentally messing with him. <laughs> Let's but go back with the elite women, where that group of three Ethiopians still together. Berka, the Grace Jones of women's marathon running at the back of the group, looking comfortable, having perhaps been through a bad patch. Herpa is the designated leader, but she's the one that actually looks worst facially. She looks like she's really puffing away a little bit there. Yeah, you know, we often talk about this in the broadcast, how people look, and I often think about Paula Radcliffe when, you know, she set the world record. Yeah. Um, you know, it, she wasn't pretty looking in the end, right? So I always kind of think, doesn't matter how you look at times, but certainly you can tell if the shoulders start to get tense and come up and, and, the, and there's, you know, grimacing in the face. That's yeah. evident, but, you know, Kipchoge smiles in the end and that helps kind of relax his body and, and kind of help him mentally to get through. And I know that a lot of people have tried to kind of channel into that, lift the legs and, and, and keep a positive mindset. Well, there is, there's no remarks column on the result sheet that says look terrible. It's just first, second, third and time. That's right. Let's go back to Melindy Elmore, still leading. We haven't uh, had a recent update on Piderewski in the um, Women's Canadian Challenge, but she's had a good couple of years. She's had a good career. Let's hear what she had to say about it. I'm Melindy Elmore and I'm running the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. It's been awesome the last few years. We have had a couple opportunities to race, but each one that we get to, there's more and more people and there's more energy, and it's really awesome to be back out there with 22,000 people on the streets of Toronto. You forget how much you feed off the energy of all the runners. COVID kind of, you know, hit in 2020. We didn't know at the time that there would be this delay for a year and a half of races. Thankfully, the Olympics were still held in 2021. So that was my first big race in a year and a half during COVID. Um, so I go from no races to running the Olympics. My strategy is in every marathon is to get into the race and to kind of connect with my body and make sure that I'm running the appropriate effort that I can sustain for 42.2K. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an art and a science. There's the training that backs up, you know, the fitness and gives you an idea of the ballpark that of the effort that you can run or the pace you can run, but then you kind of have to feel it on the day. This is my first time doing it. <laughs> I'm very excited to run Canada's marquee marathon and to be able to run my first marathon in Canada on Canadian soil is, is really exciting for me and one of the big reasons why I wanted to run Toronto. And at the moment, she is leading in that uh, Canadian Women's Championship. There's her credentials on the left-hand side. If only we had somebody in the studio that could speak about world-class marathon running into the fifth decade and uh, still maintaining the whole family balance and everything mm -hmm. else. Krista Duchesne. <laughs> 
You know, when you have kids, it certainly puts things in perspective. And I know Melindy has spoken to that, how, you know, it's a big adjustment. But, you know, when you come home and you've got a sick kid or you have to get them to swimming practice or any sort of extracurricular, you, you put your race or your run behind you, whether it was it was great or not. You know, you, you refocus. So you don't carry that kind of emotional drain with you if, if you, you tended to kind of obsess about how your running's gone. So she definitely has that perspective and she's a coach and... Um, you know, there's just a lot of, of depth to her. And like she said, it's an art and a science. And, and that's, that's definitely a good way to, to describe the marathon. We've got a breakaway in the international men's race. Let's see who it is. It is Candy. Felix Candy of Kenya has suddenly ripped apart this race at the one hour 37 points. So inside the last half hour of running, and he's decided he's going to make it a Warriors race. Candy, the man who finished third here, watched our live stream in 2019 and decided he was coming back. Is he coming back for the win? Is he coming back for the fastest time on Canadian soil? He needs to accelerate quite a bit. I mean, this is probably the best part of the race when you see the CN Tower. Uh, he probably just knows exactly where he is. And it's his second time here, so he's probably feeling really good. He knows exactly where everything is. This could be a totally new land for everyone else. Well, he's uh, in the space of uh, a kilometre, he's opened up, what does that look like, four or five seconds over the chaser? Right, right. And he, sa he says he feels at home in Toronto and he, he loves the city and, and the whole experience that it brings. He was third in 2018. Well, in years to come, they'll ask who was the first ever wheelchair competitor at the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. The answer is it was the all-time great racer, Josh Cassidy of Canada, who tested the course for those that will follow in future years, making the event more diverse, more inclusive. And he's on a 138, so that is super fast. Remember, he's gone the full distance in an hour 38, barring that two minute head start that the elite wheelchairs had. So Cassidy has had a lonely ride out there, but he will have had lots of support. He's one turn now away from winning the inaugural wheelchair division here at the TCS. Toronto Waterfront Marathon of 2022. He was Commonwealth bronze medalist in 2010 in the 1500, world champion bronze medalist in 2013, and the Pan Am uh, three-time silver medalist um, in, in dif distances from 800, 1500, and 5,000. Well, he's done it all in the sport, really. He's uh, clocked super fast times, but this is all about making his mark on history. I love the fact that he has swirly wheels. He's a graphic designer. He's the w wheelchair racer that we always recognize on the track or the road. But here comes the final turn for him. He can see the finishing tape. And it's going to be our first champion of the day in the wheelchair division. Appropriately enough, it's for Canada and Josh Cassidy. And unofficially under one hour 40. So proving that the course is quick for wheelchair racers. This is Felix Candy opening up at the head of the elite men's race through the one hour 40 point, around about 26 minutes of running or maybe less. There's Hofbauer on the other side on the contraflow going in the opposite direction. We'll see him shortly, but let's see what Felix Candy had to say about his prospects when he arrived in Toronto. Names are Felix Candy. I'm an elite runner from Kenya. I'll be running this Sunday uh, Toronto, Waterfront Toronto Marathon. It's an honor for me to be here, being invited to be among the elite team that would be able to run in Toronto on Sunday. First, first my for the first time in 2018, and I was happy about it. The way I saw the city, the hospitality in Toronto, the organization here in this race, the course, of course the sea of the, the along the rivers, running it's so beautiful. So it was really a good experience for for me the first time I was here. And I was looking and hoping that uh, again I'll be able to come to Toronto. And this time uh, I was happy after the pandemic. When they announced that the Toronto would be this year, I was so excited. They have made some good changes in certain places. So, and uh, it was, I saw through the map and I can see it's along the beach. That's what I love about it. Along the sea, you can see the sea on the other side and it's really nice. And you can run uh, in, within the city a little and then maybe you can explore also the other places when you're running outside the city a little bit so that's what's most most beautiful thing about this course and also 
at other parts, when you'll be running towards the other side, you'll be seeing other runners coming on the other side. So it's really a nice course. It's a balanced course, and uh, that's what I love about it. So that's what Felix Candy had to say. You can see at the age of 35, it's not his first rodeo, but a 206 man, one of the quickest in the field. He knows this event from his podium place in 2018. And here he is live, head rocking a little bit. But Candy, maybe that surge, not only taking him clear of the field, uh, heading towards victory perhaps, but also taking him back towards 205 and the course record. Let's go back to the elite women where they are approaching uh, their next checkpoint, and we're down to two, Berka and Herpa, and it was 1.40.16 at uh, 30, 30 kilometers for them. So that is around about just about... 2.21.02. Yes, so close to the 2.21 point, but we're down to two, and you can see Mekinen further back down the course has uh, been dropped significantly. And look who's coming on the charge. Max Max. Wow, we had written her off. And rumors of her demise very much premature because the woman in pink, the mother of one, the defending champion, is back up into third place. Let's see if we can pan to the right and see whether she is going to spring a surprise on them. She looked all over the place last time we saw her, and suddenly she's back within six seconds of the lead. What a story this would be. This would definitely be very exciting. It would be that you know theme of patience that she talked about that could pay off. If she's if she's played this race, she's coming she's really quick. coming quickly catching up to them. Ooh, and they won't be expecting this, will they? No. Because uh, they got rid of her about half an hour ago, and suddenly she's revived like something out of a, a thriller. Wow, this is interesting. They need to they need to be aware she's coming because they may need to get a wriggle on here because she's got momentum on her side here. Masai of Kenya, the defending champion with two Ethiopians from her arch rival nation up ahead. Let's go back briefly for the Canadian women's split for Melindy Elmore approaching uh, 30 kilometers as well. 142.32 is her split. So she's on pace for about a 224.13, which would be a personal best for her. I think we need to stick with the women's elite just to see if Masai has overcooked it or whether without a pacemaker she can close down on them. I think Berka has recognized what's going on here. She can probably hear the applause behind her. She's maybe had a look and Berka has decided she needs to ship out. Otherwise, Masai is coming. What a race this could be. Yeah, the little glimpse over her shoulder. I think she perhaps sensed there was something going on behind her. Herper, who's been grimacing for a long time, but has nonetheless been the leader, is now sandwiched between Berka and Masai. Well, this, this could be an absolutely fascinating last 40 minutes of this women's race with Masai, who wasn't even in camera shot the last four or five times we checked in, has suddenly got a wriggle on and she's got herself to within six seconds but Berka has realized what's happening right when you're looking over your shoulder I don't think that's a, a sign of, of confidence necessarily it, it might be a bit of of panic thinking you know she she moved to the front but you know if you hear the crowds cheering and someone's catching up to you you've got to mentally stick with it and keep pushing you're yeah. not going to be coasting to that win she said to the pacemaker get me out of here <laughs> Pacemaker doing a great job there. Oh, Berka uh, keeps checking to her right. Yeah. She senses it. She knows what's going on. Do you think they're sunglasses or rear view mirrors that she's wearing? <laughs> that could be new technology. Well, look at this. Mags Masai up into second. What a cat and mouse uh, outcome this could be. We'd written off the defense of her title. Nothing is ever certain in the marathon. And there could be lots of twists and turns literally still to come in this elite women's race. How's old Hofbauer getting on? Let's see if we can check in briefly with him in the Canadian men's race. There he is. We're looking back for Rory Linkletter, and there is no sign. So really, he's just got to hold it together. It's been a strong man's run here from Trevor Hofbauer. We've seen that before, and that's probably 30 seconds back down the road, and no sign of Rory Linkletter there. Right, so the last splits that we had has Trevor finishing at about 2.10.06 and Rory's finishing time might be about 2.10.24. Yeah. 
I think he's drifting back. Mm. Well, it's hard to know which camera to go with. My temptation is with the elite women, just to see if Berka has realized what's happening with uh, Mags Masai. So that elite women's race, there we are. Now, Mags... And Mags had moved into second. She's, yeah, she's right behind yeah. there in second place now. Yeah, but I think I think Berka has rumbled what was happening there. <laughs> and uh, the pacemaker is, is trying to carry her clear, keeping an eye on his watch. And let's uh, see how the overall race is looking from the air. The drone over Lake Ontario, checking out on the masses down at the furthest point of the course. Yeah, here we are at um, Ontario Place again. Uh, this is about the 147 mark for the half. So you're getting a lot of people that are running their first half um, and experience all of this for the first time. And especially people who've been waiting for three years just yeah. to do their first race. A lot of people have been doing virtual races by themselves and running 21 kilometers alone. Right, and a lot of people took up running during the pandemic because it was the sport that you could do. You know, you put your shoes on, you head out the door, you don't have to um, have any sort of membership at a gym or a hockey rink or, you know, it was it was that sport that wasn't really taken from us, which, you know, we were really grateful for when, when other um, sports weren't able to do um, this, what, what they were used to doing. Well, a reminder that it is 25,000 runners from 70 countries raising more than 3 million Canadian dollars for charity. Good luck to all of them. We can see a few on the right-hand side of the carriageway still heading away from the city centre. But let's go back to the elite women's where that gap is tantalising, staying at around about five seconds. So Masai had a lot of momentum coming from a long way back, maybe even from seventh, eighth place back. Uh, so the adrenaline will have been surging, and she's still drilling a hole in the back of Berka's vest. But Berka has uh, responded by taking this lead. Right. You know, Berka doesn't look uncomfortable, but Mags definitely looks like she's just got some power uh, as she's getting closer. Yeah, I think Berka just looked back over her shoulder, and Mags is, is definitely hunting yeah, her down yeah. to get her, <laughs> her, her title back. It's the bogey woman coming mm. for you. Okay, let's go to Mexico, the cheer zone uh, down on the course, and we will catch up with our reporter, Trackside. Here's Laura. Hey, everyone. The spirit of Mexico is alive here on the lakeshore. Woo! Viva Mexico! This is Rodrigo. He helped organize this. Can you tell me a bit about the connection between Mexico and Toronto in terms of the running scene? Yeah, absolutely. It's been uh, several years already. Alan Brooks have made already partnerships with the multiple running clubs in Mexico. He spends a lot of time promoting the Toronto Marathon when it was the Scotiabank, now TCS, basically for the last several years that I remember. And he goes to Guadalajara, Monterrey, Mexico City, creates all this awareness and drives all this attendance. And like my understanding is that this year's around 500 people, give or take, from Mexico that flew in just for this. But prior to the pandemic, it used to be like 750, almost 800. And the intention is to create much more of this uh, connection between both countries. Running, it's all about creating community. And as you can see, it's all about bringing all this energy, especially at this point. Like when everybody's at this point on the race, you really need that energy. For sure. So how do we cheer on the runners in Spanish? How do I cheer the runners in Spanish? I will basically say, vamos corredores, viva Mexico. This is open for everybody, not only Mexicans, it's on anybody from Latin America, anybody who speaks Spanish is more than welcome. And I apologize for my voice. Viva Mexico! Viva Mexico! Woo! Sorry. Uh, thank you, Laura. Look what's happened in this elite women's race. Masai, who, as we said, has come from so far back at the hairpin turn, has taken the lead, a lead that she relinquished probably three quarters of an hour ago drifted way back down the field and for Berka that is like a devastating hammer blow she will have known that Masai had dropped from that group she was way outside camera shot and suddenly the defending champion looks full of running and you know you, you never know what happened maybe um, Meg's had like a cramp that she kind of yeah. had to work through or just kind of rough patch and she just trusted her training and and she's she's looking so confident right now but if you're just joining us welcome along by the way it's uh Jeff Whiteman with Krista Koning and uh, Krista Duchesne. Max Masai won this race the last time it was held in person in 2019. Since then, she hasn't raced and she's had a baby son, Jake Jr. 
her husband Jake Robertson raced the TCS Amsterdam Marathon today. So a very athletics family, both by marriage and by uh, birth. Lynette Massoy is her sister. But look at this, she's opening up and going away and suddenly the pacemaker is for her. She also manages a few houses that they've bought that they rent out to people who go to um, to train in I-10. And uh, her half marathon personal best is 111.49. And I think it's 107.31, but I'm not sure that that's a record eligible course for that. I think her personal best for the 10K is about 31.44 um, from New York City in 2017. Well, for the first time in the race, as we come up to one hour 53, we have clear leaders in all four categories. Uh, let's go round them in order, starting with Felix Candy in the international men's race. He's furthest down the road, and you can see that gap, which was pretty close uh, until relatively recently, is now up to, what, 20 or 30 seconds, and he only has uh, barely 15 minutes to run. He has a look back. He won't see anybody from that angle because of the spectators on the course, but Candy has been third in this race, and at the moment, still a lot can happen, looks to be clear, Chris, in this men's uh, international division. Yeah, still give this time, because, I mean, we're, we are getting close, but this is always everyone's last big kick. Everyone's waiting patiently for 30, this is, all, this is it, um, not 35K. They, uh, you save everything, you save it for the last kick. And he's just outside 206 pace at the moment. Uh, with that 35 kilometer intermediate split. It looks like he's toiling a little bit. We're looking back, you can see the uh, bicycle outriders accompanying second and maybe third place a little bit further back down the road. So he's really got to concentrate and keep working, not worry too much about the time. I think uh, the course record and the Canadian all comers record is gonna live for another day to fill mm. baby police the uh, winner here so many times. Candy was saying in his interview with Paul Gaines that um, uh, he's got a farm and some rental properties and he's looking into working with um, within real estate and said something about, you know, you can't have all your eggs in one basket. So that's good to see kind of the diversity there. Uh, he has a, a baby as well at home. And um, like we said before, he just loves Toronto and, and being in the city. So that I think that definitely... Um, makes a difference in your race is that feel of the city and how you like it and just yeah. the, the warmth and you know with Alan Brooks making all athletes um, both in Canada and international feel so welcome here um, that 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 has a, a big mental and emotional benefit in, in how you can perform well two things if you're looking for little clues about how he's feeling it's not good it was a very half-hearted attempt to grab a drinks bottle which he just knocked to the ground so he's missed out on that bottle of prepared carbohydrate fluid and also when he went to look back over his shoulder almost his whole body turned so he's weary he's fatigued mm. he's running a world-class time but he's not safe early uh, at, at this stage so the second man uh, that's leading in his division is Trevor Hofbauer let's go back to him the leading Canadian and there he is Coming up to one hour 55, the last uh, checkpoint was 200 meters ahead of Rory Linkletter for the Canadian title. I don't think he's going to uh, post a time that is going to guarantee him selection for the World Championships, but he can't do much more than win the Canadian title here. His split at 35 kilometers, 144.55, which is around about, can that be correct? I'm looking. Yeah, I think I think that may be a little bit off because that's got him at 207, and I don't. Yeah, think he's I think like we're that. having a, a, a wide problem with with tracking right now. I think um, various systems are <laughs> struggling, so um, I think it's safe to say that Trevor's still around the, the 210. 210, 210 yeah. is, is more yeah. accurate, and, that, and so that's maybe just not, based on right. Maybe not a personal best for him today, but no. um, I'm sure he'll still be happy, even if it's a 210 high, if he gets that Canadian title. So we'll leave him there and come back to him. Let's go back to the elite women's race and Max Masai, who's come from way, way, way back, completely revived. And let's see what the gap for her is over Berka, the athlete who missed out on racing Montreal in the spring because of uh, an issue with her passport. And she's a long way back now, isn't she? That's over 100 meters. But Masai just grimacing a little bit. She's put in a shift here to get back on terms. 
Now, if she, you know, having known that she caught up and we see that the pacer is required to stay with that first athlete, he's not there for individual athletes, kind of telling her where to run, encouraging her, not sure how long he will stick with her. But, you know, if she's caught up and she gets that victory today and sets a, a personal best, which will be a new um, all comers record, you know, what a day to celebrate. And I believe you said that her, her husband is also racing today. He ran in Amsterdam in the TCS uh, Amsterdam Marathon. I haven't seen those results, but that took place uh, a few hours ago. Uh, the baby is in Kenya with uh, grandma. Or yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be pretty exciting for her. So we're going to get a projected uh, time for the women rather than an outright split time at uh, 35 kilometers. Let's just see if Masai is still inside that course record time. So that's the split that we're being given, 1.56, which at the moment projects to around about 2.21 and bits. Just gone over a sensor mat there. That may have been 35 kilometers there. But it, there's a race to be won here more than anything. She's had a very curious race where she drifted a long, long way back and then sliced her way right through the field. Pacemaker working hard to nurse her. I think he may be Ethiopian. And look at the charge going on behind Candy. So I said that he made a very uh, poor attempt to grab at his drinks bottle. He was looking behind. His head was rolling a little bit. And those motor, those uh, bicycle outriders have drawn alongside. And it's because second place is closing down. Oh, wow. And th this is the last incline you're going to deal with until the finish line. And here we go. And this is also the part where you see the CN Tower and you can just bolt for the finish. Yeah, he's taking, yep, yep, there we go. Aden. It's Adame, Adame. Yulahine Adame, who was one of the seeded runners, one of the uh, athletes that was expected to do well, 26 years of age. And there's, he's had a sequence of wins for his training group. There's a cake at stake. <laughs> and he was a, um, I mean, like many of them, a, a track runner before, but um, he switched to the marathon because he was having problems with his Achilles wearing spikes on the track and found that the, the shoes running um, on the road were, were better for him and keeping those injuries away. He's from the Moyo Sports uh, Management Team. That's uh, Malcolm Anderson. There's his credentials on the left-hand side. And he ha he's on close to his lifetime best at the moment. I think he's run, you know, a, a decent number of marathons, close to a, a dozen, and his personal best is 205.53 from Barcelona uh, this year. Well, it, actually, I don't think he is the man who's the stable that have won the cakes. He's the one whose training partner, uh, Gabriel Selassie, little Gabriel Selassie, was second in the London Marathon, and he did the entire build-up with him. We had a little rehearsal to try and get him to talk about his own form, and... Uh, we didn't actually get to that at the press conference, but his view was he was running as well as his teammate who was second at London Marathon. So he's known all about his build-up and how well he was going. He allowed that breakaway to happen for Felix Candy, and he's now not only neutralized it, but look how much he's opened up in the space of uh, just a couple of minutes there. And if, if you're going to, you know, pass, you, you pass and do it with strength and speed. You don't yeah. want to just kind of catch up to someone and, and run alongside them. So he's clearly, um, you know, made his mark here that he's going for it. So the last athlete that we haven't checked in with recently is Melindy Elmore in the elite, in the Canadian women's event. It looks as though it's just her and her personal pacemaker uh, now through the two hour point. Right, that's Kevin Coffey. So her group um, definitely has thinned out. We saw that it was pretty large for quite a while. Um, but, you know, great to have this encouragement there. Kevin is just a wonderful guy. Um, he, he works as well with Mile to Marathon. He just had a, a baby, he and his wife, not long ago. And, um, you know, Kevin had a very serious brain injury um, several years ago. And he's found that running has just been so therapeutic for him. And um, just one of the nicest guys that you could ever know. Um, and so to have him out there as a pacer it is, is just perfect to have that, that calmness as well as that encouragement to just try to stay on pace for her goals. Elmore is going to be the last of the intermediate splits that we get very shortly. Here's the drink stations. And she grabs nicely. And that is an accurate split at 35 kilometers. So 
What's that projecting to? So Kristen? it looks like she's going to run about 224.20 if if everything's working well with our tracking system, uh, which again would be a, a personal best for her, and I think she would be thrilled with that today. And and if that comes off, and you know, we hate to prejudge anything in a marathon when so many things can happen in the closing stages. Would she accept and 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 be considered for world championship? selection and would that be her next marathon in august or would she potentially do one in the spring before that oh i don't think she'd do one in the spring i i kind of doubt it um you know it's with the marathon you definitely have to plan in advance and it would be good to know what the what the standards are and the and the criteria to be selected so um with this if she gets this victory today with that time i think that would be the race that we would see her do um would be the world championships in uh 23. Okay, let's leave her there. Let's go back to the elite men, the fastest of the finishers. We've already had a wheelchair win for Josh Cassidy of Canada, the first finisher of the day, just under one hour 40 unofficially. Adane of Ethiopia is leading, enjoying the cheering from the runners on the contra flow section of this course. Uh, this, is, this is just incredible. He is going so fast on this, uh, just on the east end of Queen. Um, towards Bay, there's only one way to go and then a right turn and you're done. Yeah. Th this is uh, yeah, he's going right back to St. Lawrence Market. He's not far. He knows it's there. You can smell it. I mean, yesterday when I talked to him, he, he, he was so confident. He knew exactly what he was doing. He said the number to me. Um, I said, well, what if you don't? He said, no, it's only going to happen. <laughs> Well, we'll stay with him now through to the finish. He's only got uh, barely three minutes of running left, just three or four turns left in the race. I don't think anybody's going to catch him here. He's absolutely timed this to perfection. If you looked at him now and said, what distance is he running? You'd say maybe 1,500 meters on the track because that's the turnover and the speed that he's generating. Uh, there's no point looking back because he can't even see uh, Candy now because he's so far back down the road. It's just how much time he can knock off uh, his projected finishing time. He's got a best of 2.05. That was the course record that he set in Barcelona that we were seeing on his graphic uh, a little bit earlier on. Don't think he's going to quite break that today, but I think he's brought himself back down much closer into the territory of 2.06. And this is going to be the biggest win of his life. And he's done it uh, with superb timing so far. Mm -hmm. Right. He's got a half marathon personal best of 101.34 from 2014 and was a member of the under 20 gold um, team at the 2013 World Cross Country Champ Championships for Ethiopia. Like I said before, he had aimed to focus more on the track. His, his goal was the 5,000 meter, but clearly he's, um, you know, made a good transition to the road, which has been better for prevention of injuries in his case. So two minutes or so to run for Adame. Adane, fantastic run because I think he was another one that I, I'm not sure he even came through from second. I think he was further back like we've seen he in was. the women's race. Yes. He, was, he was well down fifth, sixth, and he's come through for what looks like it could be one of the wins of his life. There he, he moves to the side of the cones. He's into the closing stages now. Yeah, he was, when we were watching that lead pack for most of the race, he was easy to spot because he had a, a different shirt, um, yes, yes. different than the other ones. So, you know, he, you know, like Mags, was, was patient and just kind of trusted his body and made his move when it was time. It's been a day of celebration for the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Back in person for the first time since 2019. We're going to have a new champion, and it's going to be this man in the men's division. Urged on by the crowd, yep, turn that way. He's into the final sequence that brings him to the finish line, and he can enjoy this. Look at the uh, crowds of runners finishing the half marathon alongside, and this finishing straight will be for him. That's not quite the finishing straight. He's got one more turn. Maybe just starting to weary a little bit in the closing stages, but he's done such a lot of damage in the last couple of kilometers to open up here. And this final stretch is kind of the longest stretch you can take, but I can't imagine for him just knowing you have it now, you can take your time unless you just want to keep going. I know Alan Brooks is sitting there waiting at the finish line with the new champion. Uh, he's got this and wow, this must feel so great. Well, it was a wide open men's race this year. We're just looking back to see if it's Candy that comes round the turn second. You can see it's fully 
30 seconds back. Is that still Felix Candy in second? We'll check in a moment, but we'll concentrate on our men's champion here. As Chris said, it's a long, the camera foreshortens this. Oh, and look at the battle that we've got on for second and third. That's not over yet. Candy may well find himself slipping back from first to third, but in the lead is Yehulian Adane. Final two turns of the race coming up. It's going to be outside 207. He won't care about that. It's all about the win and it's all about the return to in-person racing here in Toronto. Yeah, and you know, some athletes, they have um, unique time bonuses based on their performance, so that could also be something that's pushing him to, to get under, you know, that last minute. But you look and see the half marathon runners um, finishing and, you know, how exciting to be able to run alongside the, the winner of this race. Well, here he comes, final right-hand turn. He'll then see the finishing arch into the gantry and there it is, he looks at his watch, but there'll be a big clock on the gantry above, and it's a big win for Yehunilin Adani of Ethiopia. He takes the 2022 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon for the race of his life. And this is the contest for second and third, and it has changed in the last few moments. Kipiego, Barcelius Kipiego, who had his turn at the front of the field, has come through. Poor old Candy back there is just coming in on autopilot, but he's going to make the podium. They're all a little bit weary this time. And in fact, it's Kiprono Kipkamoy, another man that's worked his way back into contention. He's going to take second place. So there's been some topsy-turvy positional changes, but it is second place. It's a win for Ethiopia, second for Kenya, and Felix Candy, who looked as though he'd got away for the win with less than 15 minutes to run, is now going to be the athlete coming across the line in third place. We go back to Trevor Hofbauer with uh, the final kilometer to run for him. And, and this is familiar, very familiar territory for Trevor, knowing that he won, but I mean, this time he went in confident knowing he was gonna get it. Last time he was the underdog and he must be enjoying this. He went so calm. You can see his face. I mean, I don't know how emotional he must be feeling right now. <laughs> and this is the turn Looking where you back. see it. He's gonna know. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. That was it for everyone. <laughs> that, that was beautiful. directly to uh, to the camera. You know, yeah. In three years ago, when he ran, he had just parted ways with his sponsor, and you know, didn't even go to the press conference. Similar story with Dana Pedereski not going. And you know, sometimes there's definitely an advantage to being the underdog. And so clearly today, Trevor, you know, he, like you said, he knows this course, and he, he used that to his advantage. Well, I, my parting comment to him at the Expo after the press conference was we need a Canadian on the podium. He, it's not going to be him, but he's not that far away. We've still only seen uh, three male finishers. He's definitely inside the top ten, possibly inside the top six. And there's one that he may still catch if he's got the legs. The camera does foreshorten, but Hofbauer, yeah, the uh, athlete there who's really struggling, that may be fifth place. I think the last time we saw a Canadian on the podium was um, Lanny Marchant in 2013 and Reed Kulsa in 2011. So I don't think we're going to see that today. But, um, you know, Trevor's really pushing it here. He might be, be catching to move up another spot, which which is great for, for prize money as well. And that is uh, Kipiego, Barcelius Kipiego, one of the early leaders. The, uh, the previous best that Trevor Hofbauer has had in the race was seventh when he ran that Olympic qualifying mark moves by I think with Trevor has it. So he's up into potentially, well, we've only seen three finishes. There could have been one that we missed when we came back for Hofbauer, but he's certainly inside the top six, maybe five, maybe even fourth. We'll check that in a moment. And he can enjoy this. The final right-hand turner. He's done it again. He's defended his Canadian title. He's going to be just outside 211, beats his chest. The Canadian champion again is Trevor Hofbauer. Loving it. Looks like he ran about 2.11, and I think he might be fifth overall. So that's a great performance for him. Kipiego 
takes sixth. And let's go back to the elite women's race where Mags Masai is a little bit further back down the road. 2.11 on the clock, still with a pacemaker to help her. Lots of uh, hand signals because you've got an Ethiopian speaking Anhamric and a Kenyan speaking Swahili. But look back, that gap. That gap isn't what it was in second place. This isn't done yet. And there's third and there's fourth. Uh -oh. I had a premonition about a very close finish in one of the races here. <laughs> Ooh, don't look back, there's, Max there's... Masai. She can't go any quicker, but it's going on behind her. It's kicking off. You know, still about 10 minutes to go. Some people kind of focus in on um, meters or kilometers. Some people focus on time. And, you know, he's being a, a really good encouragement to her. Maybe he feels that she's starting to, to slow down a bit and get a bit strained. And... Um, yeah, we might see something interesting. Well, look, the cadence has gone. She put in a big, big shift in the third quarter of the race to get herself back into contention. Everybody can hit the wall. It's when the glycogen stores run out, the cadence goes, the bounce goes, and I'm afraid it has gone. And they maybe can see that where she was once 200 meters clear. It's now down to 100 meters. And it's not just second place that can see her. It's third and fourth as well. We could have a rock and roll finish here in the women's race. And this is a particularly cruel uphill. If she can take this uphill with a little bit of grace, she can probably cruise through. She's been here before. I know she, she remembers this pain. She looked over the shoulder. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Keep going, all gas, no brakes. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Get back to Jake Jr. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good metaphor for life. So Mags Masai, the defending champion, she can't keep with the pacemaker. It's the old mantra of just put one foot in front of the other. But unfortunately, she's still got to hold on here for almost 10 minutes. And I think this is going to be dramatic. She did it to them, and now it could be the biter bit. Well, let's pan, let's pan left if we can. Yeah, here they come. The charge is on and she has no more gears left on her bike. I know Jake's at home watching on a screen, screaming at the screen. <laughs> Scream louder, Jake. Now, who is it that uh, comes through? Oh, and she's looking back. Second place is looking back. They're all fearful of what's going on behind them. And the win is there for somebody, but who? Is it the athlete in third or fourth that could yet come with uh, a late surge? So we're gonna have a changing of the guard here. It is Mags Masai, the leader. And she's been overtaken. Oh, and this is the downhill that'll change it. And it is Antonina Kwambai of Kenya that is the new leader. And this would be quite the story, but keep your eye on third place and fourth place because they're on the charge as well. We talk about biggest win of your life. For Kwambai, this would be, she's a 2.20, runner, set in uh, last year, but she's not comfortable either. She's latched on immediately to the pacemaker. Max Masai is drifting back, but third place is also on the charge. So there's still uh, seven or eight minutes of running to come, and we have had, is this our fifth different leader. Well, I was just going to say the pacemaker has looked over and seen a <laughs> few different people. Oh, hey, how are you? <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the lead of the mm -hmm. TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Is it your turn? Are you going to stay or are you going to get caught as well? <laughs> wow. Those gaps. Look, look at that. Suddenly, uh, Masai is going to be overtaken for third and fourth place is uh, coming as well. So this women's race has been extraordinary. Even if you've watched a lot of marathons as we have, you don't see many where it switches and swaps as much as this. Now, the athlete in second is around about 12 seconds behind. Other than Melindy Elmer, all three races, the three others have had um, change Runaways. in the leaders. Yeah, yeah. What were we projecting to in this women's race? I think we were still looking at about 221 which would be a, a significant, um, you know, personal best for her. Well, the today. time to keep an eye on is the all comers record and the course record of Mags Masai, which was 2.22.16. So that would be the real icing on the cake. She looks pretty good now. Mm -hmm. She'll obviously be in the territory where she can see the lead outriders 
uh, all the companies. She'll be getting the cheers from the crowd. Obviously, she knows she's in the lead, and this is, well, it gives you a lift, doesn't it? Whoever you are, it gives you a lift when something like that happens. Definitely. And is she going away? I'm not sure she is, actually. That, that's still around about 12 seconds, that gap. Well, we, the pacer's doing a great job because we can't even see her. <laughs> mm. How far do we think left at this point? It's about uh, six well, minutes of running. What five do you think? minutes. Yeah, two kilometers. To just less, under two less kilometers. Just under two, yeah. Yeah. That's a long way to hold on, but she does look comfortable at this stage. Nice cheer zone as well here, Chris. I think this is just about the last kilometer. She'll be coming up on that last kilometer mark, I think. She's looking pretty solid. It's just that feeling right when you see Bay, and then there's going to be a crowd out there, and you know the turn's coming. So welcome along if you're just joining us. We're on the live stream coverage of the 2022 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. We've had our wheelchair champion, that was uh, Josh Cassidy, of Canada, an inaugural wheelchair winner. We have had our men's champion, that was Yehunilene Adani of Ethiopia, and this is our women's leader. But we hesitate to say champion, champion in waiting, because a lot can happen, and second place is just back there behind the motorcycle outrider, around about 12 seconds behind. They're on tired legs, it's the final kilometer, there's a few turns left, but at the moment, it is Antonina Kwambai of Kenya that is leading the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. She's come from a long way back, but there you can see second place, still around about 12 or 15 seconds maybe behind. Pacemaker is stepping off here, telling her she's going alone. That's not what you want to hear, is it? Not, <laughs> at all. To go. not too much to go now. <laughs> I guess he got paid to 40K, 41. Yeah. I think she's got enough in the tank, hasn't she? Surely. They're crossing the road behind her, meaning that there's a gap of maybe 20 seconds now. But she's frowning, concentrating hard. She's definitely in pain. So I must confess, I mean, although she's on the start list, she's not an athlete I've previously heard of. Um, we didn't involve her in the elite athlete bid presentations. One kilometer to run. Let's let's just time that gap if we can keep it in vision back to second place. See when she passes the 21 kilometer point. You know, it is still only about 15 seconds. That's a lot to make up, but the uh, she's in sight of second place. It just depends how motivated and fatigued second place is. It looks like there may be a male runner alongside her helping. So now she enters into this closing sequence. 2.23.16 is her predicted finishing time. So it's going to be a minute outside or thereabouts the course record still a great win for her It'll if, she, if she can best. hang on yeah mm. big lifetime best for her that chaser has got a male runner alongside surely we're running out of road here for any last bid to be mounted but we we saw in the men's race for the minor podium places they switched in the uh, last hundred meters So it must feel like the longest kilometer of her entire life. Yeah, she has a look back. It's slightly spooky because she can see and she can hear the ripple of applause for the athlete following. But here she comes back onto the main carriageway. The cones will separate her on the right hand side as we look at it. Just a couple of turns away, but the long straight still to come. It's just coming up. She just passed the young. And uh, as you can hear the crowd coming, as you can hear the crowd, uh, it's almost there and they've chalked the ground they've let them know here they come I'm not sure she's aware she needs to go more to the right if she wants to cut off that tangent yeah she's going the, the opposite way but I mean she's just following the lead vehicle at the camera bike at the moment I think this is uh, this is just all gas keep going 
That gap behind her is still about 12 or 15 seconds. And here is the longest stretch. <laughs> I should be pleased to hear that. That'll be do Glad she can't hear me. Great news for her. This is victory, keep going. Antonina Kwambai of Kenya leading. Now let's see when second place comes round the turn. Is it all over? Is it a clear cut gold medal? There's the bike. And there's second place. Ooh. This is a close one. Yeah, I think I think we're running out of road, but but the second place female has got away from that male in the white vest, suggesting she's trying to put in a little bit of a surge here. So hard to do, isn't it? In the last kilometer of a 42 kilometer race, we're saying sprint. It's all you can do to stay upright. Isn't right. It? You know, you're definitely running with, with your heart at the end where you're just pushing as hard as you can and just <laughs> hoping that you finish solid, solid crossing that line. But, you know, there's there's definitely been heartbreaking finishes where you're kind of crawling across. But And they've been spending the whole race just fighting back and forth. This yes. isn't just taking your time and then leaving it all on the end. They've been going back and forth. Is that spent a lot of energy? I'm looking for third woman in this uh, head on shot. It was uh, Max Masai. I don't think it's her. We're looking back. But let's concentrate on the winner here because it is by far the biggest race win of her life. These are moments she won't have ever experienced before. Fantastic crowd support on the left. Fantastic half marathon runner support on the right hand side. And here comes the final two turns and she's revived. What a moment for the Kenyan. And the final right hand turn coming up. And she can take it as the champion. Antonina Kwambai of Kenya. There it is. She's been praying for it for the last few minutes. And finally, it's in sight. She is the winner of the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon of 2022. Antonina Kwambai of Kenya. Incredible. Oh, what a fight. Held on there. She did well to get out from a kneeling position that quickly. And this is second place. And I think it is Ruth Chebitok who's come through for second. She's not entirely confident. Weaves around as she takes the right hand turn. But it is a Kenyan one two. Ruth Chebitok is going to take silver for Kenya. A 221.03 personal best. She was third here. She upgrades that from 2018 to 2022 with the silver medal. And Galetta Berka <laughs> is going to conclude the podium after the disappointment of missing the Montreal Marathon in the spring. She comes back to Toronto and she's going to break 225. It was the Ottawa Marathon, right? With Ottawa, the, the no, Ottawa. Yeah, probably yeah. With, the, with the visas and the, the passports. So her first Still. marathon back on Canadian soil brings a bronze medal for Galeta Burka of Ethiopia. And all three of our medalists in the women's event, sub 225. Looking back to see if it's Mags Masai in fourth place. She was really hurting. There's Melindy Elmore. She may have come through to top six or seven here. She's gone by Max Masai. So like Trevor Hockbauer, she's only just going to miss the podium. And she's going to be very close to 225 here for Melindy Elmore. She's come through really strongly for fourth place overall and Canadian national champion. Fantastic run for her. And I think this is going to clinch world championship selection. Elmore celebrates. Canadian champion and fourth overall. Excellent day for her. What a what a career she's had. You know, when she retired from the track the, that many years ago, she never imagined doing this. She said, and there she is getting a hug from Alan Brooks, who's who's like a father figure to so many of us. Uh, she's definitely you know fatigued. Um, you know, just about what 20 seconds uh, slower than her personal best a definitely a great performance for her today i think we might see her son charlie here soon who came um with with graham um melindy's husband and thanking her sponsor or her her pacer kevin coffee there for all the work he did you know taking her right through to the end that's just an ideal scenario to have your pacer with you for that long
And I think Max Masai, there she is. She's in uh, fifth place overall, still smiling, the uh, champion of 2019. But Alan Brooks there must be absolutely delighted because the intention is that this is and gets increasingly a world-class marathon, and we've seen it yet again, but also that it helps deliver improving Canadian opportunities. They don't have to go they don't have to go uh, to Berlin or elsewhere to record fast times to make money and to get uh, an increase in their profile. And this right. is it right This here is actually the, the first marathon that Melinda has run in Canada. She's wanted to do it for so long, like she said in the interview, and it, it's finally worked out well for her. And, you know, there's nothing better than holding up that Canadian flag when you've uh, won a championship. And, you know, you kind of just, the moment can be surreal. She's waving to people and, and she's got life balance, right? You know, she's probably going to be back home in BC in a couple of days, you know, making lunches for her kids, taking them to swimming. And, and she's just got such good life balance and, and perspective and, um, um, you know, but also looking to that, that next marathon again, probably after she recovers from this one. Well, and that next marathon, as we were saying, could well be the World Championships in Budapest next August because that time that she's run, will be inside any likely qualifying criteria, and she's won the national title. So the choice will be hers. This, I think, is Mekkonen. Uh, what are we on to? The sixth place female finisher. So she was one of our early leaders in a race where we've seen seven or eight different changes of lead, even in the closing stages. Mekkonen of Ethiopia on very weary legs coming through. We've now had all of our champions. And it has been a great day of racing. And look at the clock on the top right. We're still only on 2.28. So the world is really moving on. We should say something about super shoes here because <laughs> it yeah. has made a difference to the times of elite athletes without, well, times of all athletes in marathons without question. For sure. It can't be debated. You know, um, the super shoes can can make you as, as fast as, you know, two minutes faster than, than what you've run before. It, it depends on your ability before. It could be up to seven minutes. But... Um, you know, most of the athletes, if not all of them, are wearing the, the carbon plated shoe, carbon fiber plated shoe that definitely works to your advantage at the end of the race when your, your legs are getting fatigued. It just helps with that impact when, um, when you're starting to feel sore and hard to push, as well as that soft cushioning that's provided. So the times that we used to think of as world class have moved on to become quite routine. The world records, the national records, the qualifying marks are all moving forward. There she is finishing now, that Seganesh Mekanin of Ethiopia. We think in sixth place overall in the women's. Oh, and that will be a nice pause and a lean on the barrier. It's hard, isn't it, the marathon? Now, how, however accessible we make it and however many people run it, and there's been a million people who run New York, a million people who run London, it's still a significant undertaking, isn't it? For sure. Now, there's Dana Pitoreski in the yellow um, top with the gray shorts coming up with the orange shoes. So she is going to be um, our second Canadian female finishing that race today. So she's probably just going to be over 2.30. Great race for her, not far off her personal best time, which she got here three years ago uh, with a time of 2.29.03. Now, that's... Um that's potentially going to put her in the frame. Let's see what it ends up being, because it could be close to 2.31. That could put her in the frame for the Canadian team for the World Championships. Just depends on uh, where the international and the national criteria are set for selection for those championships. This has been a year, 2022 has been a year where we've had Commonwealth Games, World Championships, Pan American Games. Next year, it's just the World Championships. That's the, the key one for marathon runners. So as we sweep back, it will be to see Dana Pidorevsky. Still got perhaps a minute or so to run. Two final turns for her. It's going to be the silver medal in the Canadian Championships. And looking full of running at the moment, Chris. She looks great, yeah. You know, she's... Um, yeah. Not many people finish a marathon feeling absolutely fantastic. Um, but she she's looking really good here. You know, she knows this turn as, as well as anyone. And... And she'll, I think she'll be pleased with this. Um, I think she maybe wanted to run a little bit faster. You never know if, if something kind of came up during the race. But here she is making that turn. And um, like she said, she's had such a positive experience here um, in Toronto three years ago. Well, she knows this course. She knows this finish. She gives a good account of herself yet again. It is going to be the silver medal in the Canadian National Championships to add to the gold that she won last time round. And it goes to Dana Pidoreski. 
unofficially just under 2.31 and she looks remarkably fresh. She does, you know, um, when she ran this in 2016, she talked about it in the video. Uh, it was a big disappointment because she actually had, I think, a sacral stress fracture and, um, you know, just barely made it to the line and kind of collapsed. She ended up being in a wheelchair, um, you know, to move around the hotel after with the interviews and whatnot. There's Sasha Golish, so we know the story with her. She's a Masters runner now. She's looking like she's just having a strong finish there with Patty Birch, who's run with her from Toronto as well. And this is her seventh of eight national championships she's doing this year. And that is a big lifetime best for her in uh, third place to take the bronze medal in the Canadian Championships. Her previous best was 2.32.54, and she was uh, more than a minute inside that. So at the press conference, she said, oh, I'm just aiming to get round. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's interesting with, with Sasha because, you know, at one minute she's on the track doing speed stuff and, and training for a short race, and then, you know, here she is running a marathon, and she runs a personal best of 2.31. So I think she likes the variety, obviously, if she's doing that, and, and the challenge of doing these, these different national championships Clearly, the training has gone well. Some people are kind of quiet in terms of what they put on Strava. Um, but, um, you know, I think she can certainly be proud with running a personal best. Um, I don't want to say at her age. She is younger than me, but she is in her 40s. So definitely a successful day for her. But a relatively late comer to the sport. She only started uh, serious uh, road running when she was 32. So she's fitted a lot in. She's a civil engineer. Um, she's an ultimate Frisbee player. She's a do-athlete, a triathlete. And uh, that's an outstanding result for her. And, and when we get times like this, they generally percolate right the way down the field. So if we've got personal best at the front, it's going to be a good day for everybody. For sure. We're going to stay with the finish line as much as we can. We will have the presentation of awards coming up. We've concluded all three of our podiums now with that uh, bronze medal in the Canadian Women's Championship for Sasha Golish. But there are still plenty of runners to come. Don't forget, if you haven't downloaded the TCS uh, Toronto Waterfront Marathon app. You can still do that free and you can track any runners that you're looking out for. And remember, these runners that we're looking at now are running two and a half hours off the gun time. So tremendous running. We're still in the top 2% of the race, probably. Mile to Marathon, we've seen several of, of those shirts today. That's the group that Dylan uh, Wikes, um overseas and, and th that business that he has where he's got coaches that, that work for his group. Um, Rob Watson is one of them as well who, who works with Dylan and they've really been successful with this group. Um, they have athletes all over Canada. So Dylan Wikes is now in Ottawa and Rob Watson is out in, in Vancouver, BC. And um, you know, some workouts are done in person with this group and some are you know just virtual if, if they're not closer to the, those locations where they have the group runs. There's the Italian flag being carried, or is that the Mexican flag? It's a big uh, contingent of Mexicans. We've got, uh, I think, up to 500 of them taking part. I think, it's, director. I think it's Mexican flag. Alan, Alan Brooks cultivates the connections with Mexico, and they reciprocate by uh, coming to this race in their hundreds. We've got 25,000 runners across all three events. You can see the half marathon finishing. This guy's enjoying this, isn't he? half marathon finishing on the right hand side of the barrier there 70 different countries three million dollars being raised for charity and how good it is to see the crowds out the supporters out the ordinary runners having a go the elite runners back and running personal best after the three years that we've had it's been difficult hasn't it? for sure i don't think we saw rory linkletter come in but i think according to the the um the tracker he ran about 213 32. Thank you. So we'll keep the coverage on the finish line as much as we can. If you're looking out for a particular runner in conjunction with the uh, TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon app, then uh, hopefully you'll know roughly when they're expected on the finish line. But of course, we're still in the first few dozen finishers in a race that will go on for many hours from now. I guess this guy's our first Mexican, so hats off to him. Now back to talking about Sasha Golish running the, the different national championships. I think that she has been on the podium actually for everyone as well. Has she? Which, that, that's, which that's is amazing. incredible. Yeah, that's great. The um, 
CRS are the organizers of this event, Canada Running Series. That's uh, Alan Brooks and, and his merry band, and they've created just opportunities across Canada for domestic athletes to improve, to win money, and, and get the, the times that are required. For sure, it's, you know, there's, there's good reason to stay in Canada when you've got international competition, you've got good weather when you're running in October, um, prize money, you know, that whole feel at home backyard race that everyone likes to have where they don't have to necessarily travel very far. Um, you can compete against um, other Canadians and, and have people to chase that are coming in from other countries. So, you know, for all these years, he's done such such a great job and it has that energy like no other race director that I know. He just makes everyone feel so excited and the way he does his interviews. And, and of course, his daughter, Charlotte Brooks, has, has been... Um, uh, had an integral role as well with um, with the race directing component of, of the Toronto Waterfront Marathon as well as the, the Canada Running Series, the other events that are held. Well, talking of CRS staff members, we have one with a microphone down at the finish line. She's also an Olympian. Kate Van Buskirk uh, is ready with her first interview with one of our elite finishers. Well, I'm here with the winner of the 2022 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon, Ethiopia's Yuhunaling Adane, and we're here with his translator as well. Yuhunaling, congratulations! You won. What an amazing performance. How are you feeling? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he said he's very, very happy. He said, you know, he, there were some things, but, you know, he could have run a little better, but he's very satisfied with the run, yeah. What was it like running in the streets of Toronto? Did you enjoy the experience of running here in Toronto? It was very nice. The the people were very, they were great. There was a lot of good cheering, so we were, I'm, I was very happy. So will you come back next year to Toronto? <laughs> For sure, I'll be back. Well, congratulations, very well done. Well, a brand new champion there. Who have we got in the finishing So straight? we have uh, Victoria Coates here, who's finishing her her first marathon. Her husband is actually in front of her with the with the green shirt and the light um, green underneath. And Reed Coolsat, um, who is pacing um, today, he's he's running in the red shirt. So she's she's finishing. Um, you know, that first marathon is always so tough and there's so much that you can learn. Um, and, um, you know, she's definitely going to be kind of gritting her teeth as, as she's finishing this race today. It, it, um, it's, uh, she's been quite a, a successful athlete for quite a while. She, she works um, for the city of Brantford um, in, the, in the planning department. And um, here she is coming across. I'm sure she's going to be glad it's over. So it looks like she's just going to be about 2.39. Oh, the legs have She gone. needs a little, little oh. bit of help. She's um, definitely feeling um, the, the 42K. Her husband um, has, has done quite a bit of training okay. with her. And um, uh, she, she's, she works from home and has had a freedom with training. Let's go to our Canadian men's champion, Trevor Hoffbauer. All right, well, Trevor Hoffbauer, Canadian champion in 2019 at TWM, Canadian champion in 2022 at TWM. How are you feeling? Feel pretty good. Third time. <laughs> Third time. That's right. Three in a row. That's fantastic. So 2017, 2019, 2022. It's a pretty good track record. Um, I know, again, you and Rory had said you were going to work together. It looked like you did that for a bit. And then uh, at some point, it looked like you were maybe having some breathing issues, uh, you know, having a bit of a challenge there. Can you tell us what was going on? Yeah, around 27 kilometers there. I just had a little bit of an issue that I'm working through. Uh, and then it went away. And yeah, I, I, I felt better. So I just tried to stay on the gas. And I worked really hard going into the beaches and then up to that turnaround. And then as we came down, I was, yeah, I just tried to stay strong through the beaches. And then we got about 35 kilometers. I just started boxing the air. <laughs> it, it was challenging towards then. I was really hurting. Yeah. So again, you've won this race three times as Canadian champion. How did today compare to the other times you've raced in Toronto? Yeah, it's just a lot different, right? Like 2017 was my introduction to the distance and I was really excited about it because I, I enjoyed it. And that was promising to me because I knew that it would open up the doors to making the Olympic team in the future. 2019 was all about making the Olympics. Today was, I wanted to go under that world standard 
try and go like 20940 and we were on pace for that uh, but yeah just got a little bit challenging towards the end so maybe we'll try that again but I'm, I'm happy with how today went uh, every, all eyes are on Paris and that's all I care about so whatever today means for that and the future we'll see we'll see well I know it's been a bit of a challenging year for you and uh, you know it's been up and down but I'm wondering what it means to you to come home with another Canadian victory today and another nice win on a great course yeah yeah this year's been tough personally it's been the toughest year of my life so I'm just looking forward to man I'm looking forward to U sports cross-country nationals all you kids at home getting ready for U sports let's go <laughs> We'll talk about a multi-sport athlete, even if you're just a runner, cross-country, marathons. Trevor Hoffbauer does it all. Congratulations again on your Canadian win today. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. He, he turned into Jim Carrey at the end there, didn't he, <laughs> just for a moment? He's a very uh, lively, unlikable character, isn't he, Trevor Hoffbauer? Right. No lack of um, energy and enthusiasm in, in his little um, post-race interview there. Well, we're still in the uh, sharp end of the race. Half marathon runners finishing on the right-hand side of the barriers as we look at it. And these athletes are still running, well, you can see in the top right-hand corner, two hours 42. And a lot of joy, a lot of celebration, because this is a personal best day, it's clear. So all the training commitment that was put in, Alan Brooks there must be delighted, because this will be a destination event. You, if you're putting in six months of preparation for a race, you want to go somewhere where you've got a shot at a personal best. And this is uh, what Toronto is proving year after year, isn't it? For sure. And, you know, so much of it comes down to the conditions of the day, right? Where yeah. if you're running, hoping to run a, a fast time, you, you need conditions to be low wind, the temperatures that we had today, and, um, you know, really good racing conditions in, in terms of that for, for the athletes doing the Toronto Waterfront Marathon. If we go back to the finish that we just had, Leanne, do you know who that was that uh, just finished in two hours 42? I suspect we're still inside the top 10 Canadian women with those sort of times, or not far uh, outside that. So very good running. A few gaps uh, between the athletes, so they may have had isolated runs over the closing stages, but look, they couldn't uh, lack for crowd support, especially down this finishing straight, fantastic atmosphere, wall of noise, Half marathon runners on the right, marathon runners on the left, and the crowds five, ten deep behind the barrier on the left. Presentation of awards will be for all four categories. That will, it may be five categories, including the men's wheelchair. Oh, that's the award-winning design. I remember that from was it 2018 or 2019? That's that was right. A, Cool T-shirt. Well, uh, our women's champion had the race of her life. Antonina Kwambai of Kenya is now down trackside with Kate Van Buskirk. Antonina Kwambai of Kenya, your first time racing in Toronto and a personal best. Congratulations. How do you feel? Uh, I'm feeling good. It's, it is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And you were you were not in the lead for a long time. When did you make your big move? When did you decide to take the lead? I started to pick up at 30 kilometers. Yeah. At 30 kilometers, and it must have been a really fast decision because you put on so much of a distance on the rest of the field. Yeah, I push hard. Yeah. Did you enjoy racing on the sunny streets of Toronto today? Yes, I enjoy with a strong team. It was amazing for me. Yeah. Well, it's amazing for us too. Congratulations, and we hope you come back to Toronto. Thank you. Well, that was a huge win for her today. And, and what an extraordinary race that elite women's was, where the lead was changing hands with people surging and then uh, dropping back as the energy levels came and went. It was, it was quite something, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know, it makes it interesting to see um, the, the lead change a few times as opposed to someone just going out and, and, you know, having the lead the entire race with kind of a predictable finish. If you're watching these figures, uh, these uh, pictures, hopefully you'll see whoever it is that you've been tracking on the app or have been looking out for that you know that's running this event. But if you're looking at it out of curiosity, thinking, I fancy visiting Toronto, I fancy running a personal best marathon next autumn, well, put it on your bucket list. It is a great city, a great part of the world. It's back and uh, in full swing. And as we've seen already, a very, very high percentage personal best shot with the weather having played very nicely today. We're still on 
two hours 46 into the race still very elite uh, runners one or two club vests not yet into the sort of charity segment of the race albeit on the right hand side in the half marathon we are i know i look at this crowd and i wonder how many people took up running in the pandemic like i said before yeah. it was the sport that we could do wasn't robbed or, or taken away from us and um you know I think obviously we like running, we love running. It's, it's, it's our, our life. And, but I think there's like a, a peace of mind with running and, and setting goals and that feeling of physical movement and, and how it helps us mentally and emotionally with other aspects of our life. Um, you know, there's, there's so much like hope and optimism when you kind of look forward to the races that you can do and, and setting those goals. And, and for some people, this would just be a lifetime accomplishment thinking, you know, oh, I'm going to start running, and, and here they are finishing their, their marathon where, you know, everyone's connected running together. We've, we've got the, the elite at the front, and then I guess the recreational back-of-the-pack runners. So another Canadian finisher uh, just outside 2.47. Uh, the first Canadian women's finisher was Melindy Elmore, and uh, Kate Van Buskirk has caught up with her. Dana, defending Canadian champion, second today. Tough day out there, but you fought really hard. Can you take us through it? Yeah, I just, I think having had the magic of 2019, I, I really wanted that, so it was a bit of a comparison game in my mind, and I think that was tough. I just never felt great. Um, I saw Josh around halfway and I just shook my head and I was like, like, just give me the thumbs up to like drop out is what I was thinking in my mind. And of course, he's just like, you're still on a good pace. And I think it's just one of those moments where you just think, okay, maybe I'm not gonna have a fast day, but this is still going and it's a character building day and it's a day that hopefully I can like look back on and think, Okay, I wasn't on my A game, but I still ran, you know, a strong second half. I felt like I never was running fast, but I was never, you know, reverting to four minute Ks, which is easy to do when things are going bad. So um, I'm proud of how strong I ran for the second half, despite it just not being like a great day. Um, and of course, it's a Canadian championship race, and I feel like, you know, <laughs> It's not the biggest Canadian championship field, and uh, I'm so happy to be here and happy that I was given the chance to race here. So, you know, got to respect the race and the championship and just persist to the end. Well, I'm sure that all of our Canadian fans and all of the people out here lining the streets of Toronto were thrilled to see you finish. Congratulations. Lots of great things to come, Dana. Awesome job. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kate Van Buskirk. Just to correct that, of course, that was Dana Pitoreski, who was silver medalist in the Canadian Championships this time around behind uh, Melinda Elmore, and uh, that added to her gold from the last time this was held. And we're still sub-225 and still a lot of celebration for these runners. They'll have been uh, clocking the daily running for weeks and months leading into this, and they'll enjoy their afternoon all the more for a personal best. It's a nice time, isn't it? Apart from the fact that you've got tin legs. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I, it's always nice to go out for a, a walk, you know, after to kind of shake the legs out a little bit, especially if you're going to be getting on a flight to travel home. You don't want to be sitting for too long. Um, but, you know, when you've had a good race, you don't really care about the pain. So single file as we look back down the field, and that's because we're still only on two hours 50. The real rush hour point of the race will be around about three and a half hours. So uh, 40 minutes from now, they'll be finishing at two or three every second. But uh, it means they can enjoy the finishing straight. A little bit of pressure maybe from behind if you're really competitive about it. I notice they're running beyond the arch. I think it's because they're looking at the ground and seeing that second timing mat and keeping running right through to that. I noticed that with the uh, a couple of the elite women. They, they ran well beyond the arch without realizing that the finish line is there not there mm -hmm. it can be difficult unless you're breaking the tape i guess you don't know for sure no well yeah <laughs> just just to be safe keep running mm -hmm. so hopefully the supporters will stay out there encouraging them home for the next uh, few hours we'll see some of our guinness world record attempts 
we'll see some of our uh, celebrities. We've got the Building on Belief local heroes, Alison Hill and BJ Charbonneau out there. We'll catch up with Chris de Koenig has gone out on his uh, uh, Marty McFly skateboard to get out on the course and he'll give us some box pops as well. Kate will be catching up with uh, different interviewees that she spots coming across the line and Laura De Silva will be going back further down the field to some of the cheer points to see what's happening there. But right now we're on two hours 51 since the gun time. They'll get a few more seconds off that from the time it took them uh, to activate their chips, having crossed the start line. But a lot of celebrations, you can see, kissing the air and enjoying the moment. So the women's uh, race results have now been ratified. Let's have a look at those. Fantastic win for Kwambai, but uh, look at that depth for Canada between four and ten there. Terrific running there, uh, Krista. For sure, it's it's always nice to see. What do we have? Five Canadian flags in the top ten. Um, so we had quite a quite a good quite a good day um, with our with our athletes. Like we talked about, we had a, a change up in who was taking the lead. Great to see Melinda Elmore up there with a 225.14. You know, just one spot off the podium. Um, Thirty seconds, yeah. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yep, a good day for road racing generally, the race of her life for Kwambai, and a good day for Canadian women's endurance running in that uh, top 10 elite women's result. I think uh, Sasha Golish, I'd say, was uh, one of the standout performances there because to have run every Canadian championship, to be downplaying her chances yesterday, and then to take more or less a minute off her lifetime burst, that's very good going. Okay, let's have a look at the men's result. Again for Yuhulinai Nadani, the race of his life. Hofbauer coming pretty close in the end to a podium position, a couple of minutes outside that. And there's confirmation that we gave you verbally of Rory Linkletter hanging on for second. And the third place in the Canadian Championship, where we'll see the ceremony shortly, wasn't Vesalius, it was uh, Mohamed Argab who was between them at one point, between Trevor and Rory. And then we've got Lee Wasselius, who we talked about at the beginning of the broadcast, who's uh, a large animal vet, who has a full day, um, you know, physically demanding with what he does and, and trains when he can get that in. I know he does, did some training with Dylan Wikes. And then we have uh, Sergio, Sergio Villanueva, who was uh, 218. Uh, he's the one that I thought was um, Muhammad at one point in the race. It was just hard to tell when you can't quite read their bibs. but. Again, we've got five Canadians in the top 10, which is yeah. consistent with the women. And three three at inside 215 for the podium. So the overall depth, the, the, the quality standards are just going up year on year. For sure. And it just it speaks volumes again to Alan Brooks and Charlotte and, and what the Canada Running Series has done with, um, with the uh, Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Will Rory Linkletter be disappointed with that, do you think? Well, I think so. Yeah, I mean, he was hoping to run under 210, and um, you know, I'm sure he'll sit down with Ryan to kind of talk about what went wrong. Um, but yeah, I think he will be, and I don't think there's anything wrong with being disappointed. I think it's important to kind of take a look at at you know why it went the way it did and what you can improve on, and to kind of mourn that loss, so to speak, but also, you know, kind of pick up the pieces and move on and just realize that there's things to be changed and improved upon and, and you don't need to stay in like a dark place for too long with any disappointment. Well, we will have the uh, presentation of awards for the top three in all of the categories, the international men and women and the Canadian men and women coming up very shortly. We'll try and keep the camera on the uh, finish line as much as we can. If you're looking out for particular runners, we're on 2.55 in real time at the moment. Um, so still high quality running. Three hours, the first big barrier of the race. And that's the beaches area and the fair city of Toronto. That's live, by the way. That's what it looked like on race day. And the weather, having all of us obsessed with it over the last few days, uh, really played a blinder there because it was perfect racing conditions. And you can see the fall leaf conditions of the uh, trees all the way along the boulevards as well. It really is a nice part of the world to visit in the autumn regardless of marathon running but if you if you are a runner and you've targeted a marathon whether it's your first or your last come here and do uh, TCS Toronto waterfront marathon next October it does look good there doesn't it 
No, it's a beautiful time of year with the leaves changing color. And, you know, most of these, well, all of these athletes would have trained through the summer where it'd be warm. And when the temperature just drops, you know, we probably were in the, the mid 20s just a few weeks ago. So to have that drop and, and not have that humidity as a factor certainly um, makes, makes running feel much better and more enjoyable. So the celebration's continuing. We may get to see uh, everybody through sub three hours, but don't forget, uh, it could say 3.01 or 3.02 on the overhead clock. And the fact that they were a long way back on the start line may mean that they get the benefit of more than two minutes on their chip timing from when they cross the start and finish lines. That's how it works with chip timing, which is now embedded in the bibs, uh, the back of the bibs that the runners have on their chests. So still a lot of celebration. If they came for sub three and they've got it for the first time, you can see the clench fist salutes and the arms aloft. These will be great photos that they'll be taking on the finish line as they come through. And it seems like the majority of people have had a really good day so far. So 2.57, the, the finishers on the right-hand side, if you've just joined us, are the half marathon that ran simultaneously. They've got the white-backed bibs on their front, and it's the full marathon on the left-hand side to which the clock applies, and they've got the black-backed bibs. You can see there's a pacer for uh, two hours 30 on the right-hand side. This finish is in downtown, so most people that have stayed in hotels are within walking distance of them. Still looking at uh, sub three hours on the clock time. Of course, it's one thing getting on the chip time, but you want it in the photo, don't you? You want yourself crossing the finish with your arms aloft with the number beginning with a two. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of energy. The word of the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon will spread further and further with this one. Most runners, they want an adventure and an experience, but they want a quick time, especially at this point in the field, the sub three hour guys. Yeah, you definitely see uh, there's, a, there's a lot of emotion. Of course, you know, there's some people who maybe wanted to run 250 and they're coming in at this point and are a little bit disappointed, but. Well, Chris, De Koenig was alongside me just a few minutes ago and through his magic skateboard and his uh, iPhone, he's got out on the course. Let's see what he's uncovered. All right, we're here with Mark Del Roadrunner. It's actually... Uh,
That's a very lively atmosphere down there, isn't it? Just what you want when you're in the closing stages of a marathon. Well done, Chris. It was all downhill. That's how he was able to get there so quickly with his skateboard. But that's giving you a real feel for what you would experience if you run the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Fantastic atmosphere at those cheer points, especially that was good, wasn't it? Right. I mean, you know, some people just stop, take selfies, join the party and, and then, you know, finish along with the race. And it definitely can be an encouragement when you're feeling pretty dark and like you're not going to make it. So um, I think each person kind of takes what they want out of those cheer stations. OK, I said previously that it was Melindy Elmore on interview. It really is this time. She's uh, down track side with Kate Van Buskirk. Well, Melindy, your first time racing a marathon in Canada and you come away as the Canadian champion. And when we were chatting before, you said that you knew after you finished your track career that you wanted to run a marathon in Toronto. How did it stack up after years of building to this? You know, today exceeded my expectations. This city put on a good marathon. What was what made it so wonderful for you? There were people everywhere. There were people cheering. I heard my name so many times. It was funny because at one point we were running in a pack of guys and the guy said, I'm just going to pretend my name's Melindy. <laughs> you did have, you, I had lots of people out there and that was awesome, yeah. <laughs> you did have a huge pack around you for a while and it almost looked like you were having to like clip your stride a little bit. Did that ever feel a little claustrophobic for you? No, Kate, because you know you love the track, right? And when you get in it and you just kind of like, you roll with the pack and you do have to adjust your stride, but you'd rather do that than be on your own. own. Absolutely, and you were actually on, I think, uh, quite a big personal best pace for a while, and I think those last 4K maybe got you a bit. Tell us a little bit about what the last uh, part of the race was like. Yeah, the last 5K was so hard. I've always felt really good the last 5 or 6K of a marathon. Well, that's not true. Tokyo, or like Sapporo, was, was, was a death march, but generally speaking, I feel better as I go, and I just kind of hit the wall with 5K. I was like, oh, this is what people talk about hitting the wall of the marathon. Um, and I, it was a little uphill into the wind and my calves were cramping and my stomach was cramping and I was just like, oh man, get it done. But for a while I was like, I'm running better than I expected. So I was pretty pumped about that. And um, I know like next time I do a marathon, I think uh, we'll just build on this build. And I, I'm hoping that last 4K is, is I flow home. I'm sure it'll feel better next time. So your athlete, actually, Trevor Hoffbauer, was the other Canadian champion of the day. Tell us what's in the water in the Okanagan Valley. Yeah, we're, we don't want to really give our secrets away. It's, uh, it's an awesome place to live and to train. And uh, we have a great, great community back at home. And um, <laughs> I just gave them the secret, she says. Um, yeah, we've got a good thing going and we're happy and we're, you know, living our best lives out in the Okanagan. So I think we'll just keep it up. Yeah. What do you want to say to your mom? She told um, why the Okanagan is so good of a place to train. So it isn't a secret anymore because millions of people are watching this. Yeah, and she gave it away, huh? Well, it's so great that you were able to come and cheer her on. Melindy, congratulations on your Canadian victory, and we can't wait to see what's next. Yeah, thanks, Kate, and congrats to all the runners out there today and to all the volunteers. I know how, how big, how much work this is to put on. Very nice. Well, here, here to that, to all of the volunteers and the professional staff and the agencies and the public sector and the uh, emergency services who got together to make Toronto come alive again for this rebirth of the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. And they're pouring across the line, 3.04 we're on to now. It's quietened down in the half marathon. Majority of them have finished, but the majority of marathon runners still to come. So the official partner, uh, apparel and sportswear partner of the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon is ASICS. Let's hear from them. Coming up in about 10 minutes time, we've got the uh, award ceremonies for all three categories, the International Men and Women and the Canadian Men and Women National Championships.
some of these will have been paced to three hours and probably fallen off the back of those pacing mm -hmm. boots, won't they? So it, it'll have been not, not quite so much elation as there was at 2.59 uh, compared to 3.06. Right. It's like a tantalizing barrier. <laughs> this guy's happy enough, but... I mean, or of the one fella that's run, I, I should have written down his name, apologies to him if he's watching this on replay, the guy that's run all 33 TCS wow. Toronto Waterfront Marathons, and he, he still uh, does them in some style. It's a commitment, isn't it, that? For sure, and to not have missed even for illness or injury or, or something that's come up in your life is, is uh, pretty incredible. So I wonder how many of those half marathon runners that we're seeing on the right hand side are looking across the cones on the right hand side thinking, could I? Someday. Yeah, <laughs> next year, would that be me? Could I go around again from here? It's, that's not really how you should think of it, is it? It's it's not quite a half marathon doubled, is it? It's it's funny things happen beyond 20 it's, miles. It's worse. <laughs> yeah, it is worse. It's I, I, you know, I remember doing my first marathon like over 20 years ago and I got on the bus heading to Niagara Falls and waved goodbye to my husband. I felt like it was a kindergarten going to, you know, to your first day of school. And um, you're running it and you just, why am I doing this? This hurts. And then you cross the line and it's almost like within seconds, oh, I, I need to do this all over again. Yeah. When's the yeah. next one? Yeah, the immediate reaction is never again. <laughs> and then as time passes, you think, I could go quicker than that. <laughs> I, sure. I, I could do it better than that. And it's tantalizing, isn't it? Because it's probably no such thing as the perfect marathon. It's like life, yeah. there's always going to be bad Exactly. Like and I, I you know, I just did Chicago last weekend and it, it went well. It wasn't extraordinary. It wasn't a disappointment. It was somewhere in between, which, which is what I wanted. But, you know, they're few and far between where everything comes together perfectly. And I think, you know, for Natasha Wodak getting the record in Berlin just a few weeks ago, I think she's, she's realizing that and has incredible gratitude that you know everything came together with getting her her bottles and her race nutrition and and um, how her body felt and and the weather and pacing and and you know to have that outstanding performance for anyone no matter what your ability is um you really hope it comes together and, and often you don't get all of those pieces in place but you know it's about having gratitude and like we said you know <laughs> reassessing and planning to do it all over again because there's never really one last marathon. Um, we've got the presentation ceremonies coming up. We may be hearing from one or two more of the athletes that will be involved in those ceremonies. But if you were a Canadian selector, who would you pick? I mean, we haven't got a policy yet to pick against, but who do you think uh, would do it justice in, in the World Championships in Budapest at the marathon next year? Well, I mean, if you can only pick one, it would have to be Trevor and Melindy. Like, look at their consistency and um, how far ahead they were um, with the second place Canadian behind them. They were both the ones that, that we thought would win, well, Rory as well, but um, they're they're proving that they're still learning with the sport, yet they have that experience and, and maturity and, and wisdom with what they're doing out there. So if that's something that's on their calendar, I'm not sure what Trevor's plan is. I, I know Melindy, I believe I saw that she wanted to do it. So, um, you know, for, for sure it will be kind of focusing on, on, you know, what they could improve on this one, but also celebrating the victory. I think that's yeah. something that yeah, you, yeah. We, you should never just get right back to the calendar and start booking races. You should you should be glad for what you did and how it came together and what you what did go well yeah. before you kind of start to, you know, revamp things. And, and Trevor was talking about whatever gets him to Paris. That That's his vision, isn't it? it it's the Olympic Games the following year and it, a world championship may or may not fit into to that progression. Right. Yeah, that's definitely his focus. He he didn't have um, he wasn't that pleased with his performance when he ran at the Olympic Games that were that were in Sapporo. But, you know, he followed up with that amazing race in Boston and again with this today. So that that comes with with marathon running, right? You have maybe a few, a few bad ones and then it makes the, the good ones even that much sweeter. I've I've only seen brief glimpses of the World Championship course, but it is a waterfront course, uh, much okay. like this. So it's the river, is it the Danube that goes through um, Budapest? Um, and, and so it will hug the river, it will be essentially flat. So right. it'll be something that will be an authentic replication. Now the Paris course for the next Olympics is something else. It has, um, the the net elevation is, is um, 
oh, deeper than Boston, and it is going to be grueling. So that will be interesting to see who selected based on that course itself, because a yeah. fast course and a grueling course like Boston or New York, those are two different differences. Yeah. So TCS have this building on belief uh, tagline that they're working with, and we have some local heroes from the Toronto community who have been taking part. One of those is BJ uh, Charbonneau. There he is in vision, running around the course in the Chicago Bulls shirt. I'm not sure uh, where he is on the course. A little way to go yet, I think, but we'll keep tabs on him. And I think we can hear uh, what he had to say about the upcoming TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. He's at 33 kilometers now, and this is what he had to say earlier. My name is BJ Charbonneau. Brian John Charbonneau, and I'm running the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. I'm excited to be running the Toronto TCS Waterfront Marathon uh, for a lot of different reasons. It's my first in-person marathon. Uh, I'm also uh, really excited because I've been supported by a lot of people, uh, my, my school community, my family, and uh, just seeing the impact uh, on them, I guess from them on me, is uh, kind of going to carry me over the line. Ritual before the race is I always like sign my shoes who I'm running for. I feel that's like uh, who I dedicate my run to. I write their names on my shoes. And that's, uh, that's my race for them and that's my, my story for them. What I'm excited to see uh, on the course is just the people. I feel that um, hearing the cheers from the, from the people and the crowds, I get uh, really motivated by watching uh, people with signs and seeing, watching people cheer on people. Just that human spirit I think is uh, going to be very rewarding and, and help me get through the line, possibly trying to make some friends out there and um, looking to see my family at the finish line. I think that's going to be super exciting to see and uh, they've never seen me run. I go out early in the morning, they don't see me, they only see me come back so I kind of want to model that you know, healthy lifestyle and show them that I can do it and I'm doing it for them. Let's go crew, Jersey City. Let's go brother, you got this. Well, that was nice, building on belief. Uh, that was what he had to say about it, BJ Charbonneau. And this is him in real terms, engaging with passers-by. He seems to know everybody, and everybody knows him. He's into his last uh, seven or eight kilometers here, running between the tram lines and going well. I, I quite like that thing about sign, sign on your shoes, the people that you're running for, the, the, you know, who, for sure. who you're thinking of. And the, the ribbon that he's got pinned to his Chicago Bulls Black, shirt. And I've, I've, it um, resonated Black, with me when he said that his family Black, hasn't yes. seen him run. He goes out early Black, because that's, that's what we're looking at now. Come These on, people guys. have, you know, full-time jobs. It's not their career where they're, go, you know, planning go. their run to do it whenever they want. They're getting up when it's dark Come out, you know, running um, before work, going, family life, perhaps other commitments, and maybe running after Fresh. when it's dark yeah. again. So, um, you know, that's, I, I really admire um, People who juggle go, those many things, including training for a marathon on top of the many demands of, of life. Well, he's encouraging everybody in the opposite carriageway as well. That's a, a nice feature of the race, isn't it? Every, it seems to know most people in the race. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely a good distraction for him when he can be looking at the people coming the other way. And, and you know, we saw this before with, with the runners, you know, running alongside the, the elite that were winning the race. And, you know, here we are, just a different time bracket, but um, definitely the same encouragement and excitement that you can see between the two groups. BJ Charbonneau, he's the boy. All my friends, family. Thanks for supporting me. Let's go, brother. You got this. Back at the finish line, we're coming up to 3 hours 15 on the gun time. Still very uh, good quality runners, but you can see the finishing rate just increasing slightly as the uh, runners on the right-hand side of the cones who are finishing the half marathon uh, approach their closing stages, and that's actually thinning out a little bit, going in the opposite, opposite direction. Some of the half marathoners might do the, the run-walk where you, you know, run for a certain number of minutes and walk, and that's certainly um, whatever gets you to cross that line, yeah. get the job done. Well, we saw Rory Linkletter's race, and it was an interesting one. Kate Van Buskirk has caught up with him. Let's see what he had to say about his marathon race day. All right, Rory Linkletter, second Canadian finisher at the 2022 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. And I'm, I'm going to get Trevor Halfbar in here, too. Okay. Should we start that again? Okay. 
All right, Rory Linkletter, second place Canadian at the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon slash Canadian Championships. Um, I know that you and Trevor Hoffbauer had said you were going to work together out there. It seemed like you were doing that through the first half, and then you made a big surge and then sort of fell back again. I'm wondering if you can just quickly take us through sort of where kind of the break happened. Yeah, so Trevor and the pacer got ahead of me at between 21 and 23 or 4K. And I was like, I didn't come here to get second. So I was like, I'm going to go up there. I don't care how I feel right now. I'm going to touch the lead, and I'm going to see if I, if I can make some moves and make some things happen. And I didn't feel good at that point, but I was like, I didn't, like I, there was one objective, and it was to race this race. So I was like, i got to be in this when the pacer steps off. So I just put it all out there till I couldn't. And so it was a, it was a lonely last, uh, I don't know, 12K, but... I was proud of my, my decision making out there to just say, hey, like, let's just see. Let's just see if the body changes, if we change something here. So, yeah, it was a fun way to do it and definitely a hard marathon. But, like, it's been a long year and this was a, this was a great way to celebrate a really strong year. So. That's a great perspective. I know you have been racing a lot. You had that phenomenal performance at the World Championships in Eugene this summer, big PB. This was still a, a, T, a Toronto Waterfront Marathon PB, if you can put it that way, given that your last performance here in 2019. Uh, will you be back to uh, try to knock that down again next year? I'd like to be back at some point in the future. I don't know when, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't like to leave things unconquered. So at some point, I got I to gotta have an A day in Toronto. So it'll hopefully happen soon. Well, we can't wait to watch you come back and conquer the city. Congratulations today. Well fought. Way to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go Toronto. <laughs> well, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Rory. I think the key thing there was he's done uh, two back-to-back, -back, uh, well, not back-to-back, -back, but a World Championship Marathon that went well in July mm -hmm. and a TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon that didn't go quite as well in October. He probably needs a bit of a break now, doesn't he? Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure he'll sit with Ryan to kind of assess how he feels and, you know, what they could do different. Um, but, you know, give him credit that he, he went for a race. He was going to see how his body felt, and he said he didn't come here for second place. So he made that attempt, and, and that's where it took him. Well, we're going to go across now to the uh, medal presentation area for our presentation of awards and join the MC Live. We'll be seeing Rory and all the other medalists in the national and international championships. The 33rd running of the TCF Toronto Waterfront Marathon and the Athletics Canada National Marathon Championship. A special and heartfelt welcome to everyone at Tata Consultancy Services in their first year as title partners of the events. There are at least 500 of them out there running and walking today. So big welcome to TCS. Well, I sort of was joking earlier today that this guy has kind of single-handedly brought international running to Toronto over, I'm guessing it's almost 40 years now. Uh, for as long as I've been running and, and involved in this sport, this gentleman has been leading the amazing crew that puts on these fantastic events. He will tell you that it is because of his amazing team, and it is, but to me it always starts from the top. And uh, he does such a great job of bringing us all together and helping everyone get this amazing marathon, half marathon, and 5K together. Ladies and gentlemen, please make some noise and put your hands together for the race director of the TCF Toronto Waterfront Marathon, Alan Brooks. Wow. Wow, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, I feel a little embarrassed, uh, but I have to say, most of all, thank you. Uh, muchísimas gracias a todos mos am mis amigos mexicanos. Thank you to all of you, to TCS, our amazing new partners, to ASIC for all this great new gear. It really feels like a new era. A new beginning after uh, an amazingly challenging three years. So again, all I would really like to say is thank you. My heart is full 
and your energy, your passion, your enthusiasm, your resilience is what has kept us going the last three, three years. To be here in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, in the sunshine, only a little shadow from the TCS building. <laughs> And as they remind us, technology, including their wonderful app today, transforms businesses, marathons change lives. So thank you for changing mine a lot this weekend. I hope you enjoy the rest of the time. Bravo! Felicidades a todos! Thank you so much, Alan Brooks. So well said. And yeah, the amazing energy we have enjoyed. It is wonderful to have you folks all back after three years. It is very wonderful to welcome this next gentleman up to say a few words. The energy from TCS started for me right at the start line earlier this morning. The amazing words and uh, you know, just talking about the app and all that they have done. It is really wonderful to welcome the crew from Tata Consultancy Services here to our Toronto Waterfront Marathon. And now I'd like to bring up, to say a few words, the Executive Director and Country Head for Canada, Schumann Roy. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Toronto. First of all, congratulations and a big thank you from the bottom of my heart for the 22,000 runners from 50 countries that made these rates possible today. Not to mention the innumerable volunteers from TCS and outside. John Tory, Mayor, thank you so much for opening this for us. I promise TCS will bring more fun in the technology and to your app in the coming years. Look forward to the next four years and beyond. Thank you, Toronto. TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chairman Roy from TCS. Uh, I'm not sure if the, he's going to actually say a few words. He is the Vice Consul General from Greece. Uh, and of course, Greece has such an amazing history for the marathon. He will be presenting our Laurel Reese, and we'll just say a few words. Please put your hands together for Lampros Christo, Christo Devopoulos. I made it. Congratulations. Hope that everyone achieved uh, your target today. Uh, enjoy your success. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Vice Consul General Christoph Philopoulos. And uh, one more uh, person that I need to acknowledge who will be helping with our award ceremony, also from, from TCS, Michelle Taylor, who will be handing out our flowers here. All right, it is time to start handing out some of our awards and medals. We're going to start with our men. In third place today, he went 208.44 from Kenya, Felix Candy. Champion adds another major marathon 
to his fantastic resume. He ran 207.18. He hails from Ethiopia. Yehunnuleng Adani. And now we will get Michelle Taylor to present the flowers to our champions. And now to present our wreath to the champion, Vice Consul Lampros Christodoulopoulos. Now we're just letting our photographers get there. Winners photos there. One more time for your champions up on the stage. Yehudalin Adani, Kimbruno Kemoy, and Felix Candy. And no, we don't want them to leave. We're gonna get them to just stand to the side. Let's bring up our women's champions now. In third place from Ethiopia, she went to 24-31, Galetta Burka. In second place from Kenya, she went 223.58. Ruth Chebatov. And your champion, also from Kenya, ran 2.23.20. What an amazing race and win for Antonina Kwambai. And now we will have Lampros Christodoulopoulos, the Vice Consul, to present our wreath to our champion. Let the uh, photographers get their photos. And of course our sponsor ASICS, very happy that both our champions are wearing the ASICS gear. And now to present our trophy to our champions, Alan Brooks. There you go, your TCS 
Toronto Waterfront Marathon Champion, Antonina Kwambai, and Yehudalin Adani. And now we'll get all of our champions, if they could, to just step over in front of the backdrop. One more photo of all of our champs. One more time, everyone, for your champions up there. Antonina Kwambai, Ruth Chebatok, Galetta Burka, Yehudalin Adani, Kiprona Kepkamoi, and Felix Candy. All right, congratulations. Got one more photo of our champs together. The official flower holder. You got a promotion hour. There we go. One more time for our champs. All right. Now it's time to bring up our Athletics Canada National Marathon Champions. And to present our medals today, we've got Helen Manning, the chair of Athletics Canada. Unfortunately, Helen managed to catch a cold from her granddaughter, I believe it was. We'll blame the granddaughter. At least it wasn't me. So she has asked that I uh, just read out her, her uh, welcome or her words to you all. So congratulations to our Canadian champions, what a terrific race. It has been a stellar year in Canada for Canadian marathon performances, and today capped it off. Well done to everyone who got, to the, got up this morning and hit the roads. Congratulations. On behalf of Athletics Canada, our thanks to the entire Canada Running Series team, our thanks to, for the general, genuinely enthusiastic TCS sponsorship, much appreciated. To the, also, a big thanks to our amazing volunteers. It couldn't happen without you. Yeah, let's hear it for all of those amazing volunteers out there. Come on, you can do better than that. Big thanks. And we look forward to seeing you all back here next year. Thank you so much, Helen. All right, let's bring up our Canadian champions. In third place, he went to 16.51, the running veterinarian, Lee Wasselius. And presenting our medals, we have Helen Manning, the Chair of Athletics Canada. Presenting our flowers, we have Michelle Taylor and Schumann Roy from TCS. In second place, he's an Olympian. He went 2-13-32 here today from Calgary, Alberta, Rory Linkletter. And your champion, fifth place overall here today, as he was 
in 2019, the winner of our Canadian Marathon Championship. He's from Kelowna, BC, Trevor Hoffbauer. And the way he went up those stairs, it looks like he can do all this again. And now presenting our wreath to the champion, Vice Consul, Lampros Christodolopoulos. All right, let's bring up our women's Canadian Marathon champions now. She's from right here in Toronto. Went 2 31 40. Sasha Collish. That's your third place finisher here. <laughs> Got a lot of bounce in her step considering she just ran a marathon. In second place, she was your champion in 2019, uh, an Olympian from Tokyo. She went 2 30 58 from Vancouver, BC. Dana Pinareske. And your champion, it's the first time We've had the opportunity to see her race a marathon here in Canada. She's a marathoner or an Olympian a few times over. First time back in 2004, 42 years young, ran 2.25.14 to take the Canadian title here today from Helena, BC, Melindy Nope, no, you weren't. And fourth overall here today. And now to present the wreath, <laughs> Vice Consul Lampros Christodoulos. Christo <laughs> Christodoulos. And now we'll get all of our Canadian champs up in front of our backdrop here. Photo op, hopefully I'm out of the way this time. All right, let's hear it for your Canadian champions right there. Melindio Elmo, Dana Pinareski, Sasha Bollis, Trevor Hoffbauer, Rory Linklater, and Lee Wasselius. You guys, oh! <laughs> Trevor, sorry, before you run away. Trevor and Melindy, we will get one more photo with our trophy here. Thanks 
so much to our champs right there. Thank you all for coming on out and being part of our 33rd running of the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. And folks, we want our winners are congratulating you for your amazing performance. Can we get a wave back and forth? From our Canadian champions and all of our champions here today. 25,000 champions out here running today at our TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon, Half Marathon, and 5K. So don't forget, you can track all of your athletes, all of your results through that TCS Toronto Waterfront app. All results are also available along with photos and stories at torontowaterfrontmarathon.com. And all of your, uh, our age category winners will have your prizes mailed to you within the next 30 days. Remember to like the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon on Facebook. Follow TO's Waterfront 42K on Instagram and Twitter for contests, latest news, photos, and share your own celebration photos using the hashtag ChooseTORun and TO Waterfront 42K. We look forward to seeing you guys all back at our next Canada Running Series event, the Spring Runoff and the Under Armour Toronto Waterfront 10K. Registration for 2023 events opens in November at CanadaRunningSeries.com. Folks, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you all again for being part of our amazing day of racing here at the TCS. Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Well, thank you to everybody who won uh, awards in that uh, ceremony that we've just seen, and thank you to everybody that helped organize it. We're back live on the finish line. If you're still waiting for somebody you're expecting to finish, don't forget you can track them in real time on that wonderful TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon app, which is free to download and gives you kilometer by kilometer splits, or at least five kilometer splits projecting to a finish time for your athletes who may still be out on the course. Three hours 43, still very decent running, but you can see we're finishing a bit, little bit more quickly, a runner every second or two. This is really the sort of heart of the race. Isn't right. It? I think about four hours is is the average marathon time yeah. um, for for most people to complete. It has been, in the end, pretty much perfect racing conditions. As you said, if it's slightly chilly to spectate, it's ideal to run. You know, there's no, none of the issues that you get with uh, heat, with sweating or heat exhaustion or uh, any anything like that. For sure, when you start out with the arm warmers and the gloves and maybe a, a toque that you can kind of a throw toque. away. Do you oh, mean a, be a beanie hat? No, I, we, well, we gotta go with toque here in Canada. <laughs> that, um, that's ideal, that's what you, what you want so that you can kind of throw it away as you get warmed up or you know keep it on and it might not make that much of a difference. Lots of celebrations here as people cross the line, they want those good finish pictures. Yeah, this is encouraging. It's been that kind of a day, a personal best day. Uh, one or two of these will be first time marathoners hoping for sub four and they've absolutely crushed it. By the way, on the Took beanie front, I'm <laughs> very conscious that the local the local pronunciation is trial, trial. <laughs> and I'm saying it like Toronto, like Hugh Grant or something, but it's an international audience. They'll understand mm. where I mean from mm. that. Is it what, how's the local? I say Toronto, Toronto. but Alan Brooks will say Toronto. Well, he's originally British. Isn't yes, he? Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we will have finishers coming through for at least another two or three hours. Um, there are, as I've mentioned before, 25,000 finishers. The half marathon on the right hand side of the barriers, as we look at it, is more or less finished. One or two uh, still coming in on that, but a, a couple of thousand still to come in the full marathon. We had a five kilometers earlier on that. Uh, Everything used the common finish line. 70 different countries represented on the entry list and 
three million Canadian dollars being raised for charity. So, so important to the city, so important to running and just people really, come, you know, coming back out from under our rock over the last couple of years to do things that we always used to take for granted, didn't we? And suddenly we don't. For sure. And, you know, the, the benefit mentally and emotionally to do any sort of physical activity. That was one of my athletes that just crossed the Is line, it? Tara. Ha yeah. Happy? Yeah. It's, I mean, even for me now that I've, I've stepped into coaching with um, Cool Set Go, it's, it's, um, oh, it's just the a best sport. Of course, we're biased, but, um, you know, no matter your, your talent or ability, it's nice to have a goal to work toward and get up early on those days and, um, you know, give it your all. And, and, you know, yeah, some people will be disappointed, but, you know, finishing a marathon is, is a success regardless of your time and, and what you've been through, all the different challenges with different injuries and illnesses that pop up. And, um, yeah, it's a great sport. I, I just hope that the people crossing the line don't think, right, that's it, bucket list, you know, marathon crossed off, because it is a good lifestyle. It is a, a, a nice way to go about things. It's a metaphor for life. You know, you take on big challenges. This is ironing board man. Right, I think, I think yes. he was in my room yesterday doing my shirt. <laughs> well, he that was the Guinness World Record attempt that he was doing, carrying the iron and an ironing board. That was that was one of the... the um, was that, uh, I may have met him, I may have met him on Friday night. At the I think, Expo? Yeah, I think okay. he may be um, a CRS staffer, and I think that could be an inaugural world record for that. The benchmark that Guinness had given him was four hours, and if that's the case, you can see top right-hand uh, corner, three hours 47. That mm -hmm. was an inaugural Guinness world record for running around with an iron and an ironing board. And then I think um, there's someone out there trying to get a record with Crocs. There's someone that's dressed as a hospital patient, uh, a leprechaun, and then there's a parent-child record that is being uh, attempted. Crocs was the one. Crocs was the guy that I met because it was an inaugural mm. record, and, and they were they were benchmarking it at four. And everybody seemed to think he would he would smash that in a pair of Crocs, though. And you can't change them. So if they collapse on you, oh, if they shred, really? you can't get another pair of Crocs. You have to finish in the ones you huh. start with. That's the rule. Mm -hmm. There's various uh, landmark points around the course, and one of them is Green Schools, Green Future, where schools have been using environmentally friendly and sustainable practices. And Laura is down at the roadside to tell us a little bit more about it. All right, we're out in the east end. We're seeing a lot of green. I know there's a big push this year in terms of sustainability for the marathon itself to be as sustainable as possible. And I understand, Nicole, your organization, Green Schools, Green Future is dedicated to making schools as green and sustainable as possible. Just tell me a bit about what you do. Uh, first and for all, foremost, I'm an environmental consultant forever. So I built projects that bring green solutions. And my latest project, it's Green Schools, Green Future. So what would a green school have? Like, a can you give me an example of like what types of projects? It will be uh, the first content of a school with a vertical farm, aquaponic uh, system, uh, um, green roof, uh, what else? Computer lab uh, for blockchain and so on and so on. So, and we're going to have solar, of course. Everything that it's going to be sustainable that it's duplicable and it ends on education with an amazing proactive curriculum. That's so cool. And so if people want to get involved and learn a bit more, where should they go? We volunteer. We need, <laughs> we need for sure partnership, um, investment for sure. And we're looking right now for the donation <laughs> for sure and we really looking right now to find the right piece of land that we would be able to build our first school because the minute we built our first school uh, it will have to be in a community that is in uh, in harmony with sustainability 
not just for the title, but really the surrounding of that city would have to be really green. That's an amazing objective, and I wish you... I can't wait to see the first green school being built. Green schools, green future, if you want more information. Back to you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, Laura. We, we've got all sorts of mid-packers and uh, citizen runners, and I think uh, Kate may well have caught up with somebody a little bit further outside the podium places to have a chat with at the finish. Well, I'm here with the very excited Carly and Carolyn. They just completed the half marathon. What a gorgeous day. First time back in three years. How did it feel out there? It felt really, really good to be out there. Absolutely. And this was your second half marathon? Was it your second one in Toronto? Second one in Toronto, yes. And was the last one in 2019? Uh, the last one, we actually, we did it in May. So we did the Toronto half marathon, and then today was the waterfront. So, yeah. What does it feel like to be back racing in person again after so long away? Oh, well, I love people. So being around the people, the energy of that, it doesn't replace virtual. Absolutely not. So it, it felt really good, and everybody was out cheering. It was a great feeling. So I have a feeling that means we're going to see you back in Toronto this year, this time next year as well. We'll be uh, back oh yeah. with the full marathon this time. Carly, oh yes, full, full marathon. marathon. Yes. Well, we can't wait. Congratulations. Way to go. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Cheers, Kate. Well, we're looking uh, in Vision Live, three hours 52 into the race at Allison Hill, uh, just before the medal presentation awards. We heard a bit from BJ Charbonneau. He's one of our Building on Belief runners, inspirational figures in the Toronto community. And Alison uh, fulfills the same role as well. There she is on the uh, near side of the carriageway where the Contraflow is in action. And we also heard from her a little bit earlier in race week about uh, what she was thinking about in the build up to the marathon. My name is Alison Hill. I am the founder of Hill Run Club. This weekend, for the first time in my life, I am running 42 kilometers with the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon. The question of why I'm running this marathon is very layered. I wanted to push myself past what I thought I could accomplish. I've gone as far as 32 kilometers in my training. So, you know, what's 10 more? <laughs> Hill Run Club is a run club that I actually dreamt up before I began. When I started running in the pandemic, I would post it online, tell people what I was doing, and my community would reach out and say, what are you wearing? What shoes are those? How is it possible that you're running at this time? Like, how are you getting this done? And I realized in that space that there was a lot of people who were afraid to begin. So I wanted to create a space, especially for black women, where there was, it wasn't about pace or about distance, it was about us coming together and trying something new. It's really important for me to create spaces where black women can seek out wellness opportunities and find community together. So that's what Hill Run Club is about. It's not about distance, it's not about pace, it's about community. There is Alison Hill, founder of the Hill Run Club and the work that she's doing to make uh, running accessible and enjoyable and safe and everything else for black female runners. And really, I, I would say in my time in the sport, that's been the big difference, the inclusivity. When, when uh, I was first running in the 80s, it was very much white, male, mm. club, elite oriented. And now suddenly the composition and the demographic of most major marathons is 50-50, male, female but it's other communities that we've got to try and draw in and make it accessible to everyone. For sure, yes, it's a great way that you can meet up with people after a difficult day and kind of take it out on the roads and getting your exercise and um, you know, having different goals. And like she said, it's not about time or distance, it's about community and how you connect with other people. And maybe you're just out for a run and you're talking about the struggles that you're going through um, and just kind of having that other person to encourage you and, and you're going to be there for them when they need it so you know some people are, are taking walk breaks and she's got a steady pace and you know I'm sure they're all encouraging to each other out there right now. 
It actually, it looks a pretty nice day, doesn't it? I know the temperature will only be about 14, 15 degrees or something like that, but that looks, you know, that's that's not uh, bad conditions at all. It's been pretty good throughout. It's October-ish, but it's still very, very pleasant marathon running conditions. So those that did choose to make their debut, like Alison on a day like this, have uh, hit the jackpot in terms of weather conditions and everything else. Back live at the finish. One of the big barriers of the race is coming very shortly, and that will be four hours. Of course, many of these runners will have started a few minutes after the gun went, but they get the benefit of that recorded on their chip timing devices. He's had a hard day, look, but he's happy, or he'll be happy come Thursday. Yeah, I think that one mom, her son, probably hopped over the barrier to run in with mom and celebrate. And still the arms are going up. That's partly for the finish line photos that are being taken from the gantry and alongside the finish, but also the joy of getting a finishing time that begins with a three. And here comes one of our pacing groups. And that's actually, to, just to emphasize the point that I made, 3.45, he will be bang on that time, meaning that it took 11 minutes to get across the start line mm. to still fulfill that 3.45 pacing time. So sub four will come for quite a while, but if they want it in the finish photo, it's in the next three minutes from now. You know, I'm sure with technology and how you can edit photos, you could put your race time on the, <laughs> on the finish clock <laughs> according to um, um, your chip instead of gun. There was somewhere, a, 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 like a little race souvenir, where I can't remember if they gave you your bib or, or some souvenir before the race where it was a fridge magnet with your target time on it. So mm. every time you went to the fridge, you were looking at oh. 3, 359 59 or something like that. Anybody that's taken their shirt off needs to make sure that their bib is visible, at least on their shorts. Otherwise, those photos won't get uh, reunited with them at the finish. They're referenced by still a lot of celebration. I, I'm going to guess more than half the field have run a personal best here. It feels like that kind of day, doesn't it? it? Yeah, I would say for sure. Mm -hmm. Last few finishers on the right-hand side in the half marathon. Plenty still to come on the left-hand side as we look at it in the full marathon, with that being the real-time clock coming up to the uh, most popular target time for first-timers and established marathon runners going sub four for a full marathon. And I'm not sure how it would be tracked, but I wonder if it's also the, the highest number of people doing a, a debut marathon. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you're right about the pandemic. So many people took it up because it was all that they could do mm -hmm. and it was, you could do it in isolation, you could do it from home. Mm -hmm. and, and the obvious next thing from that is, well, could I do it in a race? Am I ready for a race? And that's the work that Alison does in, in getting people into a group situation is the sort of mm -hmm. next stepping stone, isn't it? From running on your own to running in a group to running in a race. Well, I remember, you know, during different periods of time in the pandemic where um, you were only allowed to be with, you know, five people or less outdoors and you still need to keep your, your physical distance. And yeah. that was the only thing that was on my calendar every Saturday was meeting with my friends in Paris, Ontario to run. And so we, we you know, we'd run together, we'd look forward to it and then it would be a full week until we kind of left the house again. But um, definitely great, great moments and, and um, just really enjoying being able to get outside. Well, the other thing that you alluded to is that it, it has its place in life uh, for mental health, doesn't it? Just just that feeling of getting out in fresh air, having some time to yourself, clearing your head, talking things through with friends. It, it, running increasingly has a role in um, not just physical wellness, but mental, mental health. For sure. I mean, I, I run with a, a doctor, a family doctor who once said, you know, he wishes that he could, you know, write it like on a script as a prescription. And, and I think he kind of has, in, in a way, for many of his patients, that I think there's so much more to it than you really understand that you can get out of it, you know, that you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And, and when people get outside, and you don't have to be fast, uh, but just like that fresh air, especially during the pandemic, you're stuck inside and everything is by Zoom, but getting that fresh air and, and the sunlight and, you know, moving your body, getting a sweat going and, you know, starting your day that way, kind of checking that box has certainly um, been a beneficial to many who, who suffered during the pandemic mentally because of so many struggles and difficulties during that time. This is the, uh, not quite the culmination of the autumn marathon season. We've had uh, major marathons around the world every weekend for the last 
five or six weeks. Uh, New York City coming up uh, first weekend in November. And then it sort of peters out a bit, doesn't it? We go into winter preparation and, and marathons start popping up again with Tokyo in uh, February and then into the, the whole spring racing series. So not, not so many during uh, November, December, January, but still year round. You can still find a race if you want to. It's just not necessarily going to be a personal best sort of for sure. thing in the Northern Hemisphere. And I think for some people you set different goals. Um, I know one of my goals is to finish the Abbott World Majors. I just did my fifth in Chicago last weekend and so next up for me is Tokyo, March and the 5th. I knew 5th. that was going to be the one that you yeah. left till last. Yeah, yeah, it is for many and it's actually my daughter's birthday so that's pretty special. I'm going to be going with a, a friend of mine um, and uh, and a cousin who will be there, so that'll be uh, pretty exciting. So, Richard and Joe, and just um, you know, traveling the world, right? Yeah. You can, yeah. You can find races all over and have a reason to, to book a vacation and enjoy. Yeah, I mean, we saw um, Melindy with her child with her. I mean, lots of people take a weekend break in cities like Toronto because you can bring the family and they're not missing out. It's a great city to explore, to shop, to see the great outdoors. So our Kate Van Buskirk has been going deep into the depths of the field to find runners with stories to tell. Let's see who she's got next. Okay, I am here with Anne Kathleen and she just finished her third marathon ever. It's her first time in Toronto. And you told me that you're celebrating something very special today. Tell us about it. It's my 12 years anniversary. So wedding anniversary with my husband. So he's, he was here cheering me. It was wonderful. So that's a sign of a good partnership. He's there, the support. You're out here killing it on the performance. How did it feel for you? Uh, it feels so great. Toronto is amazing. The crowd is really fun. I smile the whole time, so. And you said that this is your third marathon. One of them was in Quebec. Yeah. One of them was virtual. Yeah. And how does it feel to be back racing in person again after so long? Uh, it's so great. Uh, I, was, I was so ready for this and I had a lot of fun, so. And so what are you going to do in Toronto to celebrate the rest of your wedding anniversary? I guess I'm going to take a bath. <laughs> I'm going back home to my two young kids. So, <laughs> Well, and Kathleen, congratulations both on your amazing performance and on your anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, we've heard it all now, haven't we? What are you going to do to celebrate your anniversary? I'm going to take a bath. <laughs> well, you crazy kid. You crazy that won't, kid. That won't cost a lot of money. <laughs> So these are still sub four hours on their chip time. You can see the celebrations continuing. Uh, we're still finishing two or three runners every second. Fantastic. When we go off air uh, for commentary, which will be in about 10 minutes time, we are gonna keep uh, the cameras rolling on this finish line, this exact shot. So if you've got somebody that you're tracking on the TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathon app, and they're expected in four and a half hours or whatever it says on the app, you can still see them finish. That will be going on for an hour or two after we've uh, come off air with commentary. So this is the uh, rush hour of the race, but the coverage is gonna continue right into the right. second half. You'll just have to figure the, the corral time, knowing that how they finish will be different than how they started. That's true. Yeah, so. That's true. And when we saw it just now, it was about 11 minutes, wasn't it? Between uh, okay. crossing the start line and crossing the finish line on the chip so yeah so add, add a little bit of a factor in for the time that it took them to cross the start line so they may hit their target time or whatever it says on the tracker but the tracker may have started instead of being uh, what time do we get underway 8 8 45. 8 45 so you may need to add 10 or 15 minutes onto that in real time to see when they finish What's the next event in the uh, Canada Running Series? Is this the culmination for this year? Yes, it is. Uh, I think he announced it in the awards, the Harry Spring Runoff, I think. Right. Um, in the spring. It's about April, so. Um. I was very impressed by that achievement by um, uh, Natasha Golish, uh, Sasha Golish there, mm -hmm. where uh, podium at every one of them. That's, that's impressive across the I year. I think so. I, I mean, I'm level. not... At most of them, let's say at most of them. Yeah, but yeah. Clo close if oh, not. Oh, for yeah. sure. Very good. Yep. And just to have that that depth in terms of so many different distances. And yeah. Oh, forgive us, Sasha, if I don't know this exactly, but I think that she's got the record for Masters Mile, Indoor Mile or right. something. Yeah. Incredible. 
And, but that's where uh, Melinda Elmore began her career, isn't right. it? Right. 1500, 8, 1500 on the track. So mm -hmm. it is possible to work your way right through the card and stay with the marathon and still be competitive well into your 40s. And uh, Melindy, when she was talking to Kate in the interview, you know, Kate said, was it kind of bothering you that you were crowded? And, and Melindy said, you know, no, you know, Kate, Kate also runs the 1500, yeah. that you kind of like that feeling around you. So um, clearly that worked to her advantage to have those people um, with her for, for a good part of that race. So like, hand in hand, these two. Yeah, that's uh -huh. nice. Like being on the track, I guess, isn't it? When you've got a pack around you like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old our oldest competitor is going to be. Is this the guy that's run them all? Looks a bit like him on the left. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a flyer on that, but um, he's expected anyway to complete his sequence of 33 TCS Toronto Waterfront Marathons in a row every year. Only one man and I think one woman have got that attainment. Mm -hmm. And of course, they've made a bit of a rod for their own back, but what a joy that must be to mm -hmm. click off the years for by celebrating sure. it. It's, look, There's it's a few more kids who've hopped yeah. the line. Oh, this this is um, B, uh, BJ. Oh yeah, uh, BJ Charbonneau. He's coming he's through. With there he kids. is with his two Yay. kids for uh, the Bulls. Amazing. The kids that only ever see uh, Daddy coming back yeah. from a run are just seeing uh, Daddy come back from a run again. Oh, but they're with him. They must have uh, carried them over the barrier to get them to cross the line with Dad. Oh, that's so special. And he, he's the one that seemed to know everybody in the race mm -hmm. coming by him on the opposite direction, didn't he? So 4.07 on the gun time. Still plenty of finishers to come. Very shortly, we'll be going to our colleague, Chris de Koenig. He's the man with the magic skateboard that's got him right the way around the course when he was in the studio with us just a short while ago. And he's got his trusty camera which will uh, give us an insight into the atmosphere and really up close and personal with the runners on the race course. Let's, let's get ready to go over and see him. I'm not sure where he is on the course. He'll let us know. But last time we went, it was a very lively atmosphere. How's it looking now? I'm 
eventually. And that's it for the rest of the race. Thank you so much for being with me. Um, good luck to everybody that's finishing here right now. I hope all your friends and family are having a great time. Have a great one out there. Thank you very much, Chris. The sound of 50 cowbells giving you a strong insight and probably my favorite ever marathon sign. Uh, smile if you're running commando. <laughs> <laughs> we remember that episode of Friends, don't we? But uh, well, you can't win with that one, can you really? Well, it's been absolutely fantastic. We've, we've enjoyed it. Um, Krista, I think there's been some great stories once again. Every year I say to Alan Brooks, how are you going to top last year's event? And he's kind of Hold my beer. Let's see. And it was a good one, wasn't it? <laughs> right. Uh, so many people to thank. The volunteers, the athletes, the people that put on the, the broadcast uh, behind the scenes and people that get up at four in the morning to make these races go so well. And, and the race conditions were so great with the weather. The sun's out there and perfect temperatures. And, you know, great day. It, it'll be hard to top next year, but I think we can all be pleased with how the, the race went today. Yeah, the, the most pleasing part was that it's back and, and a recognisably world-class event once again with the new title sponsor, TCS, who've added uh, new dimensions to the way that things are done. But it's been it's been a very Canadian event. It's been a very international event. And, and I think there's a warm welcome. If you're thinking about running a marathon next year, then think about this one because it is a wonderful city to run around and you've seen that there's the opportunity for runners of all standards to get a personal best time. We're going to keep the pictures going of the finish line. So if you are tracking somebody on the uh, TCS Toronto Marathon app, then you can see them cross the line. There you are, picture in picture. And that will be with you for the next hour or two. So you'll see them finish. In the meantime, thank you to Chris De Koning, who's out on the course with his magic uh, skateboard. Thank you to Chris De Duchesne for joining me. Thank you to the whole team at Astro Dog, who've done a wonderful job bringing you pictures. Don't think we missed too much of, of note there. Uh, producer Dave and Eric, and especially the cameramen who were right on point today. It's been a wonderful day's racing, and hopefully we'll see you again next year. Thanks very much, and goodbye.
Easy Ice, the 60-minute backyard rink.